hospitalized in Dekelia, a British sovereign base area on Cyprus. It's part of British overseas territory that falls outside of Cypriot jurisdiction. You got moved from Cuba's little America right into Cyprus's little Britain. Why Dekelia? The UK and the US remain close allies. The last place Cypher would think to look for you is inside their own system. That's what kept you safe in British military hospital for nine years. The safest place from a whale is inside its own belly. You were a regular Geppetto. Well, it wasn't Pinocchio who led me out to safety. So who was that guy? Cypher went so far as to attack British territory, burning their own ally. That's how badly they wanted you dead. He said I was in a British military hospital. But the doctor had a Greek accent. They hire locally. Easier to trust them. De Kelly is also home to Greek Cypriots, after all. What about the Turks? They haven't returned to the south. Not yet. The Cyprus dispute is still a long way from resolved. The country is just as split as it was in 74. Turkish Cypriots in the north, Greek Cypriots in the south. Between them, the Green Line, the UN established. And De Kelly sits right on top of it. It does part of the buffer zone between the two groups. Another reason it was the perfect place to hide you. Easy to spot any outsiders snooping around. So how do things stand? Now, last year, the Turks declared that the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus is an independent state, though it's only Turkey that recognizes it. In the past, the Greeks and Turks lived side by side in the same villages. There are reasons to fight. Those came from the outside. Greece, Turkey, Britain, America, they all had their own stake in pitting the two sides against each other. But once you spark something like this, it's impossible to control. Both sides build up grudges like debt, without the foresight to see that each act of revenge just fans the flames, and then it's too late for other nations to rush in with peace talks. The embers keep on smoldering. Each nation's arrogance only breeds anarchy. The world is paralyzed by this hunger for revenge. Cyprus is no different. Changing ships? Well, we can't go sailing the Suez in a whaler. The Suez Canal. When did they reopen it? Not long after you were attacked. Once they finished sweeping it for mines after the Arab-Israeli conflict. Can you stand? <sighs> We've got to transfer to a container ship for passage through the Suez. Our destination is Pakistan, Afghanistan's neighbor to the south. There, we disembark and head via Peshawar to the Zero Line, the border. We'll travel to the Khyber Pass by road. And then? We continue on horseback. Afghanistan's main roads are under Soviet control. We'll need to go around them. It'll be all narrow, winding paths through the mountains. We'll do better on horseback. It's a local guerrilla tactic. They use the higher ridges to avoid air recons. Then they charge down the mountains for ambushes. The Soviets still haven't devised a counter strategy. Our time frame is only half as much as we really need. It'll be a tough march. Better horses than boats. Well, it'll make for good physiotherapy. Take the time to get used to that new arm. While the Soviets have indicated they are not participating in the Los Angeles Olympics, primarily because the United States has made no attempt to guarantee the safety of the Soviet Union's athletes, the United States is increasingly demonstrating the belief that the issue has nothing to do with its preparations, and in fact this is retaliation for the Western nation's boycott of the previous Moscow Olympics. That concludes today's news. That's quite some news. The uh, Soviet Union not attending the LA Olympics? Yeah. Andropov's death has changed some things. They're calling it revenge for the Western boycott of the Moscow Olympics. Countries boycotted the Moscow Olympics? Yes in protest of the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan. Over 50 countries were absent. It's too bad I didn't get to see Yamashita's judo. When the 40th Army crossed the Amu River four years ago, detente went right out the window. The U.S. Congress chose not to ratify SALT II, and Reagan's hardline politics won in the presidency in a landslide. According to him, the Soviet Union's an evil empire. <laughs> the Second Cold War. And there's been no end to regional conflicts and civil wars. Lebanon, the Falklands, Grenada, Iran, Iraq. The story never changes. 
Egypt and Israel did sign a peace treaty. But then the driving force on the Egyptian side, President Sadat, was assassinated afterward. Apparently, his actions were considered a betrayal of his fellow Arabs. Islamic extremists? Yes. Fundamentalist extremists have been responsible for some bold acts of terrorism in recent years. We've had extremist students in Iran take U.S. embassy workers hostage in suicide bombings in Lebanon. Over 300 foreign soldiers stationed there have been killed. But countries have yet to develop an effective means of dealing with terrorism. Afraid of losing their own men, they've pulled their forces out, handing private forces a golden opportunity. Private forces? Small armies with no national affiliation, working for the highest bidder. That's right, they got the idea from you. After Mother Base went down, they began spreading to meet the soaring demand. Miller's organization is just one of many PFs now. The entire world is after you. But at the same time, it needs you too. Miller told me about what happened in the Caribbean nine years ago. You do remember Miller. You'd formed a private army with him. An army with no allegiance to a nation. I remember, but... I see. You're not sure what's fact and what's a fantasy caused by the coma. It's still all a mess, huh? All I can do is tell you the facts as they were told to me. I've gone easy on you up until now, but this is where the hard stuff begins. 1974, the year before you entered your coma. You were in Colombia, operating with a small unit of men, basically mercenaries. Miller was among them. Miller was trying to find a way to turn his and your talents into a line of work. He was looking to start a business where you would fight on behalf of others around the world, those who needed military force. But the reality was, at that time, you didn't have enough gear to equip your own men. Then Miller came across this client. It was a huge job he was offering, but you had a shot at pulling it off. You accepted it and headed into Costa Rica. The client even threw in an offshore facility in the Caribbean. The mother base. That would be your new base of operations. Miller sure did have a head for business. As your mission went on, your unit grew and grew. More weapons, more money. Before you knew it, you were commanding 300 men. As the organization got bigger, your military power swelled to match. It got so the international community couldn't afford to ignore you. You were just too damn successful for your own good. You, your men, had worn out your welcome. Everyone was out for you. East, West, First World, Third. It was only a matter of time before someone took you down. And that was XOF. Officially, they're an anti-terror unit under the CIA. In reality, they're Cypher's private strike force. They lured you to Cuba using Chico, the Nicaraguan revolutionary kid, and Paz, a mole who worked for Cypher as bait. While you were gone, XOF, posing as a nuclear inspection team, stormed Mother Base. At the same time, C4 they placed on the strut legs went off. The whole thing went down in minutes. XOF. Kisses and hugs followed by a big F U. All because of Miller's blind spot. A back door into Mother Base no one suspected. You remember a certain scientist? Huey was responsible for bringing the inspection team on board, giving the enemy a perfect opportunity to hit you at home. You were returning from Cuba when it happened. Mother Base came damn close to taking you with it into the Caribbean. Those of your men out on assignment returned right away. They refused to believe the wreckage in the water they found was Mother Base. But they checked the coordinates again and again until reality finally settled in. You were supposed to die that day. That was XOF's primary objective. As far as most folks know, you did. The first doctor to see you wasn't even sure what he was looking at. Before they'd even finished operating, your men moved you to that hospital in Cyprus. There was a woman named Eva who arranged that. Rings a bell, hmm? Huh? Most men in your condition would have been written off right from the start. But you survived. You went straight down to hell, and they pulled you out. Your eye wide open. Full of venom. The days of Naked Snake are long gone. Welcome back, Venom Snake. This world still needs you.
Here, Snake, try this on. A prosthetic arm. Yeah, Miller was calling it the arm that wasn't there. The physiotherapy's going well. Your arm's bulked up enough for it to fit. There. Perfect. A little time with it, and it'll work better than the real thing. What do you think? Huh. I can still feel my real arm. Well, you better get used to this one quick. You have any pain? Every now and then. Where? My fingertips. My left fingertips. Uh, sounds like phantom pain. Your brain still remembers your old hand. Yeah. What about your vision? Can you see okay? Yeah, at the moment. Now, the shrapnel in your skull is pressing on your optic nerve. I'm told any hard impact could have an effect on your visual cortex. Yeah, the doctor mentioned that. Your brain might process visual information incorrectly. In other words, you could have hallucinations. You might see things that aren't there, or not see things as they really are. You experience any of that? I think so. When? Right after I wake up. Colors look faded. Colors, huh? Well, that's not a major concern in and of itself, but it could mean the difference between life and death in the field. You'll need to watch out for that. I will. All right. You should continue your physio. We'll be arriving soon. It's the last chance you'll get. Osla. I hear they started calling you Shalashaska in Afghanistan. What's that about? <laughs> You know the term Sharashka? It's slang for a suspicious, hastily thrown together organization. The word became associated with a type of forced labor facility in the Soviet Gulag system. OKB scientists and engineers who'd been convicted of crimes were sent to a Sharashka for forced R&D. The Sharashkas were supervised by Lavrenti Berea of the NKVD, the secret police, under the official name 4th Special Department. Forced research? That's not very different from what we do here. <laughs> Diamond Dogs is different. Everyone here believes in you. Regardless of where they came from or why they're here, they revere you. And they're fighting because it was their choice. And if it wasn't, they'd leave? Who knows? That's our reality here, whether it's real or not. If there's another truth, I don't want to know it. All that matters is that's the concept that's taken shape in their heads. The traces of a group ideology, our superstructure, to put it in Marxist terms. All right. Go on. Right. So anyway, at some point the enemy started calling me Sharashka. This was after the war in Afghanistan broke out. While I was keeping an eye on you in that hospital, I was also heading up interrogations here. The men I broke gave up their comrades and families everything they wanted to protect the most. No real cause for it. I just let myself get caught up in the old Russian pride. And suddenly I received the honor of becoming special interrogation advisor to the forced labor camps. But the more men I interrogated, the more people saw me as just that. The interrogator. It helped cover my real objective of keeping you safe. You went that far for me? Far enough to keep you alive. I ended up being pretty well known among the Afghan guerrillas. Some of them would have seen me on the battlefield. And that's how I got the second half of the name. Shashka. It's a sword. A type of saber from the Caucasus. Russian dragoons and Cossacks carried them into battle. Now the Russian Empire had a general by the name of Fyodor Arturovich Keller. His bravery earned him the nickname Russia's Greatest Shashka. Someone must have known about that. Because somewhere along the line, Shashka got stuck on the end of Sharashka. The guerrillas were using the name amongst themselves. And by the time I got to hearing about it, the pronunciation had wound up as Shalashashka. So half gulag, half hero sword. It was a perfect fit. But you see how rumors and ideas about people can get out of hand fast. Once you create a character and put it out there in public mind, it warps and twists with every baseless rumor. And before you know it, all people see are phantoms. In my case, it works out just fine. I'm plenty used to working under aliases. So SALT II still hasn't gone into effect. That treaty was drawn up to limit not just the size of the U.S. and Soviet Union's nuclear arsenals, but also their delivery systems. The whole deal. That's when we thought all those years of negotiations had paid off, somebody decides to invade Afghanistan. The timing couldn't have been worse. 
The president was in the middle of the SALT II talks back then. Oh, you mean while you were busy trying to stop Peace Walker? I heard. President Ford was meeting with the general secretary in Vladivostok. In his absence, the political brass in America detected what they didn't realize was false nuclear launch data from Peace Walker. Caution. They were on the verge of ordering a retaliatory nuclear strike. Coleman's big idea? Humans are incapable of destroying themselves. Turns out he never knew what humans are capable of. If that AI, I mean, the boss, hadn't found a way to stop the fake data transmission, they probably would have gone ahead with the launch. Deterrence was revealed as the pipe dream it was. All thanks to you. And her. The U.S.-Soviet talks looked set to fall through. What happened in Nicaragua no doubt helped trigger a change of heart. But in the end... The times define the politics. When you've grabbed their tail, they turn and bite your hand. I first met you 20 years ago now. The place was Selenuyarsk in the Soviet Union. We were enemies. I was with the GRU. You were still fighting for America. 1964. Operation Snake Eater. Its objective? The assassination of the legendary soldier known as the Boss. When you returned home successful, they awarded you the title Big Boss. Your CO, Zero, sought to carry on the boss's will by covertly establishing his own organization. You knew the original members from Operation Snake Eater. From America, there was David O, or as he was to you, Major Zero. Donald Anderson, AKA Sigand. Dr. Clark, who went by a paramedic during the operation. And the fourth, you. From China, there was Eva. And me, Ocelot, from the Soviet Union. Six in total. To us, government notions of friend and foe were meaningless. As were East and West, we joined forces by our will alone. Our objective was to fulfill the boss's dying wish. To make the world one. And to do it, Zero used the Philosopher's Legacy, the secret war fund you obtained during Operation Snake Eater. This organization would go on to become... Cypher. I, on the other hand, was left with the problem. You only recovered half of the legacy. I had to locate the other half myself. When I found the funds, I passed them on to Zero, just as you wanted. I still trusted him in those days. We thought what he was doing was the boss's will. Until he started that one project. Les enfants terribles, Zero called it. You parted ways. As did Eva, leaving only Anderson and Clark still with him. I maintained limited contact. Although, truth be told, we were just keeping tabs on one another. The reason was always you. After you returned to the army and created Foxhound, you left America. For a time, even I'd lost track of you. I'd imagine Zero did, too. You always were the best when it came to hide-and-seek. Zero created Cypher, an information network to tap into every corner of the globe. Woven together, Cypher's arteries make the world just one big organism. And that's not all. It also monitors the thorn in Zero's side. That's you, tracking your coordinates wherever you might go. The further you strayed from your roots, the larger Zero became. It's as if he was trying to close the gap between you. But before long, he disappeared from public life. Only a few people had direct contact with him. For a time, I was one of them. Then a year after you fell into your coma, he slipped out of sight entirely. Since then, nothing. No photos, no recordings, not even a reliable rumor as to his whereabouts. I tried every method I could think of, but Zero was gone. Freed of his control, his creation, his power continued to grow. Cypher is a great beast, and Zero was its spine. But even without him, it's endured, evolved. But now its body is rotting, riddled with parasites. Parasites like the ones who attacked you nine years ago in the Caribbean, and then at the hospital. Cypher's Black Ops Unit, XOF. They learned where you were. 
and came to wipe the slate clean. Christmas Eve, 1979. The Soviet Union rolled into Afghanistan. Muslims had revolted against the Soviet-friendly regime established the year before. The DRA forces could no longer contain it themselves, so the Soviets went in to intervene. The Afghan government was powerless and fraught with infighting. They lost the hearts and minds of the people, and that alarmed the Soviet leadership. With the Islamic Revolution happening in Iran, the Soviets felt they had to act fast or risk the spread of Islamic revivalism. A superpower sending a motorized rifle division against men on horseback with antique rifles. Everyone thought it'd be over in an instant. Only it wasn't. Some Muslims made their fight a jihad, a holy war, and began a guerrilla campaign on all fronts. A war of attrition. These fighters call themselves Mujahideen. They're being supported by the West through Pakistan. That's why Miller was involved. He was training them near the Zero Line, sponsored by the CIA. The war has become a nightmare for the Soviet troops stationed here. They thought they'd be headed home in six months at the most. Then a year passed. Two years. Now here we are four years on with no exit in sight. Afghanistan has become the Soviet Union's Vietnam. The Soviet troops on the ground want to go home, but at least they have homes to go back to. The Afghans have lost theirs. The Soviets destroy the Kishloks, villages, wherever they can. They burn down homes and fields, fill in wells, turn pastures into minefields. It's created a mass of refugees who fled to Pakistan. If the Mujahideen are fish swimming around the villages, the Soviets will go so far as to dry out their ocean but this has had a big price. There's bitter resentment among the Afghans, and they're taking out their anger on the soldiers on the front lines. Among the Mujahideen are the Pashtun people. They're fiercely devoted to their code of Badal, or revenge. Soviets they've captured have had their hands, feet, and noses cut off before being left to die at the side of the road, just to show their comrades what they're capable of. Friendlies who come across them can do nothing but put them out of their misery. Then they burn down another village in retaliation. And the cycle of vengeance goes on. This war. The Kremlin never expected to have this much trouble against the Mujahideen. Afghanistan is a tribal society. Tradition demands that its people stand up to any outsiders who set foot on their land. With the honor of their people at stake, they have everything to fight for. No matter how hard the Soviets hit them, they continue to appear out of nowhere, striking back, then vanishing again. But there's one thing even the Mujahideen fear. Every last one of them. The Soviet gunships. They're highly maneuverable and equipped with massive firepower. Plus, the underside of the fuselage is heavily armored. The Mujahideen can barely scratch them with their small arms. Anyone who hangs around gets mowed down by the gunship's heavy machine guns. This new honeybee weapon that was given to the Hamid fighters, it's no doubt something to help them strike back against the gunships, which makes it a weapon that could change the course of the war. Those guerrilla fighters known as Mujahideen don't actually belong to a single organization. Afghanistan is a multi-ethnic country. You've got the Pashtuns, the Tajiks, Uzbeks, Hazaras, and each of them is split into their own tribes, large and small. Each ethnicity has several rebel organizations that their various tribes gather under. They're united under the banner of Jihad, but that doesn't mean they work like a single standing army. Just look at the area around Smasi Fort. A lot of Tajiks used to live there, but they fled after the Soviets started their scorched earth campaign. With the area uninhabited, the Hamid fighters, who are Pashtun, decided to move in. The Hamids are based out of the city of Peshawar. We passed through it on the western edge of Pakistan. The Pashtun people have long lived in Afghanistan and western Pakistan. They used to travel back and forth frequently. Then Britain went and established the border that still stands today. The Hamid fighters get generous support from the Pakistani government. The government wants to use them to secure influence over Afghanistan. 
Their liaison with the Hamids is Inner Services Intelligence, and behind the ISI, you have the CIA. That's probably how the honeybee ended up in the hands of the Hamid men. I had the R&D team analyze the honeybee. How? The CIA wanted it with everything intact. They took it apart to look at it. Then they put it back together. Everything intact. <laughs> That's the R&D boys, all right. Turns out the honeybee's homing capabilities are a cut above previous manpads. It can detect a broad range of infrared wavelengths, and even ultraviolet for supplementary guidance. Hence the name, huh? Right. Honeybees rely on UV light to fly. With this device, flares don't do the target any good. That's why the Soviets are losing so many gunships. And why the CIA was so desperate to get it back. It wasn't just about preventing the Soviets from devising countermeasures. What if the likes of Iran got their hands on it? American aircraft would be put at risk, too. We can use this tech to develop our own portable missile. That'll give us a huge advantage. It'll take a little time before the analysis results can be applied to actual implementation. But we'll keep moving with the research. Kaz, what about the unit that attacked us in the mist? You knew something about them. That wasn't my first run-in with them. It happened right before I was captured by the Soviets. We were on the Zero Line that day. The Afghan side. On our way back from training the Mujahideen at a mountain camp in Kuna province. There's a lot of that work in Afghanistan. Most PFs shy away from it because it draws too much attention. But for us, that was the whole point. The job itself went great. We just had to make it back to a tribal area in Pakistan. But all of a sudden, visibility got real bad. It was no sandstorm. Our point man gave the strange report. He said he could see skulls in the mist. Skulls? The next moment he went silent. We scrambled into formation, right before his arms and legs came raining down on us. It was always supposed to be a dangerous mission, so I had Diamond Dogs very best with me. We were calling out to each other. But one by one, their voices just went dead. Whatever happened to me, I lost consciousness before I knew it. When I came to, I was in a Soviet camp, tied to an interrogation chair. Could they be some new Spetsnaz unit? No. The ones that interrogated me were just the average rank and file. Whatever group attacked us, the way they moved was just insane. And that mist, appearing out of nowhere. The Soviets don't have tech like that. If they did, Ocelot would have heard about it. I doubt the West does either. Otherwise, the folks at Langley would be sleeping a lot easier. Why'd they come after you? Wish I knew. I'm the only one who survived. Though I don't think they planned it that way. If I was their target, they wouldn't have just handed me over to the 40th Army. Whatever the case, we need to watch our step until we know who they really are. And boss, if you ever do run into them again, don't try to take them on. You just get the hell out of there. When I first started dealing with Zero, with Cypher, it was a somewhat parasitic relationship. Though, a mutually beneficial one. Cypher had no army of their own, so they wanted us. They wanted our strength. They approached me as a potential business partner. But they had other motives. Cypher coaxed us into Central America, into that U.S.-Soviet proxy war, to fuel Mother Base's growth. Once we were big enough, they'd force us to join them. That was the plan. That's why they had Paz still Zeke. Right. And if we refused, she would use Zeke to fire a nuke from Mother Base. The world would consider us a liability, and countries would unite to destroy us. We stopped the launch. And yet they still took us down through that fake inspection they orchestrated to cover up their sabotage. That power Cypher wanted. We don't have it anymore. So why are they still after you? Is it just the fear of leaving you alive? I don't know. Was Zero really... All I know is the man I knew wouldn't want this. What do you mean? We have to consider that it might not be Zero we're dealing with. We know virtually nothing about Cypher anymore. How big they've gotten, what they want or even who they really are. The new mother base started out as a test drilling rig operated by a mineral resources supplier, but their project fell through. The Seychelles government was happy to hand the place over to us. It was just scrap on stilts. Hmm. So with a few dummy construction companies set up as fronts, we started renovating the half-finished rig. From the outside, it looked like the project was back on rails. 
cause. You... what? I see what you're doing. Recreating the mother base we had nine years ago. Only this time. That's right. The mother base Cypher thought they destroyed will return from the grave to kill them. We'll prove to the world that we were the victors. And if we lose again? They can't fool us the same way twice. Now our enemies are in plain sight. And when our organization gets too big, we split it across companies. Any company that draws attention gets liquidated, and its capital is back-channeled into a new company. Most PFs are small-time operations anyway. And in this business, the minnows go bankrupt all the time. We've never aroused suspicion. Plus, we have Hewick. Hewick? Human Exploitation Company. It's a business specializing in intel gathering. Think of it as a civilian intelligence agency. Cause, that's... Remember what they were trying to accomplish at the prison facility in Cuba? That gave me the idea. We dispatch moles into conflict zones around the world, and each sets up an intel network on site. Then they stay in place to give us stable points of contact when other nations intervene in the conflicts. Hewick's strength is that it has a cutout at each level. You get your job from one guy, then you hand it off to another. No one has direct access. It's a perfect black box. Hewick members also work their way into the superpowers intelligence agencies to make sure Diamond Dogs gets work. We have those countries by the balls. That's our deterrent when we need it. Networking? In the intelligence community? Sure. That's how we've grown this far. And when you go out on missions, intel from Hewick will be there to back you up. But despite all that, Cypher has its eyes on us. The only reason I'm not dead is that they needed to know where you were. Figured if you woke up, I'd go straight to you. That's why you made that ruckus at the Zero Line. Yeah, to make their own surveillance work against them. I think it took some of the heat off Cyprus. Kaz. Then I just had to wait for you to save me. And I've gotten used to waiting. Kaz. That's not all. It was a good chance to scout the market. And with the West wanting the Soviets out of Afghanistan, their agencies are bursting at the seams with funding. Boss, let's start by building up our Afghan presence. Why put Mother Base in the Seychelles? We're at the center of the world here. We're all the way out in the Indian Ocean. Come on. Lebanon, Sri Lanka, East Timor, and Africa. From here, our reach extends to conflict zones the world over, including Afghanistan, of course. So it's prime real estate for a mercenary. Exactly. Latin America isn't as close as I'd like, but we have Amanda and her people to help in that department. And besides, the Seychelles government owes us a favor. Owes us? The Seychelles has strong ties to the East, which the West wanted to shake up. It came to a head three years ago, in an attempted coup. It was a force of South African mercenaries, with U.S. backing behind the scenes. They were only platoon size. But South Africa is home to some heavy PFs. Too much for the Seychelles to handle. In the end, they accepted help from the Tanzanian army and quelled the coup. We set up the deal and handled on-site tactical instruction. That led to some training work for the Seychelles military. And when we put down a mutiny within their forces, well, we made a lot of people happy. They don't pay us. They just let us have a piece of their offshore territory on the promise we'll come running if something else happens. So we're bodyguards, too. It's a good setup. We can only take Mother Base so far here. We'll have to find somewhere else when this place starts getting big. Aren't you being a little hasty? Nothing hasty about it. You're back with us now. So, Kaz, the ship that took us from Cyprus, it used to be a whaler. Yeah, a Japanese vessel. How was the voyage? It was... <sighs> stimulating. <laughs> well, she was part of a whaling fleet up until a few years ago. Her displacement isn't anything to write home about, but she can really move. She still had plenty of life left in her, but then the work dried up. Global opposition to whaling has been mounting for years. Is that right? The push to ban it has been gaining traction for a little over a decade. Individual species came under protection as the years went on. And then two years ago, the IWC adopted a moratorium on commercial whaling. Several countries, including Japan, fought it to the bitter end. But eventually, most whaling companies had no choice but to throw in the towel. You ever tried whale snake? Can't say that I have. When I was a kid in Japan, practically everybody ate it. That good, huh? The country was poor in those days, and whale was cheap. International opinions changed since then. In any case, 
That's why we were able to get a bargain price on the ship. Of course, we did end up spending five times the purchase price in modifications. We had to really work to fit in all the ESM and communications gear while keeping the whaler look intact. Right now, she's going around conducting SIGIN missions. In the future, we plan to use her as a communications relay base between you and Mother Base, and also as a chopper resupply vessel. Diamond docks. The word diamond originally comes from the Greek Adamas. It means indomitable, unyielding. Other words for the stones often mean eternal bond, fortitude, or purity. The same is true of the Star of Bethlehem flowers you laid on the boss's grave. They represent innocence, as well as chastity, yielding to no man while maintaining one's virtue. In other words, staying loyal to something. Ocelot said the number of private forces is increasing, and they model themselves after us. They're a far cry from the likes of us. But why? Nine years ago, we made enemies of the world as a nuclear-equipped force, independent of ideology or state. Yes. Sooner or later, the real UN would have stepped in. So why are they giving these PFs free reign? That's our fault, too. What do you mean? What happened nine years ago was a real problem for a lot of people. An organization as big as ours, with our facilities, was wiped off the map. Not an easy thing to hide. But if our existence came to light, so would the names of our clients. We had contracts all over, east and west, from superpowers to banana republics, the lot. Our clients denied all association with the likes of us. They had to make sure things didn't blow up on them. But at the same time, they missed us. They really missed us. The demand for armies for hire was as strong as ever. The international community turned a blind eye to what happened to us, despite still needing people who could do our jobs. History couldn't afford to lose us. As soon as we were gone, they needed a replacement. So private forces spread everywhere. And they're all just a phone call away. But still... I know. PFs are totally different from what we envisioned. Nation states, revolutionaries, terrorists... They have a lot of clients. And Cypher is one of them. Cypher stays anonymous, but I know their work when I see it. In the eyes of those clients, the world's PFs are all just expendable pawns. The clients don't have to worry about losing their own men. Nobody knows they're involved, and PFs are cheap. In short, the world is chewing up soldiers and spitting them out. Even some of the old Mother Base's survivors are still working for PFs. Some guys created their own smaller forces. Others were taken on by emerging PFs. Everybody's gone their separate ways. But none of them are living their dream, because they're not fighting with you. Of course, I tried to headhunt as many of them as I could for Diamond Dogs. It was all a waste of time. They said they weren't interested without you to lead them. But now you're back. And everything's gonna change. We'll unite all private forces under you, transcending nations and economies. What is a nation? Just a patch of dirt. The bonds among us will surpass nations, and that's what'll put the world under our control. We'll establish a new kind of country, redefine the very concept of it. Even Cypher will be below us. An extraterritorial federation of military nations. The United States of Force. Once word of Big Boss's return starts traveling, that'll be our true deterrent against Cypher. In other words, no one will dare to come gunning for you. How do you figure? Cypher lacks a large-scale fighting force. PFs are the perfect tool for them. But those PFs revere you. The legendary Big Boss. If Cypher killed you now, they wouldn't take it lying down. Maybe they'd even go looking for revenge. But they definitely wouldn't keep doing Cypher's dirty work, even if it put their lives at stake. That's why it's no longer a benefit to Cypher to get rid of you. The very fact that you're alive is our greatest defense against Cypher. Nice to know. It'll buy us some time while we get back to full strength. Just keep in mind that what I'm saying is generalizing a lot. In practice, the PFs around the world don't know your face. Just declaring that your big boss won't be enough to convince them. And if they see you as an enemy, they'll come at you with everything they've got. Some hero. That's why you need to bring them back to Mother Base. Show them on your terms that you really are the one and only Big Boss. Once you've proven that, they won't hesitate to join us.
we were lucky to get our hands on that cyborg arm developer. There's no one in Diamond Dogs who can so much as maintain that thing. Bionic arm, not cyborg, if you go by what he calls it. But you're right, the East is light years ahead in bionics. They can even detect through the skin the slight electrical signals from the brain that order muscles to move. The Soviet Union completed their first bionic arm capable of doing that back in the 60s. Although I guess that news didn't really reach the West. No kidding. Zdornov's was the only one I ever saw. Quite a shock to see it for the first time. And it was no mean feat to get hold of Snake's arm. I couldn't get one for you at the time, but you know, now... I... Forget it. I've no intention of relying on bionics. Right now I need to keep the pain fresh in my mind. Well, it's your decision. But don't you find it... inconvenient? Not a bit. But the phantom pain... it never lets up. Do you know how many men I saw die that day? There's nothing we can do to bring them back. And you expect me to care about getting a measly arm and leg back? <sighs> Sorry. But my pain belongs to all our dead comrades. I'll keep living with it for their sake. It'll guide me straight and true until I've gotten them the vengeance they deserve. Diamond Dog's intel team specializes in information gathering. Mainly human and SIGINT. They plant scouts and moles in the field. These operatives will blend into the local populace and work under the guise of a resident, or disguise themselves as travelers and ask around for information. They observe targets using various hidden bugs, cameras, and transmitters, and by tapping their satellite and phone communications. Analyzing all this information creates a clear picture of how wars and the PFs fighting them are changing. This data can also be used for threat assessment when deciding whether to accept contracts from certain clients. And during missions, the intel team keeps track of target locations and produces FOM predictions. Reporting mission critical information based on real-time remote observation of changes in the AO. What you hear from us over the radio is based on how we interpret the data gathered at the command platform. However, intel team operatives go unarmed in almost all situations to avoid revealing themselves to the enemy. Some will carry a knife, but most have nothing at all. As such, don't expect them to help you take on heavily armed adversaries like PF soldiers. Think of them as entirely passive in the hot zone. Plus, they use all manner of techniques to remain inconspicuous in the field. If you ever spot one, you'll have some serious explaining to do. So remember, their specialty is espionage. They may not be of use in a firefight, but when it comes to intel, they're pros. DD makes a pretty good partner, huh, boss? Too early to say. Yeah? Just seeing him come back makes me real proud. What breed is he? He's not a husky. You're right. Siberian husky is a cross between a Spitz-type dog and a wolf. I think DD might have some wolf blood in him, too. He isn't just smart. He's also shown remarkable judgment. If he doesn't do what you want him to, he's just doing what he thinks is right in the situation. And he's steady under fire. Remember, he's no lab dog. But learn his strengths, and you'll understand each other soon enough. You'll make one hell of a team. Ocelot. Why'd you take it upon yourself to train him? Huh? Why? Yeah. When's the last time you heard a wild cat raising a dog? I have an eye for him. I knew at first glance he'd make the right partner for you. Huh. And I figured it was about time he got out into the world. So you passed him off on me. There, you see? I knew you liked him. I don't know about that yet. I still think he's trying to figure me out, too. I'll spend some more time with him. You'll see how helpful he can be. What about you? I prefer to work alone. Ocelots don't hunt in packs. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, I'm glad you like him. Dee Dee's really taken to you, too. And to going on your walks. Don't be shy about taking him with you in the future. I'll think about it. Look closely. Those are the symptoms of the infection on Mother Base. The blisters on the body were full of tiny worms. Parasite larvae, most likely. But we couldn't find any adults. It doesn't seem to mature in the body, like a sparganum. We don't know the root of infection, or what causes symptoms to develop. 
The infection rate, along with the number of dead, are both on the rise. If we don't find the cause, and soon... <sighs> Boss, do you remember seeing these symptoms before? The bodies floating around in the oil facility? The bedridden test subjects at the Devil's House? This epidemic looks just like what we've seen on our hunt for Cypher. It could be a counterplay by Skullface. That's insane. You mean they weaponize parasites? Parasites as weapons. That definitely falls under the Biological Weapons Convention. But it's something the world would never see coming. And no one's ever developed a vaccine for parasites. So this is the oh, weapon of mass so destruction funny. Cypher was working on in Africa? It may be. But if it is, how did the Yellow Cake and Walker Gears fit in? There must be something bigger we're not seeing. Anyway, our priority now is to prevent more casualties. The medical team is studying the infection, but we can't treat anyone until we know the root cause. All we can do right now is halt the spread of infection. Remember before, boss, when Quiet attacked one of our guys on Mother Base, stuck a knife in his mouth. He's one of the very few soldiers who've had contact with her recently. Close contact. I don't think it's a coincidence that he was among those who became symptomatic pretty early on in this epidemic. Saliva and blood spatter, an open wound, mucosal infection. Whatever is causing this got inside him then. Miller, that is a baseless accusation. The source of the infection is quiet. Everyone suspects her. We don't know that. And we've come across these symptoms before. The bodies in the water at the oil field facility. Those sick people in the beds at the Devil's House. They're identical to what we've seen while we've been after Cypher. The infection could have come from elsewhere. But at the very least, she does know something. <laughs> it's not like she's gonna talk. No, not through words, anyway. But what about her actions? Quiet held a knife to that soldier back then, before he became symptomatic. There must have been a reason for that. A reason for shoving a knife down the throat of one of our men. What if she's capable of identifying who's infected? What if she was trying to stop the infection but couldn't communicate that to us? The answer to that, the source of the infection, might be in the mouths of the infected. You think there's some kind of clue in their mouths? I don't know. But maybe there's something about the mouths of those who've become symptomatic, something in common. Something their mouths have in common. Forget it. We can't trust her. Even if she can spot the infected, I don't want her help. I understand how you feel. But this is something to go on. Can't you see it's just like I said? Bringing her here was a big mistake. Quiet is gonna be the end of us. Stand down. You've got zero proof. Try to keep an open mind on this, boss. There has to be a way to identify who's infected. Snake, do you remember Amanda? Yeah, I do. Their revolution was a success. Somoza resigned, and Nicaragua has a new government. Amanda's really working hard for her country to be reborn. Good for them. She says she wishes Chico could be there. That revolution was the dream. For Amanda, for Chico, and their father. That chopper was no place for Chico to die. I'd like to at least think history will remember his part in the revolution. When you pick up a gun, there's always a chance you'll die for nothing. He knew that as well as the rest. Now that he's gone, it's up to the rest of us to decide what it was all worth. If we don't, there's nothing to prove that Chico ever lived at all. Where is Mark on the world? Amanda told us that Strangelove contacted her after the revolutionaries came to power in Nicaragua. Strangelove. The AI researcher from Mother Base? I remember her. We'd lost touch with her. Until Amanda heard from her out of the blue. She told Amanda she wanted to salvage Peace Walker's drive parts or something from the bottom of Lake Nicaragua. Coffee. Amanda passed the request onto her friends in the new administration. She's a national hero now, after all. So Strangelove got a Soviet military aircraft to transport something to somewhere. But apparently the cargo wasn't big enough to have been Peace Walker itself. So what was it? Who knows? We recovered Peace Walker's nuclear warhead ourselves nine years ago. What could Strangelove have been after? 
Amanda said she didn't mention what her reason was or where she was headed. Nicaragua is a socialist state now. And with Amanda vouching for her, the government didn't feel the need to concern itself with the details. All Strangelove told Amanda was that she was going to continue her research, and that the rest was a secret. Right before the attack, Huey was in the control tower to prepare for the inspectors. He was with them when it all went down. The control tower collapsed with the rest of its strut. His body was never recovered. But he was the one who met the inspection party when they arrived. And he was the one who showed the nuclear inspectors to the tower. You remember the way it went. First he recommends we agree to the inspection. Then he gives them the okay without our permission. All the time acting as if he was doing us a favor. On top of that, he even had the guards disarmed that day. It would send the wrong message, he said. Whatever the angle, it all leads back to Huey. I curse my own stupidity for not realizing sooner. Huey escaped with that unit by Chopper. I've been hunting him for nine long years. The other reason I was operating around Afghanistan was to dig up his location. Huey's in Afghanistan? Yes. And I have a good idea where. Now we just wait for the right moment. This time, we'll be the ones using him. He's going to tell us who our guests really were that used a fake nuclear inspection to blast our home into the ocean. A sniper known as Quiet is lurking in the Afghan wilderness. This Quiet has performed a string of hits on Soviet officers. The attacks always occur in the same area. But sweeps of the area turn up no traces whatsoever. They've even posted guards, but they never spot a thing. And then before you know it, another body's lying on the ground. You ever heard of someone who operates like that? No matter how still and silent a person tries to be, they always create some kind of ripple. Be it breathing, a heartbeat, eating, excreting, body temperature, sweat. If this sniper can really vanish completely, that's just not human. I guess quiet is the right name. But what is Quiet's objective? The local guerrillas wouldn't use this kind of tactic. I just can't see them hiring some superhuman mercenary. And the Soviet officers who've been killed, well, they were all opposed to or skeptical of the secret weapons development being conducted in the area. Sure, they were a problem for those supporting it, but the Soviets have nothing to gain by killing them. So we have an assassin with superhuman combat skills who isn't working for the guerrillas or the Soviets. Miller has a theory that this sniper is a hitman for Cypher. He thinks it's time we silence quiet for good. But I'm against the lethal treatment. I say we bring the sniper back alive and break that silence. Because even if this quiet doesn't say a word, there's still plenty we can learn. Just remember this, boss. If our hunch is right, you'll be on this sniper's hit list, too. If things seem a little too... quiet when you're in the field, watch out. Quiet's out there somewhere. And if possible, this is one sniper I want back here breathing. When Quiet first came here, she demonstrated her marksmanship against that enemy fighter plane. It showed she was much more than your everyday crack shot. Hitting a moving target from 600 meters is a challenge, but it's possible with the right training and equipment. But shooting down that missile, that's a world apart from taking out a soldier on patrol. The chopper and the missile were in motion, meaning different vectors at high velocity in three-dimensional space, and she shot an unguided bullet that had to fight air resistance and gravity. All that while the chopper was taking evasive maneuvers. Some of the best target leading I've ever known. She has a superhuman sense of spatial awareness. You put her in a fighter jet, and she'd be an ace right off the bat. Hell, your judgment was top class, too. Realizing she could take out that pilot? That's quick thinking. You and Quiet could make a hell of a team. You'd be damn near unstoppable. Quiet is still in her cell. Only a few staff are authorized to go near her. She hasn't tried anything funny, but that's what bothers me most. In particular, what does she have to gain by coming to Mother Base? I first thought she was under orders from Cypher to take you out. She didn't manage it in Afghanistan, so round two happens here. So I lighten the guard, and that lock on her door is a joke. You gave her an opening, and? Well, 
She hasn't killed you yet. And I hate to say it, but she's had plenty of chances. You made me the bait. Poisonous bait. What better? Anyway, she didn't bite. Quiet is keeping her silence. So I'm left with no idea again what she's doing here. We tried communicating with her through writing. That didn't work either. Whether she's illiterate, dyslexic, or just plain stubborn, she won't cooperate. I just don't get it. If she tried to contact the outside, it'd be Close. picked up by our counterintelligence net. But it's clean. There's no sign she's had contact with the staff, the base facilities, nothing. She's almost got the men wanting her to try something, just to find out what she's up to. And she's in there putting on the failed soldier look, all downcast eyes and defeated sighs. But she doesn't kill herself. She can't be trying to leave Cypher and surrender to us. <laughs> so what's the verdict? This may sound optimistic, but here's how I see it. Quiet came here to fulfill some objective. To kill you, maybe to destroy Diamond Dogs. Whatever it was, before she could do it, something changed her mind. Yes. When I look at her, I sense hesitation. You think she'd betray Cypher? Can't say for sure. I prefer the ones that talk. Anyway, we'll keep her under watch. And we're also looking into those special abilities of hers. You'll be the first to know if something comes up. Why not look in on her yourself once in a while? Right. Boss, Quiet still hasn't made any moves. It's got me thinking. What? If you took her on a mission, she might break her silence. You want to let her out? Sure. Make her no different to the others. Everyone you pick up works for themselves, right? But her... I say work with her. See what happens. I wouldn't ask this of anyone but you. On missions, I'll make sure we have someone observing from a distance, and she won't be allowed access to all of the base. As for Miller... Well, sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. The best part is, hiding is her specialty. If no one sees her leave the base, the staff will be none the wiser. And if she gets away? If that happens... You'll have to take care of her. But I have faith in you, boss. I think Quiet sees something in you. It's a big risk. But it's for the good of all of us. And besides, you can't deny her talent. Her unique skills and abilities would give you a hell of an edge out there. I'll think it over. How long are we gonna keep that woman here? You mean Quiet? My personal feelings aside, she's putting everybody on edge. You should hear the stories. I got sick from just standing guard at her cell. I won't stand on the same platform as that witch. She hit me for no reason. What is this, a private army or a kindergarten? The thing is, they're all serious. They're faced with something they don't understand, and a kind of mass hysteria has broken out. I've gotten wind of countless plots to take her out. There are no grounds for this suspicion whatsoever. Put yourself in her shoes, assuming they see her as a prisoner here. No, even more so, if they do, she deserves to be treated humanely. I always thought our men were a bit more noble-minded, but... Look, I understand this is a stressful line of work, but to make her the scapegoat... You've got it wrong. Quiet? She's with Cypher. We have men that lost their buddies to her organization. But you could say that about more than just her. Plenty of the men used to fight for another side. But they've all put that aside to work for the boss. Cypher is different. And if you ask me, the boss is the biggest problem. Why is he protecting her? Some of the guys are starting to suspect him of... I don't agree with keeping her here either. So what's your move? Throw her out? Kill her? <sighs> She's our ticket to Cypher. And her physical abilities are outstanding. We could use someone like her. Don't make me sick. Her marksmanship, speed, stealth capabilities for a start. Then, there are the other things we've learned. Quiet appears to be able to use both eyes as master eyes simultaneously. That lets her track targets of different focal lengths at once. While looking through the scope with one eye, she can look for new targets with the other. That's why she doesn't need a spotter. She can operate alone, no matter the circumstances. See? I told you she's a freak. No one would be able to control her. No. There's one person who could. Hey, you trying to get the boss killed? Well, why don't we talk to him? Hmm? See if he's willing to take her along. 
I don't like this. It's his decision to make. The two of them might even make a good team. <sighs> Where is she? You mean quiet? In her cell, of course. Why did you send her out with the boss on that mission? She proved herself well enough, didn't she? The boss sure knows talent when he sees it. That woman will never be one of us. She's targeting him. Don't forget, we do owe her one. What's that supposed to mean? Remember what happened when she first got here? She shot down the aircraft Cypher sent after us. Not only that, she hit the cockpit. Who else could have done that? We're talking about a fighter jet traveling at Mach speed. What's your point? If she hadn't been there, the boss's chopper would be at the bottom of the ocean right now. Or it would have been followed right back to Mother Base. So let's say she does have some elaborate scheme in the works. If you want to catch her in the act, all we can do is sit back and wait. On the other hand, if she swears allegiance to the boss like our other Fulton recruits, he couldn't ask for a better partner. Oh, she's got you fooled. I have eyes on her. If she tries anything, she'll regret it. We lose nothing either way. Boss, we've gone over the prisoner transport log you found. Quiet was grabbed by the Soviets and moved to Lamar Hate Palace. They lost a lot of men to her. Can't blame them for wanting payback. But why did she just let herself get captured? I think it is time you knew. Quiet was carrying vocal cord parasites. The English strain, to be precise. The third English pair. Skullface was using her as a vector. An ace in the hole if his assassination plan failed. I knew it, but... Quiet chose not to speak. She told me the situation in Diné, Navajo. The only language to which the parasites do not react. If you found out, she could not remain among you. And yet, she refused the Volbachia treatment. Why? Because part of her still wanted revenge against you. Revenge against the boss? In order to stay here, she took a vow of eternal silence. But then, that sudden mutation showed this was not enough. As long as the parasites were inside her, she could not predict what might happen. And that's why she took off? Sacrificing herself to make sure the English strain died with her? Maybe. Or maybe she only wants to infect the world. Whatever her plan, we can't let her go free. The vocal cord parasites are the last of Skullface's legacy. It's up to us to erase it. Boss, the targets are quiet and the English strain she's carrying. Your objective is to extract her. But if worst comes to worst, she may have to be eliminated. Both her and the parasites. We don't know for sure what Quiet's up to, but we need to secure her ASAP. She's being held at Lamar Hate Palace. Make your way there. I did not choose to be quiet. I wanted to express my feelings to you. If only we shared a common tongue. Vengeance was what drove me to them. The only language left to me, revenge. But the words we shared, no, that was no language at all. That is why I chose the language of gratitude instead and go back to silence. I am quiet. I am the absence of words. It wasn't just Cypher. Back in the Caribbean, every eye in the world was turned on us. A private army, just a bunch of guys with guns in possession of a nuke. Why wouldn't they be uncomfortable? 
And that's why you made sure the inspection happened. Well, I thought our best move was to prove to the UN through the IAEA that we had no nuke. Of course, I was against us having it in the first place, but that was Snake's decision. The boss wasn't responsible. Well, don't get me wrong, I, I still believed in Snake. I thought I was making the best decision for all of us, that's all. I figured we should get a third party to exonerate us before proof of the nuke did get out. And who better to do that than an organization with international authority? <sighs> so the truth is, you took it upon yourself to agree to an inspection arranged by the UN. Only the inspection was a ruse, and Cypher Strike Force XOF showed up instead. I had no idea that would happen. Enough bullshit! Oh, sure, like I could have known. You know, I was just trying to prove our innocence to the world. What's wrong with that? We're not interested in the excuses you thought up. The truth is objective. Just see it from my point of view. You led XOF to the control tower. They seized it, giving them complete control over the base. Moments later, they detonated C4 on the strut legs. Anyone who'd managed to survive was hunted down by the assault force and their choppers. You can't believe I did that on purpose. That was the end of Mother Base. But it wasn't the end for you. How can you... Look, think about it. I lost something too. I built Zeke and it got buried underwater. I am a victim. That raises the big questions. Why were you the only one spared? You got away without a scratch. Why did Strangelove leave the base on the eve of the inspection? You two were close. Strangelove? <laughs> and how did you manage to build something that surpasses Zeke in every way? Because you did everything they told you. <laughs> You're the only one who didn't lose a thing. That is the truth. I was taken away against my will. Skullface forced me to do his research these past nine years. He used me. I lost nine years. Nine years? We all lost nine years. It wasn't just you. I suppose blaming me makes you feel better, does it? But who's gonna give me back all the time I lost? You're not getting anything back. <sighs> You're not a victim here, Emmerich. You're the perpetrator. I didn't know anything. Nobody can back that up. Yeah, all the evidence is at the bottom of the ocean. You know the hardest man to break. The type who's fooling himself. That takes time. It's easier to live a convenient lie than a painful truth. Is that the piece you've chosen, Doc? I'm not lying. Of course. Just let me check one or two things. On that day, you were in the control tower with them. Lucky you. That's how you got out unscathed. And you escaped on one of their choppers. Only you, right before the base went under. They had me blindfolded the whole time. I've never been so scared. The whole flight, I thought they'd kill me. But, but thinking of you kept me going. My comrades, all the way. And? There was a plane journey, and then we traveled by road. When they finally took off the blindfold, I was in kind of a warehouse, on the floor. Afghanistan, it was that research lab. I couldn't believe they'd taken me halfway around the world. And soon enough, he came. Skullface. He's the one who's really behind that mother base attack. He forced me into that research. What kind of research? He told me to build a bipedal walking tank for the Soviet Union. Like Peace Walker. A system that could fire an ICBM-class nuclear weapon. That's how the Sahelanthropus project got started. Sahelanthropus. Those AI weapons I'd made in Costa Rica were like toys by comparison. A whole world apart from reptilian four-legged crawling and, and that ridiculous hunched-over bipedal waddling. My design evolved to the dawn of mankind. Sahelanthropus, the first steps towards humanity. An upright, bipedal weapon system. Originally, Sahelanthropus was going to be a manned weapons platform. 
I designed a cockpit in its head, and I plan to fill it with water as a buffering agent. Like how Pass modified Zeke for human oh, control. Well, Don't so compare well. me to some amateur. I designed it for human control from the beginning. The problem was miniaturizing the posture control AI. You remember the reptile pod? The AI that controlled your unmanned weapon. Oh, right. Attaching Don't it externally tell. makes it vulnerable. So this time I wanted it beneath the armor. Meaning I had to make the AI smaller. I got it down to less than a tenth the size without any loss in computation speed. But it was still too big for the cockpit. There wasn't enough room for the pilot. If I made the head bigger, its body would have to be bigger to support it. Uh, too big to be practical. In the end, human piloting was taken off the table. I tested a remote control system too, but there was the time lag and I wasn't satisfied with its precision either. Plus, it would be useless if the enemy jammed it. So next, I went back to trying an AI-only system. To do that, I had the AI pods recovered from Nicaragua. <sighs> this was a hybrid AI, a combination of Peace Walker's reptile and mammal pods, the only AIs that had ever successfully operated an unmanned nuclear weapon system. Really? You'd need some help to get that working. Expert help. Did you work with someone? I worked alone. You did that yourself? <laughs> That's the thing. The AI didn't pan out in the end either. But I did finally get Sahelanthropus walking by folding over its upper body to lower its center of gravity. The first upright bipedal locomotive weapon system in the history of mankind. I guess technically it falls into the anthropoid ape category. I don't see the benefit of having it stand taller. On terrain with significant differences in elevation, like Afghanistan, you need a body that's vertically adaptable. That also lets it attack from long range while using mountain ridges for cover. So, making it walk upright was the most important factor in giving it superior height capability. As the name suggests, that was the whole point of Sahelanthropus. But I was being pushed for results. Having the AI mounted externally would have been the fastest way to get it working. I, I just needed more data so it could maintain its balance. But Skullface refused to wait. He dismissed the idea of AI control and took Sahelanthropus away from me before I could finish it. But it was walking when it came after you. That's just it. I don't understand how Skullface got it to move upright. Without a pilot or an AI. And walking at that speed, too. It's beyond anything I could have imagined. This is like the Wright brothers making it to the moon. I I'm just as clueless as you are. So this Soholanthropus, where is it now? I have no idea. All my experiments took place at that cave. I've never seen it anywhere else. Besides, it's still just an incomplete prototype at this point, and nothing but a paper tiger. Even if it can walk, it's far from being a viable weapons platform. It wouldn't be useful in actual battle. Emmerich will remain here at Mother Base for now, but not as a member of Diamond Dogs. I still don't trust him. That work for you? Fine by me. He can't be allowed any contact with staff either. Yeah. A lot of the guys would love some payback for nine years ago. We still need him alive. But we have to restrict his movements. He can only go where we tell him. And of course, the interrogations will continue. He worked for that skull bastard for nearly a decade. He still has more to tell us. How long are we gonna press him? If our investigation shows he really had nothing to do with the attack, we'll reconsider his place here. But I don't expect that to happen. Remember that water tank-shaped object in Emmerich's lab in the Soviet base camp? The thing that started talking to you like a possessed answering machine? That was a pod belt for housing the AI used to control unmanned weapons. You remember, back in 74 in Costa Rica. It was in those machines you fought there. They were designated pupa, chrysalis, cocoon, and basilisk. And each of them was fitted with an AI unit called a reptile pod. Emmerich created it. It mainly handled the machine's posture control and autonomous behavior. But the Basilisk, AKA Peace Walker, also featured a second AI pod. That one was called the Mammal Pod. 
and it was created by Dr. Strangelove. She tried to recreate the boss's personality through the mammal pod, but you pulled out its memory boards. That's when it transferred its own functions to its reptile pod, just like a human brain compensating for damage by using the remaining healthy parts. The result was a unique entity, a hybrid of the reptile and the mammal. It sank to the bottom of Lake Nicaragua with Peace Walker. But apparently they salvaged it and transported it to that lab. Don't let it deceive you, Snake. It may sound like the boss, but it has neither a personality nor a will. Like Emmerich says, it's just a machine. You call that thing Sahalanthropus. Where does the name come from? Well, several years ago, an excavation team discovered a hominid skull in the Sahel region. Central Africa. The Southern Sahara. Cypher gave the specimen the name Sahalanthropus. Man of Sahel. And then they covered the whole thing up. Why? They probably wanted to monopolize information about human evolution to have a head start in their genetic research. At least, until they had an idea of what they'd found. It was that big of a discovery, huh? Sahalanthropus was a gracile hominid, estimated to have lived about seven million years ago. What's significant about it is how its skull's foramen magnum faces down. In other words, its spinal column supported its head from underneath. It stood upright. Right. Which would mean Sahalanthropus walked upright three million years before Australopithecus, making it the world's oldest human species. Walking upright. I get it. Hence the name Sahalanthropus for your machine. Walking upright was the decisive difference between our ancestors and other anthropoids. Our brains could get heavier once they were supported by the spinal column. That led to the use of tools and the development of complex communication through language. Only man is capable of this. My creation will be the progenitor of all bipedal weapon platforms. And you did this for Cypher? No, n not at all. Sahalanthropus is the best proof that I never betrayed you guys. What do you mean? The reconstructed Sahalanthropus skull looked exactly like the skull we used as our logo nine years ago in the Caribbean. An army without a nation. Outside the world order. The design was based on Pangaea, the supercontinent that existed 250 million years ago, right? Yeah. When the world was a single landmass. That concept's at the source of our strength. I felt the same way about Sahalanthropus. Sure, I was forced to build it under their orders, but I always wanted to put its technology back in our hands someday. That's the reason I incorporated the old insignia into Sahalanthropus's name. Don't you see? That's how much I was thinking about you guys. Oh, I see, all right. I see someone desperate to cover his ass. You can say whatever you want after the fact. But that skull also symbolizes somebody else. Skull face. Snake, you finally came. Just don't record this, okay? Not recording anything. What's this about? What I'm about to say stays between you and me. It's about the weapon to surpass Metal Gear. <sighs> Do you know a researcher by the name of Clark? He works in the biotech industry. Real advanced stuff. His area is bioengineering, but lately he's also gotten into genetic research. Never heard of him. Well then, what do you know about cloning? Well, I think I've heard enough. Hold on, this is important. Cloning lets you create a genetic copy of an organism. You take the nucleus of one of its cells, and you swap it with the nucleus of an unfertilized egg from another member of the same species. They started out working with plants, but since then they've had success with other organisms, including mammals. It's a hot area for a lot of places right now. Corporations, universities, research groups. There's no shortage of scientists out to get famous and patent their work, with morality taking a back seat. Isn't that a little outside your field? It's got nothing to do with my research. But I thought it might be of interest to you. 
cloning and Dr. Clark, I mean. Go on. Now, this is really highly classified stuff. But I've heard that an American biotech company has successfully cloned a human being. What's more, it happened over 10 years ago. And the researcher behind it was Dr. Clark. You've really never heard of him? I don't meet many doctors. This Dr. Clark is a complete ghost, even to others in his field. His age, where he comes from, that might not be his real name. And I can't even say for sure he's a he. Clark's employer, ATGC, its company motto is embracing your hopes, preserving talent. What does this have to do with me? Cypher. Dr. Clark works for ATGC, and they have connections to DARPA. Cypher couldn't function without the communications network DARPA's built. Meaning, Cypher has to be a part of the Pentagon. Or at least, the two are joined at the hip. DARPA is a driving force behind human cloning. It's a pretty high-priority project for them. And this Dr. Clark? Some say he's a pivotal player in Cypher. But that's not all. Every cell nucleus in an organism contains the genetic information for that organism. Think of it as a blueprint for life. Clark appears to be working on how to decode this information and rearrange it at will. If you could do that, it would mean being able to custom design human beings for specific purposes. Can you believe that? Suppose for a moment that this is all fact. A man of your talents, if your genetic information died with you, that would be a terrible loss for mankind. But what if mankind could preserve you for future generations by cloning you? All right, enough. I get the idea. Look, I know it's inductive reasoning, but this weapon to surpass Metal Gear they're developing in Africa, I believe it's something that uses this new technology. <sighs> Speaking as a fellow scientist, it chills me to the bone. That's rich coming from you. If genes serve as our blueprint, then I wonder if they include an impulse that drives us to tweak the design. Can you imagine that? Genes, encoded with information that wants its children to decode it. Is life itself putting the direction of our next evolution in the hands of scientists? I guess it would take some real arrogance to believe that. And yet, it could be what Cypher's after. I think you're barking up the wrong tree. But that was an interesting story. It'd make a good movie. You have to believe me. Where'd you hear all this anyway? Where? I just overheard it in bits and pieces while I was forced to do that research for them. Right. W wait a minute. Look. I want to help you. I want to be of service here. I'm risking my life with this. Is that so? Maybe it's time we brought someone else into the conversation. No, not him. Not Ocelot. You can't do this. Fine. Yes, Strangelove was doing AI research in that lab. Why hide that until now? Why? Okay, so what? I wasn't working alone. You've got to understand. You do understand, right? I didn't want to drag her into this. It's my load to bear, alone. So you didn't create the AI intended to drive Sahelanthropus. It was strange, love. Skullface was never in favor of AI control. So naturally, they argued. Strange love, she... She got him angry, and then he killed her. How? You didn't see it? So you found her inside that pot after the fact. And you just left her body to rot in there. Or perhaps you put her in there afterward. I, I, I asked him not to take her away from me. So she was killed by Skullface, but you asked nicely, and he put her body in the AI pod for you. That's right. Pathetic. You know, we have another idea. That you killed her. What, me? Oh, I couldn't kill her. You killed her and locked her body in the pod. 
I wouldn't. D don't treat me like one of you. I, I can't just kill anyone whenever I feel like it. I'm a, a, a normal human being. Oh, I see. So you just shut her inside and waited for her to die. I would never do that. What, you mean she killed herself? Yes. She, she climbed inside that pod and shut the door. It can't be open from the outside. It was suicide. Mm. Suicide, I said. She killed herself. She got in when I wasn't looking and, and suffocated. She'd often try to do things like that. Uh, by the time I realized and opened the door, she wasn't breathing. I, I got scared and shut the pod again. I couldn't bring myself to open it back up. That's right. Me? Kill her? What is wrong with you? I see. Just tell me one more thing. Haven't you gotten enough today? Okay, okay. I see it's a painful memory. You don't have to answer. Just listen to the question. <sighs> you see, we examined her remains. She had a scar on her lower abdomen. A surgical scar. It had been stitched up and had fully healed, meaning it was long before her death. She had a child, didn't she? Uh, I, I... Your child. Where's the kid? How should I know? So there is a child. I've never seen his face. What do you take us for? They took it all. Even my child. I didn't even know he'd been born. I... I lost... Everything. How old would he be? It's four years since then. And you know it's a boy. Strange Love said so. And his name? We called him Hal. Even though I never saw his face. <laughs> your goal in having the children repair Sahelanthropus? I just answered their questions. I had no idea they would actually try to fix it. I mean, can you imagine a child piloting it? Oh, sure. Easily. It wouldn't work. Well, I bet it's just like riding a bike. I said it didn't work. It... Who did you try? I, I didn't. Did you put your son in it? Uh, we never did that. His name was, uh, Hal, wasn't it? I, I thought you said you never saw his face. But you made him pilot Sahelanthropus. You used him in your experiments. He wanted to get in. <sighs> it was such a short time we had. So he was with you. We were happy. You're still happy now. Changing your lies to suit the listener, and getting by slipping through the cracks. Building layer upon layer of convenient stories until nothing means anything to you anymore. You're happy all the time, because you don't even notice you're doing it. Think hard. Who are you, really? You're not a victim, and you're not the silent majority. You're a perpetrator and a petty hypocrite. The real world doesn't make you suffer. It's the other way around. Well, Doctor, I have the report on the incident at the quarantine facility. Assuming the vocal cord parasite evolved, I'm sorry, underwent a mutation. The only plausible explanations are exposure to some high concentration mutagen or radiation. As you know, some of the staff at the quarantine facility were infected with the parasites. The Wolbachia prevented them from copulating, but the parasites themselves can't be removed from their host's vocal cords. Once you're infected with... Skullface's parting gift, you're stuck with it. The researchers regularly used X-ray equipment to monitor the parasites in their throats. No problem there, they kept a close eye on the radiation doses. But that equipment didn't just give off x-rays. It was also emitting beta rays. Even though that's unnecessary for the scans. See, beta rays have far worse effects on DNA than x-rays. 
Meaning the only logical conclusion is that someone added in a beta ray emitter to trigger a mutation. Those beta rays leaked out from inside the equipment. Because the emitter was retrofitted, the shielding was inadequate. And the person who ordered and inspected the equipment was you, Doctor. That makes you the only person with the opportunity to install that emitter. So now you're saying I sabotage medical equipment for some wild plan to make the vocal cord parasite kill everyone? Or maybe you thought it'd reveal a way to treat the parasite without using the Wolbachia. With that much to barter, I suppose some people would welcome even a pathetic cur like you. Just stop it! You'd have no shortage of buyers. But most would be happy with just the parasite. You wouldn't need to offer anything else. However, if that buyer already knew about the parasite, they'd also know that by itself, it's no longer the ultimate bargaining chip it once was. To sell to that buyer, you need to throw in a bonus. A way to one-up it. There's only one buyer who'd be after that. <laughs> Emmerich. We record all communications on Mother Base. That includes radio transmissions to and from homemade devices. You've been in frequent contact with people in America. A private biotech company. A client of which is DARPA. And they are connected to Cypher. You made a deal with Cypher. You offered them a new parasite in exchange for your safety. This is the only place in the world where the vocal cord parasite still exists. And you used it as a testing ground. Tried to resurrect their bioweapon. But your plan to obtain the parasite has failed. Your bullshit ends now. I don't think you're leaving here alive. Wait, wait, what are you talking about? Just what do you plan to do? Present the charges against you and render an appropriate punishment. You're gonna put me on trial? <laughs> Call it what you like. What's the meaning of this? Out of here, all of you. Back to your posts. No, hang on. Huey has killed their comrades and interfered with their lives. They've had all they can take. Kill that son of a bitch! Kill her! Kill her! Stop! This is insane! You have no evidence whatsoever. You say you're an army free from government. You talk big about being a nation unto yourselves. But, but from the outside, you're just thugs, rebels, a militia, you terrorists, an unhinged threat to society. You're nothing but a, a bunch of psychopaths. You are? So you're not with us? N no, I, I didn't. I thought we were on the same side. That's too bad. I... I didn't mean... <clears throat> Meg, you will have justice. But our organization, the boss's organization, is built on order and reason. There will be no lynch mob. So stand down for today. We will gather all the evidence of this man's crimes. And then he will be tried. Dismissed! What do you think you're doing? Go ahead and execute me. It'll be murder in the eyes of the world. You've lost your minds. Don't you get it? You're seeing phantoms. Just look at that dog. No, you named him D-Dog, but it's obvious anyone could see that's a wolf because you're all a bunch of wild dogs. You wanted to believe he was too, to feel some connection, to fight your loneliness. You wanted something to cling to, to prove you deserve to be alive. You wanted to forget the death, your sins. So you'd cling on to dogs, or wolves, or even Big Boss. The boss is the same, isn't he? Every one of you is alone. That's why you suspect your own. I know, because I do the same. I'm one of you too. Alone. Open your eyes! What you're doing is murder! Plain and simple! All you ever create is war! 
War and violence can never lead to peace. The R&D team's going to take over Emmerich's work. He may be gone, but it won't affect us one bit. We'll be able to deliver whatever you need just like before. You can depend on that. One other thing. I'm tracking his whereabouts. Nothing to report at the moment, though. Let it go. He's gone. The guy's gone. I know. I just want to be sure. Not like I'm losing sleep over this son of a bitch. Open this thing! Huey! Damn it, Huey! Open it now! Please! Let me out! Kill me. Kill me! If only I'd tried to get out sooner. Perhaps I'd have made it. Why didn't I stop the hatch from closing? Even if it meant losing an arm. So stay well. My voice is so distant. But you can hear me, can't you, Joy? I know you can. You're recording all of this. Deep down in some memory ward he'll never find. Duplicating it. Burying it under heaps of meaningless code. <laughs> anyway, I guess I can say what needs to be said. I can still do that much. Talk to you. Even if I can't face you, even if there's a heaven, even if you're waiting there, I don't deserve to see you again. I don't deserve to love you. I signed up for Zero's plan. Even now that he's halfway to dead, his plan lives on, leeching away at the wall. And it took your strength to make it happen. In using you, I put the world in his palm. Once and for all. Zero. Zero. Or whoever it is who's taken his name. They found me. After the Caribbean. They made me. Simulate his will. So that even after the body was gone, that will would keep the world turning the way they wanted. I had no choice. They dredged Lago Cosi Bolka, pulled up your phantom, forced me to revive 
and modify you. I thought I could bring you back, but in the end, I sold your will to him. Now this part is just one big shell. A husk. <laughs> Your phantom's no longer here. As for me, everything I touch turns to ashes. I could never make anyone happy. And now I'll never see my son again. Clown, approaching. <sighs> But, at least Hal's free from his father's hands. Me, with child, can you imagine? I wonder how you took the news. Were you jealous? I knew what I was doing. If I could pass your will onto a child I carried, my genes, your meme, a father would be irrelevant. If I did that, that child would be ours. I've been a fool. Pride, conceit, baseless theories. Of course, I couldn't see through the dream. The false you. I created. I only wanted to pass your will on to the next generation. But Zero took it away. And now I haven't just lost you. I've lost my... Oh, Hal. Can you forgive the mother who couldn't protect you? The one who let them take it all away from us. Caution, rain approaching. There's still hope. You, the one he took away. You'll never break your will. The will to make this world the way you saw it could be. I buried code, just to be sure. Inside of you, there is an egg. And when someone finds it, when they crack it, There'll be nothing left to stop you. The world you envisioned will become a reality. Joy. I know you can hear me. You do remember my voice? Don't you? Please take care of our son. Hell, don't ever be afraid. Whatever happens, 
She'll be watching over you. The system, the framework for your world, will protect you. You don't need me. You just need to be strong enough for the both of us. <laughs> the report on that cargo we stole from Cypher's truck. The PF was transporting two things. The analysis of that malachite has come back first. Naturally, the main compound is copper. There's also a small amount of cobalt. Nothing unusual so far. Southern Zaire is a well-known copper belt. However, in addition to these, we also detected a trace amount of uranium. The content percentage, though, is too low for nuclear development. It most likely came from Shinkalobwe mine. That's where the uranium in that area Sorry, comes from. The mine's closed, as all the high-purity uranium ore dried up a long time ago. But you could probably still find it there in small quantities. That said, there are plenty of other uranium mines that are in operation, like in Niger, Namibia, South Africa. Why go to an abandoned mine to scrape up whatever's left and ship it out in mass quantities without refining it? They were transporting that yellow cake, too which would suggest they have the technology to refine uranium. Anyway, that about sums it up. Unfortunately, the analysis of that yellow cake is taking a little longer. I'll let you know when it's done. Boss, sorry to keep you waiting. We finally finished analyzing that yellow cake Cypher was moving. There was nothing unusual about the composition of the yellow cake itself. Most of it was oxidized uranium, with the rest being impurities various metals as well as traces of organic matter. What's interesting is the composition of these impurities. When we checked them against the impurities found in the copper ore, it was clear the yellow cake didn't come from Shinkalobwe, meaning they went to the trouble of mining two sources of uranium, then transported them together in different states. Another thing, we detected a very thin layer of highly enriched uranium in the middle of the yellow cake. Now that is very interesting. It may not be a lot, but it points to the existence of uranium-enriching technology. After all, yellow cake can't naturally produce highly enriched uranium. If they could mass-produce this, they'd be just one step away from a gun-barrel-type nuclear bomb. But uranium enrichment requires advanced technology and a large-scale facility. If that kind of place existed in Zaire, the Soviet Union wouldn't sit idly by. And there's another question. Where were they transporting the yellow cake and malachite uranium? The first place that comes to mind is South Africa. The government was supposed to have abandoned nuclear weapons development after caving to international pressure. But rumors persist that it's continued in secret. Plus, ZRS were escorting the truck, and they're based out of South Africa. And then South Africa does have an abandoned test site. If Cypher's involved with nuclear development in South Africa, but how would that fit with their weapon to surpass Metal Gear? Clown. We need more information. Shinka Lobwe. There's a name I haven't heard in a while. The U.S. bought a lot of uranium from Shinka Lobwe mine during World War II for the Manhattan Project. They even sent a squad from the Army Corps of Engineers to reopen the mine after it was flooded. That's how good its uranium must have been. With that, the world's first nuclear test was a success. 
Shikolobwe uranium might have been used in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, too. Just hearing its name is like seeing all the phantoms of the war rise up to haunt us. But all the uranium's dried up, and the mine's been closed for years. So someone reopened it? Right. Zero Risk Security seized control of the area and were forcing locals to work in it. And the Zairean government was getting a slice of what they took in exchange for looking the other way. Mobutu has to finance his tastes somehow. He'll gladly sell the rights to some old mine. The question is, why would Zero Risk Security do this kind of thing? Or rather, why were their employers, Cypher, interested in an abandoned mine? Maybe getting trace amounts of uranium, yet to the naked eye it appears to be ordinary malachite. Meaning security would be lax. Not a very efficient way of obtaining it, but easier to move. But how would they enrich it at its destination? Did the yellow cake really have a layer of highly enriched uranium in it? Having trouble believing it? No. If they say it's real, then it's real. In which case, they might have some enrichment method that we don't know about. And this was to test it out? It's possible. And that would mean it's almost complete. Ever since the attack on your unit nine years ago, the name Big Boss has become known the world over. What do you mean? Those of your men who survived traveled far and wide. They fought throughout the world. In fact, they're part of the reason we have all these PFs now. Every one of them suffered their own phantom pain from losing you. Talking about you wherever they went helped to heal their wounds. Your actions and words, your legend, has been told on every battlefield they've set foot on. Obviously, as the tales have spread, the truth's been distorted, painted over. Big Boss sacrificed himself to show us the threat that Cypher poses. He sounded a warning, so it goes. A warning? Too much power destroys the hands that hold it. Apparently, you chose to be a living example of that. I never said any of that. The moment any truth is passed on, it starts turning into fiction. The problem is, fiction inspires people more than facts. To the world, you're now the legendary mercenary Big Boss. The lessons you've taught the PFs are the reason they're so widespread. They're the reason they've survived. And you know what they all aspire to? To one day go nuclear, just like you did, and stand up to Cypher. Of all the stupid things you could do, they'll never understand what you really wanted. Heroes are misunderstood. It takes a man of the same caliber to understand what drives them. Bottom line is, these guys want to be like their hero big boss. And deep down, they all have their eyes on nuclear weapons. They say that a nuke is the only means of standing against Cypher. But these days, it's becoming little more than a slogan to rally the troops and survive in a cutthroat business. Currently, there are three major PFs who've expanded into Central Africa. CFA, Rogue Coyote, and Zero Risk Security. HEC's investigations have shown there's almost no overlap between their areas of operation. It's not so much a turf war. More like they have a gentleman's agreement. If you do cross paths with them, you probably won't have to face more than one at a time. Still, don't expect to walk in the park. The CFA, Contract Forces of Africa. These guys are a major player. Their head office is in Pretoria, South Africa. That's also where the South African Defense Force is headquartered. We think the two are closely connected. An HEC investigation revealed that most of the CFA's operators are former SADF soldiers. South Africa has been locked in struggles with neighboring regimes for years. That means constant action. And we know better than anyone that's the best kind of training. A company drawing its recruits from hardened military vets. You can bet they know how to handle themselves. Do not underestimate them. Within the CFA is a company of soldiers made up mainly of locally hired operators. They speak Afrikaans to communicate with personnel from the CFA. But if you notice any speaking the local language, that's them. Though hired from the local population, they were originally part of a paramilitary group, so they'll have plenty of combat experience. And unlike their days shooting junkyard rifles out of beat-up pickup trucks, the CFA now supplies them with the latest gear from the West. On top of that, they've been combat trained by the South African Army. All that adds up to a much stronger fighting force. So don't brush them off. Look at the Angola-Zaire border region. The East Bank of the Muneni River, in particular. 
It's a microcosm of a problem that stretches all across Africa. There's a civil war going on in Angola fought between the government MPLA and the Western-backed Unida. Zaire is still a dictatorship under President Mobutu, but numerous uprisings have broken out in its remote regions. With all the trouble elsewhere keeping their hands full, neither government has control over their side of the border. They depend on militias and PFs, as do the rebels. Government forces, guerrillas, militants, groups of all shapes and sizes hawk whatever resources they can to hire PFs. Conflict brings PFs. PFs expand the war zone, and more conflicts erupt in a continuous chain reaction. <laughs> Sounds like our kind of work. Mother base could grow by leaps and bounds. Hard to believe how many of those bipedal weapons have popped up around Africa. When did that start? No more than six months ago. Didn't really hit me until I came here. They're not supposed to be any use yet. Emmerich says they were still doing the last round of fine-tuning. The doctor has no idea. His research has already hit the black market. Both sides of the Iron Curtain will have it by now. <sighs> Even so, they're spreading much too fast. Sure, the Walker Gears can operate in any terrain. Their mobility's just as good in the jungle as it is in the desert. That would come in handy in a place like Africa. They are modules that can one day be used as nuclear weapon systems. And with that in mind, the numbers are way too large. There must be another reason they're so widespread. Like what? It's all about needs. To small-time outfits like most of these private forces, this product is a dream come true. Hell, it goes beyond PFs. This is the ultimate weapon, the forbidden fruit for anyone with an enemy to fight and people to defend. The nuclear deterrent. Exactly. Sounds familiar, huh? PFs are all operating off your playbook. You created these times. But could this be the new weapon in Africa that Emmerich talked about? If it is, why is Cypher letting everyone and his brother get their hands on one? What comes next? Selling nuclear weapons in the open? Making them public property? Why don't they give that a try? Then the next war really will be fought with sticks. Right. The man we're dealing with isn't foolish enough to make a suicide pact with the world. So, what is Cypher really up to? Zero Risk Security aren't as hardcore a military outfit compared to the other two PFs in this region. The company sends operators to conflict regions around the world, not just Africa. They have decades of combined experience. They're also based out of South Africa. Their headquarters is in Johannesburg. A lot of their work involves corporate security for South African companies, but a good number of their operators are retired South African military. So don't mistake them for a bunch of security guards. Rogue Coyote operates mainly out of Africa these days. Of the three PFs, they're the smallest. However, they scooped up most of the Rhodesian SAS after the country collapsed four years ago. Picture their entire organization as one big special forces unit. With Rhodesia a British colony, the Rhodesian SAS had its origins in 22 SAS Sea Squadron. They started out as a group known as the Southern Rhodesia Volunteers, but in 51 they were incorporated into 22 SAS as members of the British Commonwealth and deployed to fight guerrillas in the Malayan emergency. Even now, 22 SAS keeps the Sea Squadron designation empty in recognition of their service. In a way, you could say the SAS almost makes up the core of Rogue Coyote. Later on, they were bolstered by other talent, including former Sela Scouts and 32 Battalion. These guys are direct descendants of the best special forces in the world. They won't go down without a fight. Don't get careless. Kunganga Mine. A civil war has been going on in that region for the last 20 years. It's being fought by what are now two ethnic groups, the Buta and the Mbele. Originally, you could barely tell them apart, but the reason for the current armed conflict goes back to World War I. After the war, their land was colonized by a European power, and it decided to give local control to the Buta. That split the two groups into rulers and subjects, laying the foundations for an inevitable civil war. The friction between them remained even after they won independence from Europe. The Buta are holding on to power to this day, 
and the Mbele rebels continue to fight back. The conflict is funded by locally mined gold, rare metals, diamonds. They've used the money from those to arm themselves, buy oil and even hire PFs. The Buta administration owns the mining rights to Kungenga Mine. But most of the laborers are Mbele, who they've taken prisoner. The product they've gouged out of their land is bought up by cheap Western corporations. And this civil war is fueled by the profits. That's how it goes. One country's people is split apart by another country. Then the two groups tear up their own land for money in order to fight each other. Now this civil war started by a foreign power is the norm. And it's sucking up all the country's resources. PFs are just the same. They follow the money, taking war with them wherever they go. That goes for us, too. It's an endless river of bloody retaliation, and we're standing downstream. Should we make a stand and staunch the flow? Or wade in amongst the corpses and make a bigger splash than the rest? We'll follow your lead, boss. Boss, about those invalids you saw in that devil's house. Poor bastards. All strapped down to the beds, with those lumps on their chest. The medical staff tell me they were probably a type of cyst. Cysts can get that big. In some cases, yes. But supposing they're a kind of atheroma forming on the surface of the skin, the size is just too big, and the appearance is all wrong. In the end, the medical team were at a loss. Those lumps were like nothing they'd ever seen. The fluid you said you got on your prosthesis when you touched one was burned off in the fighting, and the factory burned down too. None of the tests we did once you were back at the base revealed a pathogen that could have caused them. Meaning we don't have a single sample to work with. Everything went up in flames. What worries the medical team most is whether it's contagious. Whether there's a chance we could end up like that. And? Mother Base's sanitation control has always been strict. After all, war is great at transporting diseases. For the time being, at least. There's no sign of contagion or any symptoms that could be related. One more thing, about the surgery that had been performed on the people in the Devil's House. Yeah. You said that their throats were cut open, with an acoustic tube pushed inside? Right. The tubes were hooked up to tape recorders, playing some kind of audio. Well, we picked up some of that audio through your radio transmissions and recorded it here. The Intel team has been working on analyzing the communications lock. What have they found? There's nothing tying the contents together. We've got a report on three deaths in a car accident on the auto route near Marseille. Protests outside the Libyan embassy in London. A press conference with the former prime minister of Sweden. A four-month-old weather forecast for Balikpapan. And then commercials for appliances, cough syrup, and TV dinners. Assuming they're not all staged, they come off as recordings of your average public broadcasts. Public broadcasts? Just radio and TV signals? Yes. And from all over the world. We're looking into whether they're genuine or not, just to be sure. What else? A speech that sounds like it was recorded out on the street, and people chatting about how this year's tomato crop did. And there's nothing they have in common? We're part way through the cryptanalysis. That includes checking all audio ranges and running it backward and at different speeds. Then there's vocabulary breakdown for political suggestions, ideological common points. But I don't think it's going to get us anywhere. Where were the recordings made? There's nothing linking them from that angle either. Just like you reported, we've detected virtually every major language there is. French, German, Italian, Spanish, including South American accents. Then there's Russian, Hindi, Arabic, Portuguese, Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese. They're nothing if not thorough. <laughs> well, I don't know if we've got them all covered. Ignoring the ones that have gone extinct, Supposedly, over 5,000 languages exist today. Besides, English isn't one of the ones we picked up. Really? English? I know. Only 5% of the world's population is a native English speaker. But when you factor in those who've acquired it as a second language, nearly one-third of the people speak it. The world's dominant lingua franca. You gotta figure they had it somewhere among all the languages in that place. No English. Bear in mind, we didn't hear everything that was played in that room. We couldn't isolate the more distant sounds due to static and the... Well, the program could have been set to change every day. In a nutshell, for reasons unknown, people in that room with a common medical condition were made to listen to recordings and languages from around the world. 
It's not clear how the growths on their chests fit into it. It could have been treatment for them, or maybe an experiment of some kind. I'm guessing one person knows. Yeah, Skullface. He was there. The only thing we can say for sure is that he's involved. Snake, I wanted to ask you about the man on fire. What do you remember from the hospital? Anything we can use? Well, he took off the moment the sprinklers started up. Sprinklers? The fire system? And when he got sprayed with water from the burst pipe, it slowed him down. When we escaped on horseback, he wouldn't cross the river either. And then it started to rain. And he disappeared. Water against fire. Is it that simple? I mean, it makes sense. It's just hard to believe it would work on a guy like that. You mentioned that the man on fire was crushed under Sahelanthropus in its hangar. Yeah. He was caught under the wheels of its transport platform. Mm. But his body wasn't found. What? We searched the area the moment we arrived, but there was no trace of him. I wasn't hallucinating. I know. I trust you on that. That means someone must have taken the body. But when I got there, everything was still as it was. Even Skullface hadn't been touched. I can't see a reason to sneak into a place like that and drag out the biggest, heaviest guy there. What are you getting at? Only option left is... He got up and walked away. That platform ran him over. Just ran him over. You're saying that's not enough? I don't want to believe it, but... Maybe not. He shrugs off bullets, even rocket strikes. There's no reason to think that would finish him. It seems ridiculous, but... I'll start gathering eyewitness accounts, just in case. If you dig up anything concrete, I want to know. You'll be the first, if I dig anything up. But I hope to hell I don't. No kidding. Volgan, the Gru Colonel, was burned alive with a Shagoha during Operation Snake Eater 20 years ago. Despite suffering severe burns to his entire body, he still clung to life. After you left Seleniarsk, Volgan's body was taken to a research institute in the outskirts of Moscow. But modern medicine couldn't explain why he was still alive. Not that the colonel was any ordinary man to begin with. That constant electric current he had running through his body that he could unleash at will. To be honest, I was always uncomfortable around him. Thought I might get electrocuted just by standing nearby. The institute studying him was tasked with investigating and developing human paranormal abilities. The comatose Volgan was used to further the Soviet Union's research into such abilities. But not long ago, the facility burned to the ground. And Volgan's body was never found among the rubble, even though the fire started in the room where they were keeping him. This occurred at around the same time you woke up. If Skullface was right, and a thirst for revenge can turn a man into a demon and keep the dead alive, then this man on fire who's been coming after us ever since you woke up, well, that just might be what's left of our old friend, Volgan. It's not over yet. Back in 64, in Selenyarsk, you brought his plans for a utopia down in flames. That grudge is what's keeping him alive. The day the research facility holding Volgan burned down, a Soviet jumbo passenger jet happened to crash nearby, far away to the north of that hospital in Cyprus. On board the plane was a young boy who was being studied at the same facility. The plane fell to Earth from over 8,000 feet, but the boy's body was the only one not recovered. At almost exactly the same time as the crash, Volgan awoke in that facility. According to the Research Institute's documents, the gifts this boy demonstrated included psychokinesis and telepathy. To protect his mind from being inundated with other people's thoughts, he always wore a kind of gas mask. A rudimentary form of psychic insulation, apparently. We don't know where this boy is, but if Skullface is connected to him, we may cross paths with him yet. This boy is part of a new age where nothing we understand about the world makes sense anymore. Don't let your guard down. The White Mamba, Nyokayam Pembe. He's the commander of the kids based out of Wale Yamasa. As you know, contract forces of Africa were stationed at that village. 
Anti-government forces hired ZRS to bring kids there from around Africa for training. But at some point, the adults with the PF started dropping like flies. This was right after we arrived in Africa. We don't know the cause. The kids ended up on their own. Must have been like fish out of water. Nothing to eat, no way to get back home. All the adults taught them was how to use a gun. Sure, they could shoot targets, but hunt for food? Not likely. They wouldn't have lasted long. Then the White Mamba showed up. He was faster and stronger than them, a better soldier, and he knew how to lead. I guess somebody wished upon a star, because their savior turned up like stardust straight out of the blue. The moment he arrived, the kids had their new commander. That was when they started attacking other villages. Word of the infamous White Mamba spread fast. But it isn't just his combat skills that got people talking. As you can tell from the name, he's the only light-skinned kid in the unit. Not to mention the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Not common in those parts. We have no idea where he came from or what he's experienced. The kid's a huge blank. But I'm sure you'll know him when you see him. One other thing. He's still a kid, so don't kill him. Be careful not to hit him with anything lethal. Not even a flesh wound. Our mission objective isn't just suppressing a bunch of militants. This is a DDR operation of the kids in that unit. DDR stands for Disarmament, Demobilization, and Reintegration. Disarmament is obvious. We take their weapons off their hands. The demobilization part means dismantling their military organization to ensure they can't arm themselves again. To do that, you need to capture the unit's commander and have him order his men to disband. In this case, the commander is the White Mamba. There's nobody above him, so he's all we need to grab. Finally, reintegration. Through education and occupational training, we give them a means to live besides war. A lot of kids born in a war zone don't know any other way to live. So before they find themselves back there, we teach them another skill. I'd like to establish this rehabilitation process at Mother Base. That's why we're bringing those kids back here. It's not so much for their sake. It's for the Caution. world that we're trying to create. No other way about it. Those kids are amateurs. Bad for business to have them running around where we're trying to work. Bring them all back if possible. Or as many as you can. We placed the White Mamba and the rest of his unit in the staff living quarters. How's that going? It's a disaster, but what else can we do? We've taken away his weapons and banned him from using his nom de guerre. Apparently his real name is Eli. He must feel like we stripped him of his whole identity. We'll let things simmer down. I put a guard on him for now. Still the question is, who is he? Where did he come from, and how has he survived? He's still not talking. No. He won't say a word about himself. But you know, it looks like he speaks English. One of the deck crew called out to him in English, and he said something back. He just lost it all of a sudden, started mouthing off at the guy, in perfect English. He wasn't stringing together words he picked up somewhere. So English is his mother tongue? He could be from the East, or the South, or maybe even further North or South. English is well established in countries all across the continent. It's rooted in Africa like a weed. Or maybe parasite is the better word. So just speaking English doesn't help us figure out where he comes from. Could even be from off-continent. Right. In any case, we'll keep an eye on him. If we learn anything else, I'll be sure to let you know. Boss, we've got the results of Eli's genetic tests. We can finally put this worry behind us. We used the PCR technique and conducted DNA fingerprinting of the copied DNA sequences. Neither is mainstream science yet, but the concepts and procedures are sound. Both tests say there is 0% chance that the two of you are blood relatives, meaning the results are negative. He's not your son, nor is he your clone. He's just another person. It was 12 years ago that Zero made plans to clone you. Eli's age and appearance certainly are a good fit. I admit the first time I saw him, I did a double take. But it looks like we were worried for nothing. Eli isn't your clone. But you might still have one somewhere out there. But if Eli isn't the boss's clone, why does he seem so obsessed with him? Not to mention having one hell of an attitude for his age. I don't know. Learning the truth about himself 
cursing the fact he's a clone, bearing a grudge against selfish adults, and coming to hate who he was cloned from. Big Boss. If that were really the case, I could understand it. I might even feel a bit sorry for him. <sighs> but no clone could have a totally different DNA fingerprint. And the test left no room for error. You yourself were there when we drew Eli's blood sample. Come to think of it, when we went to OKB Zero, he'd snuck onto a chopper and was there. Yeah. He was acting strange even then. Or actually from a little before that time. That was exactly when we began these tests. Maybe he suspected something when we drew the sample, not knowing what we were doing to him, and becoming mistrustful of us. Hard to say. Eli's had an attitude problem from day one. So what is he then? Well, if he's gonna tell us that himself, we'll need to get him to open up more first. About the pathogen spreading through Mother Base, you've seen everything we've got on the outbreak. What's your opinion? Textbook symptoms. A vocal cord parasite infestation. And judging from this casualty list, it is the Kikongo strain. Meaning, a breed of parasite that triggers symptoms upon detecting pronunciation specific to Kikongo. So our Kikongo-speaking staff are at risk? Quite so. Hmm. He's right. All the victims do speak Kikongo. So they can survive if they just use another language. There is no guarantee you're only dealing with the Kakongo strain. Other language strains may be present. You well know he was teaching them languages from all over the world. The Devil's House. In Zoya Badia Bulu. There is no way to know how many strains he has at his disposal. So how do we keep them from becoming symptomatic? You mentioned using microbes. Use this. A type of Wolbachia. Introduced to a sample of the parasite. Wolbachia? A parasitic bacteria that colonizes the parasites. Turning male to female. And preventing copulation. You must cultivate more. What have you done with the infected bodies? Cremated, to stop the spread of infection. But we did keep a few for study. Good. Take this sample, grind it to a pulp, and introduce it to the larvae now nesting in the dead. The Bulbachia will multiply rapidly within those larvae. They're soldiers, not some petri dish. Conventional cultivation methods will take too long. Extract the Volbachia from those larvae, and vaccinate your men. Kikongo speakers first. This is the fastest, surest way. No one is to speak a word of Kikongo until the Volbachia are safely inside them. I will instruct your medical staff in detail on site. You have the appropriate facilities. Yes, but do not worry. I made a pact with your Bette Holone on the honor of the Dine. I speak no lies. Keep an eye on him. Will do. Follow me. I'll take you to the medical team. Now, we must wait for the Volbachia to multiply in the larvae. How is the disease transmitted? If it's carried by insects or rodents, then... There is no intermediate host. So... The vocal cord parasites lay their eggs in the larynx of the host. Most hatch and migrate to the lungs, but some are transported to the mouth through ciliary movement, mixing in with saliva. Saliva. Droplet transmission. Sneezing, coughing. Any food or water containing infected saliva. It would spread fast. Indeed. And when the larvae migrate to the lungs, symptoms can resemble the early stages of a cold, making it easy to infect others. Meaning a simple conversation would be enough to pass it on. All right, so what happens after the larvae migrate to the lungs? It is as I said before. They mature by feeding on alveolar tissue. 
It is only then that noticeable symptoms appear in the host. And by that point, it's too late. He's infected everyone else. It's one hell of a weapon you've created. That is what Blag Anna wanted. Something that would spread easily. In truth, he's not the reason. But we will discuss that another time. The Walbachia have multiplied. We're preparing to extract them and begin vaccinating. But is this really the only way? Sure, it'll prevent infection, but the cost... You would rather remove their vocal cords? No. Tactical communication's a linchpin of what we do. What if we were to ban the use of Kakongo? Insufficient. First, there's no guarantee that only the Kakongo strain is here. Second, there is the matter of how the parasites lay their eggs before they can copulate. They must be exposed to the pronunciation of a specific language for a period of time. Like a container filling with water. But the duration between when the container is full and when the copulation actually begins varies from case to case. In other words, even if the infected stops speaking as a countermeasure, it may already be too late. The only true solution is to prevent copulation through the Wolbachia, or by physically removing the affected tissue. Yeah. Do any antiparasitics work? It sounds as though you have already tried. Yeah. We tried everyone there is, and nothing. I have yet to find a medicine that can remove the parasites. At best, it temporarily covers their ears. Why is that? Because the parasites are... companions to us. To remove them inevitably harms the host. Companions? More than you think. And this is why the human immune system cannot eliminate them. We've inoculated the staff with Walbachia to keep them from becoming symptomatic. Oh, hmm. That should also contain the infection. How did this happen in the first place? It has to have been a cipher spy within our ranks. If this is so, then why the Kakango strain? If their intent was to wipe you out... Skullface said the remaining English parasite was close to the boss. If this latest strain was his doing, he wouldn't have tipped his hand. It is possible someone brought eggs onto the base without knowing. Stuck to their shoes, clothing. Well, that makes the most sense to me. And where did the eggs come from? You mentioned that your boss visited Nzoya Badiopulu. Sure, but his gears disinfected immediately upon return. Hmm. Then he was not the carrier. And not just the boss. All staff dispatched to high-risk regions were quarantined on the flight back. When the symptoms first appeared, we checked and disinfected all equipment used up to that point. Any and all prisoners, soldiers, materials, and animals extracted during missions were also quarantined. So, that just leaves. I have seen children around here. Where are they from? All over. Some were being held hostage at a mine. Then there were the troublemakers at Bwala Yamasa. Bwala Yamasa? Yeah. Their clothes, their things. Did you burn them? They're just kids. We couldn't. And besides, not one of them's shown symptoms. The parasites don't infect prepubescent hosts. Their vocal cords are not fully developed. Well, if infection doesn't occur in children... It is possible they carried eggs on their clothes. And the infection spread from them. Check the kid's stuff. I doubt there is any trace left by now. But if there is, some of those kids must be close to hitting puberty. How could we have missed this? The name Bwala Yamasa got quite a reaction from you. 
I'm guessing the Kakongo strain was released in that village. Cypher used that region to experiment with vocal cord parasite transmission. The Kakongo strain. The settlements around the refinery upstream of Bwala Yamasa were the proving grounds. They would infect one villager, then record transmission speed. Dangerous work. If they failed to contain the infection, it would slip into the surrounding regions. At which point the world found out about the parasites, making them useless as a weapon. Incredible they'd risk such a thing. The test site was densely populated too. A terrible place for such experiments. No doubt. They thought burning everything would wipe away all traces. The settlements were covered in oil anyway. Who would wonder if one day they caught fire? And so it did. They burned it all, living and dead. Those remains. But they miscalculated. Transmission speed was far faster than anticipated. It may have been the temperature, or hygiene standards, or perhaps the parasites reacted quickly to Kikongo. Whatever the reason, nearly all villages were swiftly infected, and the settlements reduced to mounds of corpses. Making matters worse, the dry season was ending. When it came time to burn the village, the Moneni River had swelled. Many of the bodies were waterlogged. Meaning they didn't burn completely. The corpses still contained viable eggs, and the larvae washed downstream. And when the people downstream drank that water... That marked the end for Bwala Yamasa. I learned all of this at the mansion. I warned him of the risk of eggs getting out. And? We are prepared for any eventuality. I get it. Mm. Putting the oil field back online. The oil leaks, saner. They planned to pollute the river, prevent the spread of infection. But the oil flow was stopped. At downstream, the people of Masa Village started using the water again. The PF soldiers deployed at the village were locals, spoke Kikongo. They were infected, and the kids survived. I've heard enough. And who stopped the flow of oil? Don't. We did. <sighs> that confirms it. The source of the Kikongo strain infection was Masa Village. And the children brought it here. It is no one's fault. There is no blame to be cast. The parasites. They were tested in other regions? Their physiology requires that they be tested under varied conditions. Another test site was in Afghanistan. So it was the parasites there. Both the Pashto and Tajik languages are spoken in the mountains of Afghanistan. And population density is low. Ideal testing grounds for how accurately the parasites target only the specified language. It is also relatively easy to prevent the spread of infection. And the results? The first test, I am told, was a success. Once the Pashtun Mujahideen were infected with the Pashto strain, they were all but wiped out. The Hamid fighters is Marseille Fort. It was doubly successful. No Tajik Mujahideen or Soviet soldiers became symptomatic. So the parasites proved to be effective. What about the second test? Also supposedly a success. A Pashtun village was the target. However, the original aim was to obtain samples of the infected. In this, they failed. And the village? The Soviets enacted a standard scorched earth operation. That must have been the village where Malak lived before being held captive at Lamarhate Palace. Having had more time to think on it, the details shared with me may have been false. They are madmen 
who would do anything to cover up the truth. They certainly seem to like tossing their problems in the fire. As a boy, Skullface's life went up in flames. Perhaps that is what fuels his fixation with fire. Your yeah, Wolbachia well, stopped the infection all right, but I still don't get it. How can a few bacteria change males to females? I know they're only bugs, but... It is not such a rare thing in the natural world. Many insects and nematodes are infected with Wolbachia. But why? They nest in the cell cytoplasm of the host. Even in the egg cells. With the result that the offspring are born infected. Mother to child transmission. However, Wolbachia cannot nest in sperm because they do not have cytoplasm. So even a successful infection of a male ends after a single generation. This means the Volbachia must resort to maximizing the population of infected females. Sounds like an ethnic cleansing campaign on a tiny scale. Gender change from male to female is their survival tactic. So more females means more Volbachia carriers so it can keep thriving in the following generations. But the parasites in a human host are supposed to be a mating pair. If there's no male, there'll be no offspring at all. It's killing itself. Slow down. This tactic is intended for environments where a single male can copulate with multiple females. Originally, the Wolbachia did not infect the vocal cord parasites. I created a mutated strain, modifying the Wolbachia so that it could infect monogamous pairs. The Wolbachia's greatest multiplying tactic, the male-to-female change, worked against itself in the monogamous parasites. Just as you said, then I performed repeated selection of Wolbachia strains until I achieved a 100% certainty of male-to-female conversion. Creating female-female pairs, unable to reproduce. And you say the Wolbachia affects the host of the host, that is, us, cutting off our means to reproduce? It is almost certain. Of course, we will not turn female. After all, mammals possess no natural gender-changing function. But some Wolbachia strains can cause cytoplasmic incompatibility in the host. Is that some cell deformity? Put simply, it means the altered sperm of infected males kill the female's egg on contact. And that's happened to us? Yes. And yet, what occurs in humans is not just simple CI. To date, there are no cases of Volbachia affecting humans. Hmm. The fact that this strain causes this effect. Is it the vocal cord parasite's affinity with humans? Hmm. I do not know enough to say for sure. So the parasite warps the host. Reminds me of what Skullface said. It is the way of all organisms to create their own optimal environment. Just look at you and this base. Organisms that cannot do this are doomed to extinction. The difference with parasites is that their environment is another organism. That creates a connection between life and life. Parasitism, symbiosis, or death. In this way, the hose, too, is challenged to adapt. So what were they doing at Enzoya Badia, Balu? That facility with all the people laid out in rows? The abandoned factory Shivani was held in. It is precisely as you guessed. Black Anna was coding languages into the vocal cord parasites. They infected the subjects with the parasites then made an incision in the throat.
to expose the vocal cords. That allowed them to play recordings of a desired language directly to the parasites. And the parasites learn the languages that way. That's some teaching method. I just don't get how a bunch of bugs had the brain power for it. They don't. Do not judge them by human standards. They do not learn as a function of intellect. Then how do they do it? What language the parasites react to is coded into their genes. You could expose the Japanese strain to English for years, and it would never learn the language and react to it. The pronunciation, rhythm, and structure are different. But what about, say, Spanish and Portuguese? Linguistically, the two are very close. Yeah, they're both Ibero-Romance languages. Even so, a Spanish-language mating pair exposed to Portuguese will not copulate. Only when they hear Spanish. Only then. And the majority of their offspring will be the same. So it's a literal case of a mother tongue. But if that's so, I don't see how the different strains can be created in the first place. Well... Among the many thousands of offspring, there may be just a few that react to Portuguese. You're talking about mutations. Correct. Playing the tapes helps to identify the mutant strains. Those specimens are then isolated and bred with one another. From their children, specimens that react more strongly to Portuguese can again be selected and bred. Repeating this process creates a strain that reacts solely to Portuguese and never to Spanish. Mutation and selection. No different to breeding roses. So you kept increasing the change over the generations, adapting them to languages from all over the world. It must have taken a hell of a lot of patience. More like patience. Just how many died for this? There's something I still don't get. In order to tell which larvae will react to Portuguese, you'd have to let them develop and then see which copulate. That means you'd need tens of thousands of guinea pigs. There's no way you could do that in a facility that small. For normal selective breeding methods, you would be right. But there is a more effective selection method when training the vocal cord parasites. <sighs> Go on. It is not only when mating that the parasites listen for language. Shortly before hatching, larvae display markedly increased activity in reaction to a particular language. The active eggs can be identified under a black light. So the eggs that react to Portuguese are selectively placed in the throats of subjects. So you see, Narrowing down strains that react to the target language is an effective process. Though I'm sure that even so, many lost their lives to create the various strains. Taken against their will into that... that dungeon. There are two reasons for playing the tapes for the parasites. One, to isolate the eggs that respond to the target language. And two, to cause the specimens raised from the selected eggs to mate. I get how the system works. But why do they respond to language before they even hatch? It's not like they can mate from inside an egg. It is because the larvae learn the language before hatching. You mentioned that what language the parasites respond to is hard-coded into their genes, and that they don't have the brain power to actually learn a language. But then you say that the larvae at Nzoya Badiabulu were learning the languages in the egg. Your story doesn't add up. Your country is home to a unique songbird. The Japanese bush warbler. Sure, what of it? What a beautiful call it has. But no bush warbler can sing it perfectly at the start. As chicks, they can barely chirp at all. They must learn from their parents and other adult birds. Only then can they sing properly and attract females. So naturally, 
There are individual differences in each bird's call. Though they start on the same footing, each bird is influenced by its teachers. And the parasites are the same? Like the birds, the parasites have a genetic predisposition towards a particular language. But while in the egg, the larvae's ears are tweaked by listening to the voice of the host. This tweaking ensures that the grown parasites will react better to the host's speech pattern. Why would they have an ability like that? Well, there are distinct regional differences within even the same language. Rare is the language that has no unique dialects. Yes, learning the host's speech pattern before hatching attunes the larvae to whatever twist of pronunciation it will encounter. This adaptive ability is what makes them so formidable. I see. So a language requires selective breeding, but the parasites can learn dialects by themselves. Of course, having the egg stage larvae listen to the tapes in the factory was not meant to teach them. It was more important to use that trait of theirs to identify the mutated strains. As I mentioned Close earlier, approaching. is that really accurate enough to use as a weapon? You could wipe out a neighboring ethnic group by accident if their pronunciation is too close. What you say is true. In that sense, they are imperfect as ethnic cleansers. But for his purposes, they are good enough. His objective was not to exterminate any one ethnic group, but to render the world's lingua franca, English, inert. About this OKB-0 Emmerich was talking about. Its location and features match the citadel in the mountains northeast of the Soviet Caution. base camp. Built during the time of Alexander the Great, it was left in ruins following one of Genghis Khan's campaigns. Its occupants changed time and again due to war, and it was expanded on more than one occasion. Ultimately, it fell into the hands of the Soviet philosophers. The Soviet army was using it as the headquarters of its Afghan invasion force. But it would seem that Skullface's connections with the philosophers gave him license to develop Sahelanthropus there. And that's what Emmerich was doing at the place, before he got the axe. But OKB is a designation the Soviets use for weapon design bureaus. There's no way they'd have one of those in Afghanistan. And, in principle, the numbers that follow OKB are always integers above one. There is no zero. Perhaps this was a secret facility of the Soviet and Chinese philosophers dating back prior to World War II. Though it's more likely Skullface just picked a fake name that more or less fit the Soviet's pattern. It doesn't go there often, but he sure as hell won't miss this. They use the heliport on top of the tower for his visits. Start by heading for the heliport. Then wait for your chance to make contact with Skullface. It seems Sahelanthropus's armor is made from depleted uranium. That offers some serious protection. The U.S. military is planning on using it for its main battle tanks, too. Maybe that's where Emmerich got the technology. Uranium? They're using nuclear fuel for armor now? No. What they use for nuclear fuel is uranium-235, which is extracted from natural uranium. Depleted uranium is a byproduct of that process. Sort of like the leftovers, I guess. The garbage. Uranium-235 makes up 0.72% of natural uranium, whereas depleted uranium contains only 0.2%. What are the benefits of using it for armor? It's a pretty short list. Uranium's a heavy metal, like lead, meaning it can hold a greater amount of kinetic energy. But it also boasts a hardness closer to tungsten. That makes it an ideal material to use for, say, armor-piercing ammunition penetrators. But it's not the best choice for armor. Its volume is less than that of ceramics, but for an equal weight, you could end up with less protection. So why use it then? According to Emrick, it came down to him being unable to source ceramics technology from a manufacturer. Plus, given that it's an upright walking vehicle, he wanted to reduce the bulk of certain areas. Despite all that, Depleted uranium still makes for some tough armor, and Emmerich says it's been proven in live fire tests. It stops most Soviet tank shells.
Emmerich didn't go with depleted uranium for Sahelanthropus' armor because of its strength. He had nukes in mind. Exactly. It's meant to use its body as the fuel component for a nuclear weapon. Sahelanthropus uses built-in uranium enrichment Archaea to melt its own body and extract uranium-235 from the depleted uranium in its armor. Those Archaea perform the enrichment in an extremely short time. The concentration jumps by a factor of several hundred, from 0.2% to over 90%. The end result being highly enriched weapons-grade uranium. Sahelanthropus's body itself becomes a nuclear bomb. Emmerich says if it were to self-destruct, the nuclear yield would be somewhere in the region of 15 kilotons. Since you need about 50 kilograms of highly enriched uranium to trigger a nuclear reaction, that would mean Sahelanthropus contains something like 23 tons of depleted uranium. That's not very much. No, it isn't. That's about what you'd expect to find in a main battle tank's armor. The point is, it can be transported anywhere, even use its conventional weaponry on the battlefield, and the international community will never suspect a thing. I just received word from the R&D team and the transport team out of Afghanistan. They finished installing Sahelanthropus on the base. It's ours now. All right. Don't let any of the staff touch that thing. Especially Emmerich. Of course. That guy's crush on Sahelanthropus is beyond a joke. Guess he really wants to see his tech stand on its own two legs this time. That's not gonna happen. I know it. So you've got no plans to make it operational again? Damn right. Boss, I want to hear it straight from you. Hear what? What the hell do you want with that thing? The drive is busted. It's not like it has a nuke on board. Even if the metallic archaea could turn it into a nuclear weapon, all it can do is self-destruct. Sahelanthropus just isn't a weapon anymore. It'll draw unwanted attention without even being a deterrent. I know. The weapon's development strut sank two feet under that thing's wake. That's one year's drop in a single night. We've started on reinforcing the strut, but there's no guarantee it'll hold up if a storm hits. I know that, too. Boss, why keep it? It's a mark. Us diamond dogs, we don't have a country to call home. That means we have no past, nothing to prove that we lived. Every one of us threw it all away when we came here. Sahelanthropus is a symbol to show that the likes of us brought at least one crisis to its end. A mark in history. So we can't just fade away. It's of no practical use to us. But we still need it. A symbol of what we've done. I'm glad I sounded you out on this. Snake, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you. I don't need gratitude. I need security. Keep Emmerich away from that thing. Roger that. Go, Docker. What are the metallic archaea? Volcanic craters spewing sulfur. Water hot enough to boil your skin off. Ocean depths of 800 plus atmospheres. Wastelands radioactive enough to kill you where you stand. <sighs> there are groups of organisms that survive despite. No. Because of living in such environments. I've heard about them. Extremo something. Extremophiles. By selecting certain species then subculturing and repeatedly modifying them. Oh, I created a metallic offspring of pure archaea. They subsist on metals rather than organic matter. And some of them even consume uranium? Yes. Uranium enrichment archaea metabolize only uranium-235. As a result, they produce weapons-grade enriched uranium. How is that possible? Consider how plants fractionate carbon isotopes when they conduct photosynthesis. Nature possesses abilities beyond our imagination. So it was Archaea that brought down your chopper? Corrosive Archaea, yes. They oxidize metals, feeding off the energy in the electrons they receive. What became of the wreckage? We had the R&D team retrieve samples for study in uh, airtight plastic containers, of course. Prudent. We shall extract our chaos from it in good time. They should help you fight back against Blagaana. 
Any chance we could start now? It doesn't have to be a lot. I might just have another use for them. If it's only a small amount you need. That's fine. I'll get the R&D team to assist. Let's go. South Africa was previously suspected of developing nuclear weapons. It already had a conspicuous presence at the UN because of apartheid and its armed expansionism. But when neighboring Angola and Mozambique became socialist countries in 74, South Africa felt hounded into a corner. So it accelerated its nuclear program to protect itself. Three years later, the Soviets discovered a test facility. And two years after that, an American satellite observed a flash in the southern Indian Ocean. It said this was South Africa conducting a nuclear test with the help of a certain ally. Skullface used the situation in South Africa to get this ally to lend a hand. They both wanted nukes, so it was a mutually beneficial relationship. On the surface, anyway. I figure South Africa started getting serious about nuclear weapons production in 75. In 74, the government was still able to get by with bluffing that it had a nuclear arsenal. But the year after? Word spread that an independent armed group in the Caribbean was crushed by Cypher for possessing a WMD. That's right, boss. What happened to you and your men was the reason South Africa decided to push ahead with nuclear development. A force independent of any country getting its hands on a nuke. That was a threat to the existence of countries everywhere. It wasn't just South Africa. Your presence pushed a lot of countries to get nukes. The world was scared of you. You were a threat to more than just the Cold War. If nations are gears in a machine, you had the power to smash them loose and watch the whole world grind to a halt. Emmerich uses externally powered legs of his own design. It's bionics technology, a product of the US military's failed attempt to develop a powered exoskeleton. All the wearer has to do is apply a little force, and the actuators continue the movement in that direction. But his legs are unique. Instead of using a hydraulic mechanism, the actuators run off metallic archaea. That increases the actuator's reaction speed and also enables him to lock and release the joints at will. The legs are a nifty little gadget, but they have two clear weaknesses. First, they're dependent on external power, Maybe because he built them knowing he couldn't leave his lab. There's no internal battery. That's why they won't work if they aren't plugged in. Second, and this is more than just a weakness, the legs are directly connected to his bones. Could be to minimize signal loss and the order's output to the legs and the drive response from them. Either way, Emmerich has used bolts to attach load-bearing parts directly to his femurs probably by mimicking surgical treatment for compound fractures and the like. But the end result is those legs and his body are fused together. And that appears to be how he's able to move them so precisely. But that also means that any shock to the legs would be delivered right to his bones by way of those bolts. The same is true if he encounters the corrosive metallic archaea. If the corrosive archaea ate into the exposed bolts, they'd reach the endoskeleton parts and eat through them too in the blink of an eye. The doctor's bones are full of holes to accommodate all the bolts. They're like sponges. If he were to lose the reinforcing parts, even the tiniest bit of force or weight would snap his bones. So when I dangled those corrosive metallic archaea in front of him, he realized straight away what would happen. Life wouldn't be worth living if he lost those legs of his. I'd bet that is what the doctor fears the most. I just helped him imagine what it would be like. Thanks to that, I got the information we needed without either of us getting hurt. You know how he is. He's probably already over the shock. The better you know your adversary, the easier it is for you to get information from them. And vice versa. You said that the nuke Skullface was trying to spread around the world were equipped with a failsafe. Something that could shut them down at will. His will. Quite so. After all, he needed a guarantee that a buyer wouldn't simply turn the weapons back on him. So how can they be stopped? The criticality trigger. That is, the detonator. 
is a complete black box design. Any attempt to dismantle it causes it to melt in seconds, using the corroding archaea. The design ensures that no detonation is possible unless he disengages the lock. So he had a way to disengage it remotely? Precisely. The client simply presses a button. At that moment, the detonator begins transmission with a surveillance satellite. The satellite reports to him how the client is trying to use the nuke. If he does not object, the lock is disengaged. But if it's a risk to him in any way... The detonator melts down. The same is true if detonation does not occur within a preset time after the lock is disengaged. The nuke is rendered useless. Who the hell would buy something with strings attached like that? The client would never know until the moment they actually try to use it. Most likely, he would have explained the time delay as the detonator's needing time to activate. And he only intended to sell to technologically primitive groups in the first place. Let me guess. He claimed it was defective and offer a replacement. Shadier than a used car salesman. Skullface shakes your hand like a friend. Using the other to control you like a puppet. This is how he works. This is yellow cake that Cypher was having the PF's transport. Before we met you, the boss recovered it from a truck crossing the savannah. Are there metallic archaea inside it? Yes, the archaea metabolize uranium-235 to subsist. They must be stored inside yellow cake, or they cannot survive. So those biological traces we took for impurities were actually the real cargo? Of course they are deactivated, so they do not trigger a sudden enrichment. They are like baker's yeast. Yet, they do gradually enrich the uranium as they feed. I imagine you detected weapons-grade traces. Yeah, we did. And the malachite that was loaded on the truck had traces of uranium in it, too. <laughs> so that's the flower, huh? Skullface was gonna sell do-it-yourself nuke kits. The uranium-enriching Archaea complete with the user's manual. And the ores with the uranium could be sourced by the client or provided by Cypher. Even the trace amounts buried in common ores can be enriched to weapons-grade uranium by the metallic Archaea. Proving that must have been the most important factor of the trials. That and the ability to successfully prevent detonation. So if the amounts of uranium in the ores are low enough, they can get past any inspection. And you only need a tiny amount of the Archaea to act as the yeast. No great challenge to smuggle that either. The first step towards saturating the world with nukes. His plan. That was not my intention. Hmm. My only goal in developing the metallic Archaea was to save the Diné. What made you think a tool for creating undetectable nuclear weapons would save your people? After 70 years, the Diné reclaimed the Navajo Nation from which we were banished. We bore all the hardships of poverty. But we were proud to live off the land we called our own. But in the moment the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, everything changed. I don't get it. The nuclear oh, arms race okay. between the US and the Soviet Union began with the end of the Second World War. Suddenly, there was a massive demand for uranium. And it was our ill fortune that the ground beneath the Navajo Nation was rich with uranium ore. The Black Anna government set up mine after mine, and many of the Diné worked them. Never informed of any danger. Every day, they went to work with no protection. The slag was...
was simply piled out in the open. When rain fell, uranium traces left behind would seep out, and when the ground dried, it was blown about as dust. Land and water were contaminated, irradiated. Many of us became sick and died. That pain lives on to this day. I had no idea. Wanting more than anything to revive the land my forebears left to me, I was delighted upon discovering microbes that eat uranium. If they could be domesticated, I believed we could rid our land of uranium. Were you successful? No. The research called for funding on a colossal scale. But nobody was willing to invest with no prospect of a return. And that's when Skullface showed up. Correct. I can save you and your people. We share the same will. That is what he said to me. And I believed him. Plagana forced me to abandon my uranium cleanup work and focus on we'll nuclear weapons. Shortly. And he held all the Diné hostage. Today, the uranium mines within the reservation are finally closing down. It is simply less expensive now to source uranium overseas. New victims, different places. But uranium is a tactical resource. To rely on a foreign country for it is... a difficult decision to make. And he was in the perfect place to influence that decision. He could have condemned your people to the mines forever. The contamination comes not only from uranium. The fallout from the Nevada nuclear tests also settled on our lands. As if our fortune were not already bad enough, we are also downwinders. To save the Diné, I must complete my original research. Code Talker, haven't seen you eat a single thing since you got here. Let me guess. Photosynthesis. Oh? What makes you say that? Well, a long time ago, I knew someone with a similar ability. Well, you are correct. Most of my body is covered with parasites. I supply them with water, and in return, I receive sugars they produce when exposed to light. Mm hmm It isn't just my skin, either. The parasites also act as my eyes. They have replaced many of my internal organs as well. It is thanks to them that I live on after over a century. How did you obtain them anyway? Through your research? I would like to say as much, but there is more to it than that. Let me take you back 20 years. I had hit a dead end with my parasite research. Then I was approached by a foundation. They said they had a sample of an unusual strain of parasite. Which foundation? Apparently they had links to ARPA. But that is all I learned. I was somewhat ignorant of the ways of the world. Just being able to study it was enough for me. Yeah, I've heard that before. Go on. Half in doubt, I visited them to discover the body of an old man. Well, to be precise, his partial remains. A collection of parts, you could say. The man had died in an explosion. An old man, you say? His flesh had not decomposed. In fact, the tissue's cells were still metabolizing. The parasite had infected or should I say assimilated with the tissues, and was keeping them alive. I became obsessed with studying the body parts, foregoing food and even sleep. Every day was filled with new discoveries. The parasite's biology, internal anatomy, life cycle, 
But there was only so much I could learn through observation. And so I made a decision. To truly know the parasites, I had to live with them. So you implanted them inside you from the dead man's flesh? Correct. It was quite a gamble, whether or not they would adapt to me. But fortunately, it appears I was compatible with them. Or perhaps, through my many years of research, my immune system learned to tolerate them. Were they that body's only parasite? Yes. However, there was a separate specimen that supplied its host with adrenaline in response to pain, and yet another that could control insects at will through secreting heterogeneous pheromones. I wanted exposure to them, to take them into me, but my wishes were denied. Their records, though, provided clues that helped advance my research. Would you care to join me? A life spent never worrying about food is a most wonderful one. I think I'll pass. But thanks. This has been helpful. The one that covers. The parasite that lives on the surface of the skull's bodies is what gives them their power. Similar to my children who live in my skin. I modified the parasites I isolated from the body of that old man, differentiating them with various abilities. One that can blend perfectly into its surroundings by exposing the pigments in its cells at will. Another that by harboring multiple species of metallic archaea can oxidize and reduce metal. Isolating the one that covers and transplanting it into an artificial medium should provide the same abilities as the skulls. But they can only subsist within a human body. Once transplanted into the medium, they will eventually die. Another thing, the weakness of the one that covers is desiccation. Their surface moisture loss is greater than ours. The reason they give off mist is to alleviate this by releasing the salts inside them as microparticles. Water vapor condenses around them, appearing as mist. But this dries out the atmosphere until they cannot even produce mist. And once their supply of water from the host runs out, the parasites are in danger. They, along with their host, enter a form of suspended animation. However, a similar effect occurs if they come into contact with a large amount of water. Rain, for instance. The one that covers will temporarily abandon other processes in his eagerness to absorb the water. Pitiholone. Make the weather your ally. There's something I've been wondering. Why are you called Code Talker? During World War II, the U.S. military used the languages of different tribes, including the Navajo, as codes, right? I know the term Code Talker was used to mean people sent to the battlefield to speak in those codes. Were you one of them? Our mother tongue was indeed used for war. But I did not go. I was already over the conscription age. However, I was made to help craft the codes that were spoken. So in a wider sense, you could call me a code talker for that. Navajo is a complex language, and virtually no one outside the U.S. speaks it. They must have thought it was the perfect language to use as a code. Yeah, in the end, the Japanese never cracked it. The cipher is king in information warfare. Of course, they didn't simply speak in Navajo. They created substitutions for words according to a code book, and then translated those into our language. Young Diné was sent to the front lines of the Pacific Theater as code talkers. To fight is an honor for the Diné. They were the pride of our people. 
But I cannot say this history brings me joy. Words are alive. When they are spoken, life is breathed into them. They become a part of the listener. Our words were transformed into lifeless ciphers and used for war. This, after the Black Anna spent generations suppressing the language. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I guess we shouldn't be calling you Code Talker, huh? No, I do not mind. The reason Skullface called me Code Talker was because I also am responsible for coding language into the vocal cord parasites. I am the same as those young warriors, used for a cipher's sake. I must never forget that. The name, Code Talker, is a lesson carved into my being. You said Skullface ordered you to weaponize the vocal cord parasites. But you also said he wasn't the reason. And he wasn't. I was seduced by the parasites. That is a fact. <laughs> How? You mean from your curiosity as a scientist? That I cannot deny. But there is more to it. The story goes back to the 19th century. To my earliest memory. One day, a man from the government visited our Hogan, our home. I cried as he yanked me from my mother's arms and took me away to an Indian boarding school. From that day forward, I became George. This was the name my teacher gave me. I was forced to give up my Diné name, forbidden from speaking anything but English. If we dared utter a word of filthy Navajo, the teacher made us eat a bar of soap. Yeah, that was the U.S. government's education policy for Native Americans. To erase our words was like erasing our people. Their education was tantamount to ethnic cleansing. Over time, the overt persecution of our language stopped. But to this day, it continues to be eaten away by the lingua franca, that is English. Many of the Diné outside the reservations can speak nothing else. And it isn't just our language. Across the world, minority languages are being destroyed by dominant languages. Many are on the verge of extinction. Hmm. Enter the vocal cord parasites. Yes. I began thinking that minority languages needed some sort of deterrent against dominant languages. In order that they, that their peoples and cultures would survive. It was then that I came across literature at the foundation claiming that man acquired language thanks to a type of parasite. One that distinguishes between languages as a precursor to reproduction. If I could just resurrect it, make it more pathogenic, I would have my deterrent against English. But I failed to hide that aim from Skullface. He noticed. Yes, I wanted to retaliate against the English language. Though never did I intend to actually use it as he planned. You know how the story ends. I was forced to study how to make the parasites compatible with all the world's languages. All but English. However, he in fact secretly isolated an English strain. I will not be held prisoner by the man's phantom. The English strain must not be allowed to exist either. I have no doubt Skullface's plan is almost complete. At that point, I will no longer be of use to him. I must leave behind this record at least. A record of how the ancient vocal cord parasites became these abominable ethnic cleansing parasites. I believe he has two purposes for the ethnic cleansing parasites. The first, as their name suggests, is ethnic cleansing. This conflict between East and West that envelops the world will not last much longer. Once the Cold War ends and the weight of America and the Soviet Union is lifted away, the ethnic conflicts 
they kept suppressed will all rise to the surface. It is not difficult to imagine that the radical sides will begin cleansing their adversaries. But what if an ethnic cleansing parasite matching the language of the aggressors were to be unleashed? The aggressors would be washed off the earth. At the very least, the idea that retaliation could eradicate your people would prove a powerful deterrent. The second purpose is the Englishization of the world. To cipher the organization, this is probably their main use. Man thinks in words, or rather, words are man's very means of thinking. If you erase a word representing some concept, the concept itself disappears from the world. Nishone means beautiful in Navajo. But the image that comes to mind when we say Nishone differs from the Black Anas beautiful. An azure sky, a rolling landscape, lush greenery. The meaning we place in Nishone has its roots in Diné culture. If we lose the word Nishone, the images of our beautiful homeland would be washed away into oblivion along with it. Just as Orwell indicated years ago, Cypher, being based in America, is pushing Englishization for this very reason. Suppose all five billion people on this planet come to read, speak, and think in English. Their wills could also be streamlined under English. Cypher's control would be all the easier. Economic governance would progress in leaps and bounds. The ethnic cleansing parasites would be a great aid in accomplishing this goal. There is no need to destroy every language besides English. All they need to do is weaken other dominant languages competing with it. Russian, Chinese, Arabic. If people know they risk their lives speaking such languages, they will flock to the lingua franca that is English. Cypher need not even focus attention on smaller languages. After all, they are already being eaten away by English. Business, education, film, commodities, English has permeated every area of global society. I can see this when I look at young Dene. Some of them have already lost their grasp of the Navajo language. It is said that over 2,000 languages of the world are facing extinction. This very moment, cultural concepts and forms of expression are disappearing forever. The spread of electronic networks gives greater meaning to Englishization. Networks have no national borders, but basing them on a single language, they can penetrate deeper into and between people. That basic point of unity provides the ideal environment for someone who aims to control people's wills. But how does this differ from building the Tower of Babel? The ethnic cleansing parasites attempt to rob man of his words. Such irony. It was the vocal cord parasites that gave words to him in the first place. Ancient man had no language. Unable to produce complex sounds due to the structure of the throat, he could communicate only through simple vocalizations and gestures. Then, the vocal cord parasites infected his larynx. Man's transition to walking upright did not gift him solely with intelligence, but also with his voice. At the time, the vocal cord parasites never harmed man. They merely took a small measure of nourishment. In fact, you could call it a symbiotic relationship. Some animal species use particular vocalization patterns to attract a female and reproduce. 
songbirds, certain insects, and also the vocal cord parasites. The difference is that the parasites themselves did not produce sounds. Rather, they had their hosts, man, do it for them. Once secure on the human host vocal cords, a male vocal cord parasite caused the host to produce a certain sound pattern. Something like a warble of a bird. Meanwhile, females parasitizing other host pharynxes need only wait upon hearing the sound pattern of an attractive mate. They would manipulate their hosts into making contact with the person it came from. The female traveled through his host's saliva to the other host's vocal cords where the male was waiting and the pair copulated. We can only imagine how the female manipulated his host, but it was probably through smell. Smells traveled directly to the limbic system via the olfactory cilia in the nasal cavity. Volatile compounds released by the female would stimulate the limbic system, which controls instincts, making the host feel amorous. This kind of sexual selection naturally led to competition between the male parasites. Males that had their hosts produce sounds perceived by females as more attractive succeeded in copulating and producing offspring. Evolutionary traits caused by sexual selection are curious. The peacock's feathers, the mannequin's dance, the firefly's luminescence pattern. Even with courtship behaviors that are not advantageous to survival, those individuals that excel in them produce offspring, and it escalates with each generation. The same was true of the vocal cord parasites. Courtship vocalization rhythms and intonations became more sophisticated, and in order for man to produce such sounds, they had to alter his vocal organs. By lowering the position of the larynx and developing resonating chambers, they enabled more complex pronunciations. But that was not all. The vocal cord parasites activated a transcription factor that would later control man's language ability. A protein that due to its appearance is called 4 kid box protein P2, or Fox P2. Activating this transcription factor led to the development of brain function capable of creating sophisticated frequency changes. This was the pinnacle of the vocal cord parasite's prosperity. However, this sophisticated pronunciation control was too useful for man to ignore. Once human sexual activity ceased to be only seasonal, and having lost pigment-based sexual characteristics, Distinctive vocalizations became the most effective means for humans to attract mates as well. Combined with logic pathways hardwired into the brain, or universal grammar, it was not long before advanced communication was possible. This was the birth of language. Luckily for man, it was around this time that a particular retrovirus was circulating. While not lethal, it infected not only man, but the vocal cord parasites as well. It is presumed that this virus removed part of the parasite's DNA and reverse transcribed it into man's reproductive cells. It was a factor. Among the genes it transcribed were the ones responsible for the production of language. The vocal cord parasites' vocalization genes were written into the human genome. The parasites were no longer of any use to man now. Man could use his voice as he pleased, when he pleased, hindering the parasites' courtship vocalizations. Having lost their opportunity to reproduce, the parasites died out, leaving behind only the transcribed genes. The vocal cord parasites were once in symbiosis with man. Its genes even became a part of his. 
Humans and parasites are extremely close. As such, it will be extremely difficult for man's immune system to eliminate the vocal cord parasites. Even cutting them out will be no simple matter. Which is exactly why these ethnic cleansing parasites are such a formidable weapon. The rise of the vocal cord parasites goes back approximately 300 million years to the Permian period. At that time, they were not even parasites, but predatory autotrophs. They are believed to have been the common ancestor to the Pentastomida and the Cyclops genus of copepods. However, Earth's environment underwent a violent change at the end of the Permian period. The cause is unclear, but evidence suggests that over 90% of the Earth's organisms at that time died out. The most pronounced threat to the protoparasites was the severe reduction in oxygen concentration. The result was cladogenesis a splitting that gave birth to a new strain that could parasitize other organisms' respiratory apparatus. This survival tactic helped lower their oxygen consumption, and inhabiting the throat kept them securely in contact with inhaled air. The best survivors were those that parasitized the reptiles that flourished at the time. Entering the Triassic period, the reptiles evolved into dinosaurs, and the protoparasites shared in their success. Dinosaurs developed respiratory organs called air sacs to adapt to the low oxygen environment. These in particular helped the protoparasites thrive. But another trial awaited them. The end of the Triassic period saw another drastic change in the Earth's environment. For most parasites, the male and female take the same host. Many are, in fact, hermaphrodites. Originally, the vocal cord parasites were as well. But for any strain to ride out a severe environmental change, it must secure a steady pool of genetic diversity. Another split. Now the newest strain procreated with mates found in other hosts and in order to increase its encounters with those mates, the new strain utilized the voice of its host. They came to inhabit the host's vocal cords. This truly was the birth of the vocal cord parasite. The parasites developed the host's pharynx to form resonating chambers and used them to produce sophisticated mating calls. The relatively upright posture of the dinosaurs was important in this, because the crooked L-shaped pharynx was more suited to the development of resonating chambers. These developments ushered in a time of great prosperity for the parasites. But for the third time, the parasites had a major hurdle to overcome. The meteorite impact at the end of the Cretaceous period which spelled the end of the dinosaurs. With their hosts extinct, the vocal cord parasites had no option but to find a new habitat. Birds. As genetic successors to the dinosaurs with functioning air sac apparatus already in place, birds were the perfect choice. But the parasites could not survive in birds that flew at high altitudes with thinner air, so they parasitized ground-dwelling birds and altered their respiratory system for the sake of reproduction. They gave the birds the means to produce sophisticated sounds, the syrinx responsible for chirping. This is the proof that points to activation of Fox P2 in songbirds as well as humans. The Cenozoic era began with a rise in oxygen concentration, which helped mammals to evolve and increase in size. The parasites then shifted to humans as a more effective host. Humans' bipedal upright walking meant that our throats could support larger resonating chambers. At first, 
vocal cord parasites entered humans using birds as their intermediate host. But eventually they changed to conducting their entire life cycle within human hosts. What happened next is as I have already described. People took the vocalizing prowess given them by the parasites and made it language. And once the parasites could no longer use it as their mating call, they died out. Or in other words, the parasites overcame all evolutionary hurdles except humanity. Skullface shared his opinion on this matter. He said the Ethnic Cleansers project was sure to succeed. After all, the parasites had a grudge against us humans. To think we awoke them after such a long slumber, just so they could sate their thirst for vengeance. It is terrible. Unforgivable. And yet, it is what I have done. I learned of the vocal cord parasite's existence in literature belonging to the Foundation. It was little more than a theory. The question was, why does only Homo sapiens among all primates have highly developed language? Human versus everything else. The missing link between these was the mystery that gave rise to this theory. I was fascinated by the idea of their existence. In the Dine creation myth, the Neyo Dine, who first inhabited the world, were insect-like creatures. I came to imagine that those insect-like creatures could be humans living in symbiosis with the vocal cord parasites. But I had not the faintest idea of how I could resurrect them. That is when Skullface came to me. What he offered me was not just assistance with my metallic archaea research. He told me the vocal cord parasites really existed. And not only did they exist, they had already been brought back to life in the modern age. An ancient human cadaver, host to the parasites of the time. Cypher excavated such a cadaver from a permafrost region and isolated the DNA coding of the vocal cord parasites. Naturally, they were long dead and could not be brought back, but there was an alternate vessel they could use. A relative species of the Pentastomida discovered in China. It had adapted to live in the nasal cavity of animal hosts. But its genetic sequence showed signs of common ancestry with the vocal cord parasites. Ontogenesis, the path of an organism to maturity, is like a roadmap of the phylogenetic evolution of the entire strain. Cypher used this to effect a reverse evolution of the modern parasite and resurrect the vocal cord parasites. They interpose a developmental mechanism to the ontogenetic stage analogous to when the relative species first appeared, the point at which it split from the vocal cord parasites, forcing its evolution down the other path, the vocal cord parasite path. The larvae is produced by the vocal cord parasites Reborn. I do not know in detail how Cypher accomplished this, but clearly they have access to high level genetic technologies. Skullface said it was the work of a genius woman scientist, and that the relative species in question was first discovered by a group once called the Philosophers. I was tasked with modifying the resurrected parasites. He charged me with two demands. First, to add lethality to these organisms that had once lived in peace with man. By unleashing the larvae's latent desire to consume nutrients from the host's lung tissue, making them eat and eat until the lungs were destroyed. Second, 
to have both male and female inhabit the same host and copulate then and there only when exposed to specific pronunciations continuously over an extended time. What he would do to the Diné if I failed. I had no choice. Originally, the ultimate objective of the ethnic cleansing parasite project was the identification of not only languages, but of actual cultures. Language is deeply connected to ethnicity, but many languages are employed by multiple ethnic groups and confrontation between those ethnic groups is by no means rare. If the cleanser parasites were to be a deterrent against ethnic conflict, they had to distinguish between groups using means other than pure language. The original plan called for this to be achieved by differences in the transmission vector. Each ethnic group has different lifestyle customs and eating habits for instance, parasites living in shallow water and taken in through the skin could be used to target rice farming groups, or parasites using cows as their intermediate host would be ineffective against cultures that abstain from eating beef. But that is a lofty goal indeed. The current parasites mainly rely on droplet transmission. It would take extensive time to alter the transmission route. I eventually learned that the Ethnic Cleansers project had been shut down. It was Skullface who put it back into operation. But despite that, he told me to forget about the transmission route and just focus on language identification. I do not know why. I understand that the Chinese philosophers who discovered the relative species of parasite originally planned to develop a phonogrammic Alexia parasite. The left temporal parietal region is home to the part of the brain that identifies the phonetic symbols of the English language. They wished to create a strain that would parasitize that region and suppress its literacy functions. The brain area responsible for identifying the logographs of Chinese, meanwhile, is in the left middle frontal gyrus. Meaning that even if native speakers of Chinese were infected with the parasite, their literacy would be unaffected. Old and new, east and west, there is no limit to the delusions of those in power. But this delusion threatens to become a reality. I have to do something to stop this. There must be something I can do. Mm. It appears I was looking at things wrong. What do you mean? All of you. Until now, I had thought of your organization, Diamond Dogs, as a superorganism. Uh, you'll have to explain that one. The term refers to a unit of eusocial insects like ants or bees. While made up of many individuals, they behave as though they are one organism, with the queen as their nerve center. The closed ties you share here reminded me of that. Well, the boss's efforts do pull us all together. I was not finished. I'm speaking in terms of homogeneity. You come from all walks of life, do you not? Many races and tongues, talents and pasts, complementing each other, influencing each other, making Diamond Dogs the unique group that it is. Of course. We have no use for mindless drones around here. Is that so? Then perhaps an organization like yours is a truer superorganism than the ants and bees. Meaning? Most organisms adapt to their environment by coexisting with other species. Take the cow, for instance. Its rumen, the first stomach, contains an incredible number of bacteria, 
which digest the food it has consumed. Without their help, the cow could not break down the fiber in grasses. The cow has to outsource its means of survival to them. You don't say. Man is the same. Some 100 trillion bacteria live inside the human intestines. Without the bacteria, they could not function properly. And it does not stop there. The stomach, the mouth, the skin. Even the placenta contains bacteria that coexist with us. The same is true of parasites. In fact, the human immune system has evolved based on parasites being a part of it. Without them, the immune system can run amok and even damage other parts of the body. This is all very interesting, but what does it have to do with diamond dogs? A harmonious superorganism is made up not of a group of homogeneous individuals, but of diverse individuals that complement each other. That is what I saw in your group here. Then it occurred to me that man is a superorganism. Man's phenotype is not determined solely by his genetics. Some say if you mapped the genomes of all bacteria in the human body, the result would be over 100 times bigger than the human genome. The sum of man's genome and those of the organisms he coexists with, call it a metagenome, creates the superorganism we know as a human being. Well, now that's quite a leap. You think so? Then try a broader perspective. If our world were a human body, you would be parasites. You make a living by doing the dirty work that the world powers cannot handle themselves. From their perspective, you are likely a nuisance. But without you, pus would build up around the world, and autotoxemia, self-poisoning, would follow. The world needs your kind. Thank goodness for that. Skullface forced me to turn parasites into weapons. Creatures with which we are supposed to coexist. Meanwhile, that foundation I worked with focused solely on the human genome. Apparently thinking that manipulating it would get them whatever new form they want. Both ways are mistakes. Neither is a true superorganism. I am Dene. By speaking with those living inside me, we enhance one another and enjoy harmonious growth. Such was the original purpose of my research. You have made me remember this. <laughs> well, it's an honor. You can travel the world, but you won't find another place like this. If the whole world was like this base, I think the peoples of the world would bid farewell to fighting for good. Maybe that's what the boss wanted in the end. Skullface has finally burned out. The world is rid of his existence at last. Was he still alive? You could say that. But you could also say he'd been dead for decades. What's that supposed to mean? Biologically speaking, it's hard to say how much was his life. Side effects from the treatment? No. The primary effect. Keeping a dying host alive as long as possible. That is the whole point. But in the end, he grew too dependent on his children. Hmm. As if he had any other way to keep on living. He first underwent parasite therapy before the Soviet Union became his home. His body was horribly burned. Fire washed across his thin young frame and stole his skin and his throat, even his lungs. Only through repeated therapies could the parasites keep him alive. Most of his life became something the parasites gave to him. And then he lost the ability to die. That is correct. 
the parasites live on past the host's death, still aiding cell composition. At that stage, there is no way to extract them from the host cells. There is no way of knowing when the last cell of Skullface's body would die. The only choice was to burn the whole thing. And his children, along with it. <laughs> and I am one to talk. When my life is snuffed out, I expect you to treat my body the same way. And when I burn, I will truly be one with my children for the first time. You say there were three English vocal parasites. According to Skullface, yeah. Skullface had two of the English strain with him. You burned both of them. There was an oil fire. I tossed him in. So that just leaves one. And you tell me Skullface said he used it. He said it was very close to me. Very close. One of your comrades. Or someone ordered to kill you. Or he could have been speaking metaphorically. Hmm. Metaphorically? Close to your spirit. Close to your heart. Someone who either loves you or despises you. The second one makes a long list. Whichever it is, act with caution. Skullface implanted someone with the English language strain. Who it is is irrelevant. Why? I tell you what Skullface really meant. Very close to you means you will be exposed. Mm. All the infected here have been given the Walbachia. Even if the vocal cord parasites infect them now, they cannot reproduce. But if there is a different host among us, host to the English strain... If that were the case, we'd see the symptoms. What about the non-English speakers? We have plenty of those, but the staff use English as a common language. But if that someone has not spoken English yet, and begins to speak it now, there'd be another outbreak. The final mating pair of the English strain must be found immediately. Skullface is gone, but his threat still remains on this base. Do you see what the final mating pair is? With him dead, those parasites are the stain he wished to leave upon the world. His thirst for vengeance in the flesh. Think. Does anyone here bear a grudge against you? Who would target you specifically? The ethnic cleansers that Code Talker mentioned, they were in Skullface's true goal. All we have is circumstantial evidence, but here's my theory. It was Cypher who started developing the vocal cord parasites as bioweapons, parasitic weapons, and Africa was the testing ground for them. As Code Talker said, their purpose is the ethnic cleansing of only those who speak a particular language. So they could do a weapon of mass destruction to eradicate specific groups, races, ethnicities, or colonies by the language they speak. Or a kind of absolute language control. Or maybe a tool for those arrogant fools to build some misguided utopia. I can see plenty of uses for them. However, in practical terms, they wouldn't be as dangerous as you'd think. Counteracting the parasites is easy, after all. Cut them out of your throat to save your life, or just don't talk. That also prevents the infection from spreading. So if the international community were to find out about them, they'd no longer be the threat they were conceived to be. In which case, their targets would be limited to minority groups as a deterrent or a terrorist tool. It's hard to imagine Cypher developing something like that as a main weapon for their arsenal. That leads me to think we've only tugged on one little thread in Cypher's grand tapestry. An obscure corner of their work, possibly forgotten altogether. In any case, things changed. When Skullface was forced to relocate to Africa and he saw that thread dangling. All the time he continued that research, he was secretly following his own agenda. The ethnic liberator parasites. 
is English language strain. Skullface said there were only three samples of the English language strain parasite, and I think we can believe him. Bringing his ethnic liberators plan to fruition depended on creating an English version of the vocal cord parasites at all costs. But an English strain would have been useless to cipher. Worse, it could have destroyed everything they'd built. It was the one type they couldn't allow. That means Skullface was forced to develop his English strain out of sight of Cypher's network. Naturally, he couldn't use the greenhouse facility Cypher had set up and filled with guinea pigs. Skullface must have found some secret place to create his precious few English parasites, hiding all evidence like a man cheating on his wife. Somewhere, an entirely standalone environment. And when his plan entered its final phase, he must have made the place disappear. Some little room could be anywhere, but now nowhere at all. We'll never know where he did it. But to elude Cypher's surveillance, it couldn't have been big. I believe Skullface was telling the truth. There were only ever three samples of the English language strain. Why activate Sahelanthropus in Afghanistan? This is how Skullface wanted things to play out. The Soviet Union secretly develops a new type of nuclear weapon and successfully deploys it in Afghanistan. Revealing the existence of Sahelanthropus results in a return to the glory days of the Cold War. The threat it poses reignites the nuclear arms race between the world's major powers. The demand for nuclear weapons increases around the globe. What if you then introduced a nuclear weapon anyone could get their hands on? Non-nuclear nations, militant groups of all shapes and sizes, they'd all jump at the chance. Sahelanthropus was a marketing tool to sell nukes all around the world. But I think it's safe to say that plan was stamped out before it got up and running. The world's intelligence agencies never did turn up anything conclusive on it. After all, Sahelanthropus vanished before word could spread. Everything that's happened is already a fading memory, never to join the pages of history. Except for Cypher. Cypher won't forget. They'll already be working on something, quietly, beneath the surface. They'll use the pieces of data scraped together from this incident to build their own bipedal weapon. It'll take them a long time to complete it, but for now, the greed sector have found their new life's work. We'll have to be ready, too. Hewitt's dug up some interesting facts about our skull-faced friend. Nine years ago, he was exiled to South Africa, stripped of political power. The upshot said he ceased being a serious threat, in Cypher's eyes anyway. They eased up on surveillance, giving him an opening to establish his own military unit, one that answered to his will alone. Those men likely had no idea their orders were coming from Skullface. They probably didn't even know the organization was a part of Cypher at all. Anyway. It was in South Africa where he found renewed interest in parasites. And when he discovered the vocal cord parasites, he began to make his plan. Wipe the English language out of existence. Free the world, not by taking men's lives, but by taking their tongues. In his eyes, the greatest symbiotic parasite the world's ever known isn't microbial. It's linguistic. Words are what keeps civilization, our world, alive. There was something Skullface said. America is made up of many peoples, but those peoples never mix. Quite so. One nation, home to hundreds of different ethnic groups, many of whom stick to their respective living areas, little colonies not interacting with other groups, going out of their way to avoid one another, their land, organizations, relationships. Thus, the United States of America is no melting pot. It is more of a salad bowl. It is not made up from one people, but for its minorities to function in society, a common ground is needed language. Even if the country is not one, no, 
Because it's not one. A lingua franca is necessary. English. American hegemonism was born from the illusion that English could unite diverse ethnicities. In taking in people from around the globe, America became a microcosm of it. Now the boundaries between it and the rest of the world have become blurred. However different our neighbors may be, English enables us to create symbiotic relationships with each other. If English can bring unacquainted neighbors together in America, this should hold true for the world. This salad bowl that is the world can also become one. A ruler's greatest wealth is not money or land. It is the number of individuals under his control. Subjects who work, consume, are there to be used as pawns in war. For a capitalist ruler, his people's power becomes his power. You are the same. With your diamond dogs, you spin it with your speeches. But what you're doing is bringing as much talent as you can into your little domain. Every person, another feather in your cap. Yes. Since ancient times, every civilization's ruler has had the same idea. When people unite under one will, they become stronger than the sum of their parts. And the one will is the ruler's will. And what do rulers use to bring people together? Language. In the Old Testament, it is written that only one language was spoken in Eden. A shared tongue that united all of humanity. Mankind eventually grew aware of its power and harnessed that strength to build a tower to the heavens. The mighty Tower of Babel. This angered God, who splintered the language of man, and the tower was never completed. Languages emerged, and the earth was divided as men went their separate ways. Every age is the same. A ruler's first order of business, after conquering new land, is to force his tongue on its people. Ancient Rome, Napoleon, and now Zero, English is wrecking havoc around the world right now. The British Empire tilled the land with war as its hoe, then began planting the seed that is English. Eventually, American capitalism became the new instrument. To play its game of wealth, you only had to abide by one rule, English. By exploiting people's desires, English has become a leash that people gladly wear around their necks, it would seem. Ya at e. You disappoint me. Have you forgotten my face? Leave me be. <laughs> you won't respond to anyone else, so I figured it must be me you wanted to see. But now you won't even look at me. Have I not suffered enough? Not until you've eased my suffering first. To tell you the truth, old man, I'm in a bit of a bind. It's about your children. Hmm? You know what I mean? The parasites. The ones that infect a man's throat, killing him if he speaks their language. They must not be allowed to multiply. Hmm. You are allowed to live only in order to help me. But you don't want to, do you? So why not choose death instead? Because you want to protect the Digne. 
and their land from me. <sighs> That's your purpose, isn't it? Don't lose sight of that now. <sighs> it's in your interest to cooperate. Because if you don't... Madness. The parasites can't detect your people's tongue. So I'll just have to resort to more heavy-handed means. I have the greatest respect for your people. I would rather avoid such a thing, but... We don't always get our way. I was born a tiny moat in a mighty tempest. And until those winds abate, all I can choose is how to act when they blow me this way or that. Tell me, code talker. What happens to a man infected with a pair of your parasites? Can they be removed? Can the full-blown symptoms be prevented? It is impossible to remove the parasites alone. They have too close an affinity with humans. Then how do you stop the symptoms from developing? All right. I was hoping for an answer now, but perhaps you just need a little more time. I'll be back soon. I've set up shop, not far from here. We'll be seeing a lot more of each other. If you're close by, then it is almost complete. We're in the final phases. All that's left is to see if I can actually disable a nuke, with the help of your metallic Archaea. Once that's done, I won't have to return here again, and your suffering will end. As will your peoples. We're almost finished, Code Talker. Each in our own way. My only regret will be not finishing you. There's nothing stopping you. I'm only alive because you want me that way. Ridiculous. As you wish. My regret is this misunderstanding between us. You and I, our goal is the same. We should be working together. A symbiosis. You do not know my mind. I simply want the Diné bloodline to endure. <laughs> really now? You're just another moat in the storm. How you react to all the slings and arrows, that's what counts. That's why you call those squirming monsters your children. What I have done is forbidden. Forgive me, all of you. The world should be left the way it is. You of all men should know that. Forgive me, but my schedule has changed. The time for grace and good manners has now run out. Please. Torture will not work on me. Surely you know this. Oh, I have no intention of getting rough with you. You haven't been beaten. Your hands aren't even tied. Just like me, you live in symbiosis with countless parasites. What wounds I might inflict, they'll patch right up. You might feel considerable pain, but I've no doubt you can withstand it. Then what do you plan on doing? I have a soldier standing outside. Nothing special about him, except that he always obeys. I have given him one instruction. Whenever I ring this bell, he passes on a message for me. That message is simply, go. What is this? After that, though, it gets complicated. The message will arrive at a room. A little bigger than this one. Nothing special. Some of your people are in this room, surrounded by my men. Enough of this. They pick them at random. No regard for age, gender. In that, I suppose, they're different from you. 
Not as discriminating. They tied them up, one by one, blindfolded them. We had to maintain order, you understand? You bastard. Go. When they hear that, my men will pick one of your people and infect them with a parasite. Your parasite. It won't work on my people. True. The vocal cord parasite doesn't respond to your language. But what about English? An English strain. It exists. A ring of this bell, and they infect one person. If that person abandons the Navajo language, the English strain will trigger symptoms. You monster! So, it's quite simple. Every time I ring the bell, another of your people is infected. Don't do this! I don't want to do this. I'd rather not have to ring the bell. Which is why I'm hoping you will talk to me. What do you want? What else could you possibly want? You know the answer to that. How to prevent the symptoms caused by the parasite. You cannot control it wow. like some slave. Forget the idea. Forget it? Unlikely. I will never tell you. What have you done? You made me do that. You black-hearted... Settle down. Don't use it again. Well, that is up to you. All you need to do is tell me what I want. How to prevent the vocal cord parasite symptoms. Why? Why do you need to know? The adult soldiers at Bualayamasa are all dead. What? The parasite traveled downstream. How? It would appear that he was involved. Another demon who woke up from nine years of slumber. As a result, the vocal cord parasite spread through the village. I told you this would happen. It was an unfortunate accident. He is becoming an annoyance. He may stumble upon the truth sooner or later, but I suppose that is really of no consequence. One day, he too will pay for what he has done. Black Anna, the real demon, is you. You know, this incident made me realize something. You are right. I should have acted with more humility. These creatures cannot be controlled. All the more reason I require a means to stop them. There is no such way. Oh, really? Wait! Don't ring it again. It is up to you. <sighs> Out with it! I see now. There must be more to it than that. What? They are in you. You use this land to breed more of my children. And not just here. No. In pursuit of your ethnic cleansers, you sifted through many language strains, finding hosts, breeding more and more. You would have been infected in the process, infected with countless strains. <sighs> Most likely your mother tongues as well. Romania, Northern Transylvania. You found that one too. Yes, the Hungarian strain that responds to the CK's dialect. Silence! Black Anna. It is you who shall pay. <laughs> <laughs> Is this your retaliation, old man? Let my people go, and never bother them again! You heard me. What now? <laughs> what? No! What are you doing? <laughs> 
I am not afraid. I probably have every language strain inside of me. Meaning all the world's languages are already lost to me. But that suits me fine. If need be, I myself can produce whatever strain is needed. And that means nothing to you. If you are infected, you can never again speak your mother tongue. Otherwise, you will die. As will every one of your countrymen. Approaching. A few words here and there won't trigger the symptoms. And besides, the time is not yet right to show this face in my homeland. Not until my revenge is complete. Now... Stop! We are out of time. I have to get going. <sighs> well... No! Uh... Radiation. It's radiation. Radiation, of course. So it can be used. But how much? I do not know. Radiation denatures their reproductive cells, preventing them from mating. Same principle as the sterilization technique. The reproductive cells are more sensitive to radiation than the rest of the body. But I have not tested it. There is no telling. What mutation could result, or how the host may be affected. Not to mention what could happen if this is done post-infection. I don't care. This plan goes into action now. As long as it works, the details can wait. You wouldn't be lying to me, of course, old man. I can guarantee nothing. I owe you my life. My body has been burned on countless occasions, but it survives, thanks to your children. That is why I trust you. Then do not repeat my mistake. What's that? In the West, it is said that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the East, it is said the man of flesh brings spiritual power to words. The people knew back then that these creatures carry the gospel. They do not belong in our hands. They must not be touched. <laughs> How enlightening. I'll remember that. Consider this my thanks. What are you? Catch. <laughs> no! Well then, I'm afraid it really is goodbye this time, Code Talker. <sighs> huh? There. There is no soldier. Huh. Now where did he run off to? Uh -huh. Guess he wasn't as obedient as I thought. There never was any soldier. So long. You! How dare you! Skullface. Real name unknown. Born in Hungary more specifically Northern Transylvania, after it reverted to Hungary from Romania. While he was young, the country allied with Germany as part of the Axis powers, but later during the war, it came under Soviet occupation. The Hungarians struggled for independence, but the Soviets came down. Hard. Just like he said, time and again, the country was ruled by a foreign tongue. When he was a young boy, he lost his native language the bedrock for any developing child. His country, his family, his face, his identity, everything was stolen from him. All he had left was his skull. Skullface first tried his hand at espionage during all the chaos from the war. 
Agents, military officials, and soldiers who operated out of Hungary during the war vanished over the course of several months. This Soviet spy hunt rocked the counter-intel world. Mysterious fatal illnesses, accidental deaths, drownings, people having strokes behind closed doors. Just like Stalin, no one knew who was behind it. But all you need to do was look for who had the motive. They were all taken out by a man without a face. And now we've got an idea of how he did it too. He'd gotten revenge for his people, but he wasn't finished. Skullface defected to the West, eventually ended up with the SAS. That's where he met Zero. It's possible he began planning this whole thing back then. It's hard to say. In any case, Zero made him his XO. He always did have a thing for oddballs. But this one was set to lead a unit no one else would know about. When Zero created Fox, he also formed XOF as a support team. An unconventional special forces unit designed to support Fox, make it stronger. With Skullface given the orders, Zero never even told the boss about it. Nor the CIA, naturally. If Fox was Zero's silver bullet, XOF was the recoil when he pulled the trigger. Just like Newton's third law. While you were with Fox, Skullface was operating behind the scenes. Sometimes as your backup, sometimes as a mole or a scout, sometimes as your cleanup crew. Fox's tail, making sure the mission succeeded and that you survived. We only have his word to go on, but Skullface's goal was revenge against those who'd use language to subjugate people. Those corrupting a people's identity by forcing a new tongue on them. Those using the power of language to control information. Naturally, that set his sights on Zero. To Zero, English was simply the most convenient code. But to Skullface, English was a parasite. And by eradicating it, he'd stop the world from being eaten away. If that didn't work, he was ready to see the world scorched by nuclear fire. To save language, culture, and race from annihilation, he was willing to overstep the hands of the doomsday clock. That is, of course, if you believe anything he had to say. Boss. We gave Ralph, that kid who died in the accident, a burial at sea. The man in charge of that facility has been severely punished. But ever since, the kids have been acting strange. It's obvious they've lost their trust in adults. I was getting reports of them ignoring the staff, or getting insolent, and even violent. And a few days later, several of the kids did a disappearing act. They snuck into choppers and shipping containers and got off base. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. These kids were born in a war zone, and forced to grow up as war fighters. If they're left alone, war is how they'll die. But I thought we showed them there are other reasons to live. I never liked having children on Mother Base. But the thought of them going back to the battlefield and picking up their old lifestyle is something I can't stomach. It makes me think of Chico, nine years ago. We have to get those kids back. Hell, they know too much about our operation. <sighs> I never expected even the kids to betray us. Snake, you remember the White Mamba? Of course, he's been going by Eli since we brought him on base. He was the leader of the child soldier unit we took out of that village and into our protection. Well, according to the kids you brought back here, all the escapees were especially close to Eli. There's reason to suspect he's behind all six escapes. We've already detained him. I'll be questioning him shortly. Wait, wait. You'll be? Ocelot. You're incapable of taking an impartial stance with those kids. Question them all you want. It'll get you nowhere. Ocelot, you get too many kicks from your art of interrogation. It's not a matter of art. It's about quick, minimal strokes of psychological warfare that's what gets the answers. And it's the best way to keep both questioner and subject safe. 
The risks only increase the more an interrogation drags on. At that point, it causes as much pain to the inflictor as the inflicted. <sighs> like I said, too many kicks. <sighs> what I'm trying to tell you is we need quick results. Otherwise, it'll be too little, too late. I know that. And besides, I know the subject. I won't go overboard with a kid. Forget it. You're not needed. Snake, I want to question the other kids too. Be sure to bring them all back. Snake, about the escaped children, Eli confessed. The way he tells it, they wanted to go back to the battlefield. Don't rob them of their freedom, he said. If you bring them all back, there will be consequences. <laughs> Next to be asking for our surrender. Consequences? What consequences? No idea. That's all I have for now. You're too attached to those kids. Stop protecting Eli. Listen to yourself. Let me question him, and we'll get some real answers. Not necessary. I'll report as and when. Boss, we found weapons in the children's section of the living quarters. As you know, weapons are strictly off-limits. We've got some rule breakers. The weapons we found were handmade. Blades ground out of knives and forks, a couple of bow guns built out of scrap, and explosives made using detergents. And get this, the explosives were tightly packed with nails. The kids put the blame on, you guessed it, Eli. I guess that's what he meant by consequences. I questioned him about it, but this time he claimed they want to be put out on missions. Send us to the battlefield, he says. Miller, enough is enough. You've protected him too much already. It's my turn to question him. Protected? What Eli's doing is issuing a threat. Comply with my demands or I'll respond with force. But it'll be war at this rate. Forks and soap aren't gonna kill us, but some of them will end up dead. Is that what you want? <sighs> now, I hate to say it, but they want to be on the battlefield. It's time you gave up this fantasy. Eli, he said they'd rise up against us if we bring the last kid back. There, you see? Ignore his demands. Don't let him return to quarters. That attitude is contagious. We lose control over them for good. For the time being, we've confiscated those handmade weapons. We're bumping up security and the number of psychiatric counselors. As for Eli... He needs some very special care. You mean solitary? Well, we can't leave him in contact with the other kids. If you won't do it, I will. Boss, keep working on extracting those kids. The kids you brought back to base have laid out the situation. They all escaped to each of their home villages, who were trying to get home, and lost their way. Not that homesickness is gonna explain everything we've seen. Each of their home villages? They were trying to raise troops for the rebellion. You really think these kids have an armed uprising in them? You read the report of the security team member who had a rock thrown at him. There'll be a riot if we don't do something. And Miller, this is because you didn't act fast enough. Fine. I'll admit you were right this time. <sighs> Seal off the kids' quarters from outside contact before it's too late. All right. Eli said his rebellion would start when the last kid is brought back, right? You better be ready to meet him head on if it really happens. Yeah. You should have left it to me in the first place. Boss, they're just kid... We have a responsibility to see that those kids make it. It's not about feeling protective or the pros and cons. I hate kids. That's exactly what I heard from the people who raised me. People who abandoned me, more like. That's the spark that kept me going, you know? I wanted to show those adults what I was made of. Wanted to get back at them one day. But before I knew it, I was all grown up. Never saw it coming. All of a sudden, people treated me as an adult. Some adult I turned out to be. But I feel like if my life had been different, if the adults I knew had been different, I could have grown up better. Yeah, that's it, all right. I wanted to use those kids to test that theory. That's all this was. 
From their point of view, I'm no different from the assholes who gave me a hard time. When this is all blown over, I'll talk it out with them. If that's still possible. Boss, there are still kids out there. Bring them back safe. Boss, it's me. Eli's revealed what he wants. He wants to speak with you. With Big Boss. He just said, bring my father here. Eli's too smart for his own good. No way to tell what he's thinking. All we know for sure is his men are important to him. That means we can use the escaped kids as leverage in any negotiation. Once you've brought the last one back, I'll interrogate him. If the kids do rise up, we'll meet them full force. End of story. I didn't want things to turn out like this. We could have prevented it, but it's too late now. If Eli means to take this all the way, he's gonna force us to do the same. Boss, go get that last kid. You know, when you brought back all the child soldiers who escaped, Eli knew they'd returned. Needless to say, nobody said a word to him. I guess they got a message to him somehow. Eli wasn't put in the corner in time out. He was locked up in that room, completely cut off from the outside world. Then how'd he find out? It's only one possibility I can think of. The Soviet Union has been researching military applications for psi phenomena. Psi? Things like psychokinesis and ESP. Extrasensory perception. You mean moving objects without touching them? Knowing what card somebody's holding up? Psychic powers? Come on. I thought that was just another bunch of disinformation aimed at the West. Just bear with me a second. One type of ESP is telepathy. It's the ability to know another person's thoughts through nonverbal means. You're saying Eli read our minds? It's the only idea that doesn't involve someone getting to him. <sighs> Ocelot. Look, psi research isn't some hocus-pocus. It's all evidence-based, scientific... There's gotta be another explanation. Maybe one of the kids stuck a note to your back. I hope that's the case. But I am convinced that they have, or Eli has, a connection to some force we have yet to identify. You better watch yourself, boss. How am I supposed to do that? If he is depending on something for help, well, that's his Achilles heel. If you can figure out what that something is, you might be able to use it against him. I'll keep that in mind. Oh, and the medical team is looking after the kids left on Mother Base. For the moment, they don't seem too panicked. But boss, get this. Eli got those kids to plot their armed uprising as a diversion. Also, he could steal Sahalanthropus and escape. That brat got us good. Set us up and knocked us down. And then there's that mystery kid who was with Eli. With those two working together, I'd say things won't be over for a long time yet. We finished decoding the informant's report. That floating kid we've run into a few times now. Looks like he was a test subject in clinical experiments. The Soviets called him the third boy. The third boy was brought to a lab on the outskirts of Moscow from Czechoslovakia, after which he was due to be sent to a research center in Leningrad, then Siberia, and finally an academic town in Novosibirsk. It doesn't appear that the researchers witnessed the talents we've seen from him, but nevertheless, he was quite the popular subject. His latent cognitive abilities suddenly awoke en route to Moscow. According to the report, the third boy was easily influenced by other individuals' biofields. Evil thoughts, in particular. They affected his mind like a virus. Extreme anger or resentment, motives for revenge, in other words. Now, during the transport flight to Moscow, the boy was exposed to a powerful mental energy field coming from a certain individual. Ever since, being conscious of his powers, he's become a sort of energy generator. What's unique about him is the way his acute telepathic abilities get taken over by another person's will. The boy began to physically parasitize individuals experiencing extreme anger and codify the host's desires. This includes amplifying the host's natural strengths. Or, in accordance with the host's desires, he can also implant program code in another individual, making them a puppet, essentially. Human neural synapses transmit weak electrical currents between neurons. These electrical currents, though at a level difficult to observe, 
warp the magnetic field outside the body. The third boy is able to pick up these weak fluctuations. Contrary to psychotronics, which involves controlling the human mind, his abilities as a receptor are too high. The emotions he picks up from another individual are amplified and unleashed into his body as they recur in his brain. They turn into microwaves, which then affect the physical world, triggering paranormal phenomena like the spontaneous combustion of organic matter or psychokinesis, you know, moving an object without touching it. There's one other thing. While he's parasitizing a host, the boy's ego gets shut away, allowing the will of the host to take control of his powers, like some annoying static drowning out your own voice. That means he isn't responsible for what's been happening. Somebody's extreme anger has manifested through the third boy's powers in ways none of us could have predicted, which would mean this was going on somewhere around us. Looking back on it, a lot of things make sense now. The man on fire, Sahelanthropus, they both came to life thanks to the third boy's powers. Everything has been happening through him as a catalyst. We first saw him in the hospital on Cyprus. The boy parasitizing the man on fire's desire for revenge gave him his new abilities in return. He next appeared at the Hamid fighter's fort where the honeybee was hidden. There, the boy parasitized Skullface's vengeful mind. He controlled Sahelanthropus, making it do whatever Skullface wanted. Same goes for when we extracted Emmerich onto the chopper. When he appeared at the Devil's House in Central Africa, Skullface's will controlled the man on fire via the third boy's powers. Everything is clear up to this point. But even the informant couldn't pinpoint who the host was in the cave within Surat power plant. Sahelanthropus suddenly became active, then crushed not only the man on fire, but Skullface as well. Surely neither of them could have been the host. Who else was at that location and bore anger more extreme than either of them? Whose will was controlling Sahelanthropus? According to the report, emotions transmitted in children's brains affect the surrounding magnetic field more strongly. Cerebral nerves are covered with insulation called myelin sheaths to increase impulse speed. The reason for this leakage has to do with the fact that children's myelin sheaths are still developing. So, how many children do you remember being there? Children with a burning desire for revenge and bearing a grudge against you. I can think of only one, Eli. We don't know what kind of life he's had, but the resentment he's shown toward adults is nothing short of extraordinary. The third boy resonated with Eli's mind. And that means Eli bore the strongest animosity of all individuals within the boy's reception range, estimated to be a three-mile radius, beating out even Volgan and Skullface. The third boy has probably remained hooked on Eli's anger since. You remember at the Devil's House, the third boy showed an interest in Shabani? That must have been his ego making a rare appearance. He may possess abilities far beyond anyone else in the world, but he's still a kid. Maybe them both being kids was enough to bring them together. And if so, maybe with Eli, he isn't feeding off him, but acting in symbiosis with him. So what kick-started the third boy's powers? If we look at the location and time that his plane went down, we can make a pretty good guess. When the plane experienced the first anomaly, it gave an accurate report of its position to a control tower. Due north of the Black Sea, 125 miles east of Kiev. Dead south in the Black Sea is Cyprus's Green Line. So the plane's position was directly north of the hospital where you'd been asleep for nine years. And this anomaly was reported at exactly the same time that you woke up. The plane was enveloped in flame from the inside out. The fuselage burnt to ashes. There were no survivors, at least not publicly admitted. Your thoughts formed a synchronicity with the boy's psyche and were amplified inside his brain. That would have been more than enough to trigger his abilities. Your rage was like a big bang in his head, blowing the lid off his powers. The boy was then secretly moved to the lab outside of Moscow where Volgan was comatose. There, Volgan's thoughts resonated with the boy and he was awakened. Volgan became the man on fire 
hell-bent on getting revenge on you. His instincts led him straight to you. Skullface knew Volgan from Operation Snake Eater, or perhaps from even before. Monitoring this pair of extraordinaries, he discovered the hospital and sent his assassin and XOF. Skullface was probably watching the situation from close by. Then, realizing how useful these two test subjects could be, he approached them. Reacting to Skullface's thirst for revenge, this time the boy let Skullface's will control Volgan. Volgan, at times driven by personal revenge, at times through Skullface's will, kept on moving, though his body was little more than dead meat. Perhaps there were moments where even your thoughts affected him as well. But without the boy's power, it was like the plug had been pulled from the socket. Everything was powered by anger, malice, revenge. This is how the end of the report sums things up. Both the third boy and the man on fire were originally test subjects of paranormal research for military applications, like telekinetically controlling the leader of an enemy nation and making him launch a nuke, or stopping the heart of someone on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall, experimenting with latent human abilities. They were used as tools of the Cold War. The boy's only crime was being born with unique gifts. But he was sacrificed on the altar of war. His life reduced to slavery under other people's wills. Turned into a living weapon with no will of his own. And eventually the only emotion he could feel must have been the desire to get revenge for the hand he'd been dealt. Boss, it's you that awakened the boy's powers. But there's more to it than that. I guess the anger emanating from you was something he could truly relate to. Twelve hours after exposure to the blood of a symptomatic colleague, I found myself making my way up the stairs to this room. And I am not alone. Everyone who's infected, we've all come up here wanting to get outside. I know full well I mustn't leave, given the possibility I'm infected. Yet, I can't contain this urge I feel inside me, like the alcoholic who tries to make any excuse for one more drink. Every step I took up those stairs filled me with this sense of bliss. I still have all my wits about me. It took no time at all to rewire the electronic lock and open the emergency exit. Then, just as I was about to set foot outside, I finally realized what was going on. This desire for freedom is not my own, but that of the vocal cord parasites inside me. They want the ravens to feed on us, pecking us to death, attracted by these sweet secretions. They have mutated to facilitate this. The sweet smell is powerful enough to attract even a species with such a weak nose. So, before the parasites take complete control, I must. Most of the staff in here are already infected. At least, everyone I've looked at is. Infection with this parasite causes a high fever in the pharynx. I have modified a pair of night vision goggles to react only to this temperature range. With these goggles, you can identify who is infected. Other infected will, like me, feel compelled to make it outside. If the ravens get their meal, they'll head for land next. That cannot be allowed to happen. 
idea of the vocal cord parasites was that they'd only copulate once exposed to a specific language over time. But the parasites infecting our men in the laboratory laid their eggs straight away. The larvae were eating their lung tissue almost immediately. What kind of mutation was it? Those who were infected and cured still carried the vocal cord parasites in their throats. They were still there. But the males had been rendered female by the Volbachia, and copulation could not occur, so we thought. But it is the Volbachia that mutated. Not the parasites? You remember I told you the Volbachia attempts to maximize its number of female infected hosts? Yes, hence the male-to-female transformation. Precisely. But other Volbachia strains use different methods. Cytoplasmic incompatibility, killing the males, and parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis? Aphids? Aphids use that to reproduce via females only. Very good. The females lay their eggs without a male present, creating clones of themselves in explosive numbers. Parthenogenesis was originally a means for an organism to take maximum advantage of abundant resources by increasing its numbers. Certain strains of Obakia forced this to occur, to create more and more infected females. And that's why our men develop symptoms in the blink of an eye. Wolbachia causing parthenogenesis is common in parasitic wasps. Of course, the Volbachia I introduced to your men did not have this characteristic, but I believe the mutation, whatever it was, caused it to force parthenogenesis in its host, the vocal cord parasites. The Volbachia we used to prevent egg laying became the agent of limitless reproduction. There's something else. The symptomatic infected in the laboratory all wanted to get outside, even knowing there was napalm waiting for them out there. You said the parasites made them act that way, but parasites controlling humans. Is it possible? Parasites altering the host's behavior is a common occurrence in the world of nature. Long ago, the vocal cord parasites had this ability. But even I never foresaw they might control humans. Until I heard the things your man said. You mean the researcher on the top floor? The bit about, I'm not a snail? Yes. Among parasitic worms, there is a genus called Leucochloridium that uses snails as intermediary hosts. As you know, snails prefer dark, gloomy environments. But once parasitized by leucochloridium, they desire to be in the light. And that is not all. The parasitic worms thrust themselves into the snail's antennae, making them swell to abnormal size. The snail, meanwhile, frantically wiggles its antennae as the parasites squirm inside. The swollen wriggling antennae soon resemble caterpillars. I don't get it. It is so they can be eaten by birds. Leucochloridium needs a bird as its definitive host to breed. They require their snail host to be snapped up by a predator. So they make the humble snail appear to be a delicious caterpillar and lead it to somewhere in open sight. So you mean the staff trying to get outside? Was well, so the birds could pick at them. The parasites altered their mental state, making them crave higher places and to be outdoors. I can only surmise that both the Volbachia and the parasites mutated before the ancestors of the vocal cord parasites infected humans. Their hosts were birds. What we saw in the laboratory was some throwback to that time. The parasites attempting to make birds their intermediary hosts. It sounds insane. A praying mantis that is host to a parasitic hairworm 
will dive into water and drown itself. Just so the hair worm can lay its eggs in water. Rats infected with Toxoplasma gondii lose their instinctive caution and run right up to cats. Just some of the many ways parasites control the host. But we're humans. Surely our minds are too complex for that. I thought just the same. Free will is what makes us human, so it never occurred to me that the parasites could be controlling the symptomatic. But the mood, the will of a person can be easily affected by the balance of their cerebral substances. Take the toxoplasma I mentioned. It does infect humans, and it is thought the infected develop a more reckless attitude. <sighs> But to think that mutations occurred in both the Walbachia and its parasite hosts. Your observation is most apt. Both mutations occurring at once indicates the presence of a powerful mutagen. I see. Keep working on narrowing down what it was. I want to thank you, Code Talker. You're pinpointing the cause of the vocal cord parasite's mutation enabled us to purge an enemy from Mother Base. You mean that scientist? Yeah, I was convinced he'd betrayed us. But I was wrong. He was never on our side to begin with. So ultimately, there was no traitor among us. And yet I made everyone distrustful with my talk of spies. The end result being men turning on each other in the laboratory. You must not blame yourself. They were all infected with the mutated strain. The outcome would have been the same. You know, we defeated Skullface, but it didn't lessen our pain. It's a pain we'll never be rid of. I see that now, but I thought I could burn it away. In the end, all I burned was our own men. Oh, Infectious right. diseases, parasites. Without such foreign enemies, the immune system will start attacking the body, developing allergies, and autoimmune diseases. The same is true of organizations. You're right. But I do not deserve to rebuke you. My desire to retaliate against the English language is what attracted me to the vocal cord parasites in the first place. Had it not been for that, I would never have been used by Skullface. We both allowed revenge to crawl into our minds and lay its eggs. Sahelanthropus will unleash that thirst unto the future. How long are we going to be tormented by what he left behind? There is no choice but to live with that pain. Be symbiotic with our vengeful nature. Whatever we do, we must not allow that thirst for revenge to control us. There is going to be a kind of festival held on Mother Base. They are calling it Peace Day. Snake and his men may be without a nation, but they are still an army. And that means sometimes they have to fight the bad guys. Of course, they should not fight at all. It is obvious to me that any problem can be solved with reasonable discussion. Maybe Snake and the others think so too, because the idea is to set aside war for one day a year and relax in peace. I do not know how it came about, but apparently Snake and Miller got the idea while they were talking. And everyone on Mother Base went along with it. To think that deep down they all share a love of peace, that makes me happy. But never mind that. Somehow I have ended up singing on stage. Miller was all, come on, both our names mean peace. It will be great. Why does that mean we have to be in a band? Then he roped Professor Galvez in, too, saying, Hey, Galvez comes from peace, too. We are the perfect act. I am not sure Miller really understands the origins of the name Galvez. But then again, you always have to take Miller's talk with a grain of salt. What I cannot believe is, he went and told everyone we'd be performing together without even asking my opinion. Now everyone thinks it has all been decided. I like to sing. But I have never had to perform in front of a crowd. I do not think I'm up to this. But everyone seems to be looking forward to it. I guess I would hate to let them down. 
And anything is better than letting Miller sing. <laughs> oh, that was mean. Miller said he was going to write a song for us. I wonder what it will be like. It is funny. The more nervous I get, the more I find myself looking forward to it. The whole base is busy getting ready for Peace Day. Miller has finished writing his song, so I went with Professor Galvez to listen to it. Miller was really into it, humming away as he played the song on his acoustic guitar. But the song melody did not match up with the guitar chords at all, and it sounded more like a mess than music. Miller's very enthusiastic, but I think he's tone deaf. I guess the guitar backing sounded good at least. But as I was wondering how to break it to Miller, Professor Galvez took out an odd instrument. It was just two antennas sticking out of a box, more like a radio than a musical instrument. He said it was invented by the Soviets, but why would Professor Galvez own a Soviet Russian instrument? I asked him, and he told me music has no borders. Well, I cannot argue with that. Good music is something people of any nation can appreciate. Why not abandon war and just make music together? But anyway, the professor offered to try playing the melody on his instrument in time with Miller's guitar. It was like something from another world. But somehow, it fit Miller's guitar backing really well. It even gave the song a charming, down-home kind of feeling. Miller was overjoyed. That is it. That is my melody right there, he said. It sounded totally different from when he sang it. But hearing the professor's version, I thought I could probably sing it. Then Miller hit me with the next bombshell. Buzz, you write the lyrics. I did not know whether to scream or to run out of the room. There was only one week left until Peace Day. So, as if putting me on stage to sing was not enough, Miller even expected me to write the lyrics. He even said he had thought of the title already. Love Deterrence. As if he had done the hard part. Deterrence? Love Deterrence? Deterrence is... It is when nuclear weapons prevent war, right? I do not see how love fits in. But it was too late to complain, so I just sat and listened to the tape of Miller's backing guitar and the professor's melody over and over again. I guess the melody is more Professor Galvez's creation than Miller's, but on the whole, I think it is actually a good song. First, it goes for your heart with a sorrowful opening, but then you feel revitalized as the song goes on. Miller grew up in post-war Japan. Maybe that is why the song has that kind of balance. Long ago, I heard some Japanese music called Enka, I think. It sounded this way, but I wonder why it has to sound sad in the first place. Miller called it Love Deterrence. Doesn't that mean he had a love song in mind? All I see of Miller and women is the way he fools around with a lot of them at once. But maybe he has had his heart broken too. And what about me? I found myself thinking about Chico and Snake as well. I know Chico has a crush on me. So naturally he should come to mind. But why Snake? He saved me and I feel indebted to him. But I thought that was all he meant to me. Why does my heart flutter when I think of him? It is embarrassing to be unable to control this emotion. There has to be a way to suppress it, to forget it. But maybe that is what love deterrence is? With that thought in mind, I went to my desk and began to write and write. Just three days left until peace day. I finally had a decent draft of the lyrics, so I showed them to Professor Galvez first. He liked them. He said I had done a superb job capturing the sense of a young girl's troubled heart. There were one or two lines I thought needed brushing up, so although he said lyrics aren't my specialty at first, he gave me some advice. Everything he said made perfect sense. When I tried putting in his changes, they made the song feel deeper, more sincere. That is the professor for you. He always has the answer. 
with the lyrics finished, I was ready to show Miller. He does not often take things seriously, but all of a sudden, he was saying, Buzz, you have the soul of an Anka songwriter. And I did not even listen to Anka all that much. Maybe I am pretty talented after all. But still, it took so much time to write the lyrics that there is hardly any time left to rehearse before peace day. The three of us rushed into the makeshift practice studio on Mother Base to see how we sounded together. Miller strummed away with a big smile on his face. I sang the main melody, and Professor Galvez improvised a backup melody. I know the professor is smart, but is there anything he cannot do? And Miller's guitar playing sounded a lot better now that he stopped singing. But I could hardly criticize his voice. I thought I had learned the song well enough listening to the tape as I wrote the lyrics, but I had trouble with the pitch and kept missing the rhythm. I have to practice, but there's almost no time left. It is just three days until peace day. Wait, I thought there were three days left before. I went and checked today's date with Miller and the professor. The date has not changed. It is the same day. Something is strange. Am I reliving the same day? Peace day never came. Every morning I wake up expecting it to come. But it is always three days away. That cannot be it. I have not woken up at all. It is just a dream. It is all a dream. I am in it. And you are in it too. I am the dreamer. But you are having my dream. Do you get it now? You do, don't you? Peace day. Never. Came. With three days left, I followed my orders from Cypher and launched the operation. I hijacked Zeke. I fought Snake. I lost and was thrown into the ocean. I survived, but I was captured by Cypher. How happy I would have been if they had let me die then and there. Our wishes do not come true. We just cling on to our dreams. Our phantoms. Mine. And yours. But I think this one is coming to an end. After all, you have figured it out now. You can kill Skullface. Murder Huey. Slaughter Zero. Burn the whole world down. And it still won't bring me back. Me. Or any of the dead. And that was our business. War. We bought our daily bread with money paid to us for killing. Maybe us getting killed was just balancing the scales. You know, Mother Base was never the heaven we wanted it to be. But I was still happy to have lived with everyone there. It was such a short time. Such a hypocritical peace. But while I was on Mother Base, I was happy. So, I hope I am not the only one who looks back on those days with happiness. There is more to remember than hatred and rage. But of course, this is you thinking that I should think that. It is no mystery now. I am just a phantom. A fragment of the mind you have lost. The real me died a long time ago. But even so, more so, I can tell what you are really feeling. The real emotion that is locked away at the bottom of your heart. Let it fly out. Let it guide you. Live. I think it is my job to tell you that. That is why I exist. So this tape is the last one. Once you are done listening to it, I am one phantom limb that will be gone for good. My flesh, my bones, joining the silt on the ocean floor. But do not forget, as long as you remember me, I will always live within you. 
not a phantom limb or a phantom anything. As part of your heart. I will always be your angel of peace. So, I know exactly how to finish. Say peace. Spoken enough. Your men can take it from here. Will you permit me to rest? Have something to eat? I thought you don't eat. I can subsist without food. But there is more to the act of eating than nourishment. We receive nature's blessings, and we affirm our part in it. And in doing so, we express our gratitude. <laughs> Sorry, it's, um, hearing you say you don't need to eat and that you're a part of nature in the same breath. Anyway, uh, what can we get you? Not exactly a five-star restaurant, but the kitchen's used to serving a lot of different appetites. Hamburgers. Uh, hamburgers? Even we, Dine, have become Americanized. I eat them often back home. <laughs> And you just can't let them go. Well, as far as symbols of the American Empire go, hamburgers are pretty good. The victory of capitalism. Hmm. Your people suffered so much at the hands of America. And you asked for hamburgers. We have suffered more than you can know. But I do not see hamburgers as an accomplice. A single dish providing a balanced helping of nature's blessings. Meat, grain, and vegetable. How could anyone hate such a magnificent thing? Says the guy who can survive on photosynthesis. Balance has nothing to do with it. You just like a good burger. That is also true. Be warned, though. I have very high standards. <sighs> Don't worry. I do, too. All right, then. One good, old-fashioned, all-American icon coming up. <laughs> I look forward to it. I hope you bought a better hamburger this time, Kazuhira. Right. Well, the last one was lacking in every way. The patty was too thin, the bun too dry, and the lettuce days old at best. <laughs> hey, that was a hundred percent all beef patty, and no shortening in the bun either. Mm. Nature's blessings, unadulterated in hamburger form. Is that it? But when taste falls short, so does our gratitude to nature. Making such precious blessings unpalatable is sacrilege. I... I hate to admit it, but... I think you're right. I should have known better than to settle for second best. That's why I had him run some more R&D, develop a new burger. In fact, one of our researchers just dropped by with the latest results. Here it is. See how you like... this. We shall see indeed. I thank you for this bounty, Mother Earth. So? What's the verdict? Hmm. Not bad. Ah. Uh, and? But it does not hold a candle to what I ate back home. Ah. Uh, everyone's a critic. <sighs> Damn it. I'm sure the Kobe beef. But maybe we didn't have enough. <laughs> we had any more. We're cutting into our profits. Profits? We'll be taking a loss on every unit. Mm, what are you talking about? Huh? Oh, uh... Anyway, I'll be back with another round of product. I will be waiting. Did you say... product? Feeling hungry? Old timer? Mm. Old timer? I do not get hungry. No. 
But you have a new hamburger? Well, you guessed it. And this time we use lamb. Lamb? Uh, you, you're not a lamb kind of guy? A hamburger is made of beef. Whoever heard of a hamburger without beef? Yeah, but we gotta stay oh, fresh, stand out from our competition. You're what? Just give it a try. If you say so. Not bad. But... But... I cannot call this a hamburger. I thought we were onto something this time. Maybe the problem is that it looks like a regular hamburger. Gotta think outside the box. Too much baggage if they come in expecting just another burger. Let's see, cotton candy? To make it look like a sheep? <laughs> yeah. Just a minute. You really think people would eat that? What is it you are planning? Are you using me? A taste tester? A one-man focus group? Well, actually, I've already started. I got a place called, uh, Miller's Maxi Buns. You are kidding me. Well, to be honest, business hasn't been great. No one seems to like my, uh, buns. Rain. The ocelot said Diamond Dog's budget did not add up. But... You don't mean to tell me. What? No, no, no. Our, our black budget's got it all covered. I'm not embezzling GMP or anything. Still, uh, let's not say anything to Snake, okay? Very well. However, Kazuhira, he takes more than premium ingredients and a clever recipe to satisfy the palate. Okay, so what do we do? The palate seeks one thing. Chemical additives. Chemical additives. There is nothing mysterious or spiritual about good flavor. The tongue simply identifies specific amino acids, which the brain then recognizes as appealing. Therefore, all that is needed is to chemically isolate those amino acids and incorporate them into your products. To be clear, I speak of flavor. The rest is irrelevant. That seems a little extreme. Do not forget that I am a scientist after all. And using science for the benefit of others is a joy. In seeking coexistence with nature's blessings, not everything can remain in its natural form. When we fall ill, we must be treated. Otherwise, that very nature could cost us our lives. Agriculture is one of nature's many blessings. But through that process, we damage the surrounding vegetation. Yeah. Whether it's a massive farm or a tiny field, we always leave our mark on the land. The same is true of parasites. And for food preparation. If tapeworms in the raw meat of another animal enter the human body, they roam around trying to find their usual habitat. Sometimes even eating away at the brain in their confusion. So in looking through a scientific point of view, you see the necessity for processing food. Yes. It is also sometimes necessary to eliminate certain parasites or selectively use or even modify others. Alternatively, we could say that if a man is part of nature, the work he does is also part of it. What is important is the balance. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, old timer. You really opened my eyes. <sighs> I fooled myself into thinking people today wanted high-quality, all-natural goods. But my favorite burgers were never about that. 
What they want is something like the first burger I had in America when I went to meet my dad. A Frankenburger loaded with additives. That's the America I knew and loved. I'll be back in a jiffy, old-timer. My next burger's gonna knock your socks off. Kazuhira, wait. What is important is how we balance the... Uh, quick for a one-legged man. Frankenburger. What kind of a dive did your old man take you to? Rise and shine, old-timer. It is complete. I had our best and brightest working overtime, fine-tuning the greatest burger the world has ever known. I call it the Chemical Burger. What on earth is that color? Now, now, don't judge a burger by its color. Go on, try it. I am not very hungry. What? Oh, I get it. Now, sure, it's loaded with additives, but each one's been approved by the WHO for human consumption. Come on, one little bite's not gonna kill you. Are you sure of that? Mm -hmm. Fine. Well, what do you think? It's... 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 It... Is perfect. Right? Right? This takes me back... To the taste of my youth. The neon signs on the mother road. Oh, I can see them now. So, what do you think of our signs now? And it doesn't just taste great. You won't believe how cheap it is to make. And because it's pumped up with preservatives, it won't spoil easily in regions lacking refrigerated storage or transportation infrastructure. This bad boy could even solve Africa's hunger problem. Excuse me. People will no longer fight over food or find reason to hate one another. Mankind will come together, reunited between these fluffy buns. Forget Pax Americana. Say hello to Pax Hamburgana. Pax Hamburgana. Skullface thought that destruction was the way to free the peoples of the world from American imperialism. But this is different. Tackling something head-on just makes for more conflict. Only by uniting the world can its various inhabitants truly become free. Having lived as an American parasite as long as I have, I know what I'm talking about. The Chemical Burger is poised to be the greatest liberating force the world has ever known. An ethnic liberator. Burger. Now all I need is a better brand image, starting with a name. I've gotta run, old-timer. I'll catch you later. Clouds approaching. Boss, how are you back on your feet so quickly? <clears throat> There's a non-smoking ward. Boss. If I listened to everything the doctors said, I'd probably die in here. No point waking up after nine years for that. Well, having you out of that bed makes things a little easier. Bad news, huh? Hmm. Things are looking worse. Go on. They found out about you waking up. And the man on fire picked this time to wake up, too. We'll have to move forward ahead of schedule. Miller already has the preparations underway. We'll have to wake up your neighbor, too. So he's not... He seems awake now. No. Well, he's not actively conscious yet, at least. He was a doctor, too. In his mind, that past no longer exists. Your past is his past now. He's going to be your phantom. Not some simple diversion. He'll act as the new big boss. And the act just isn't for Cypher. He'll be your face on the world stage. Until the time comes for your resurgence. You make it sound easy. We've been busy over the last nine years. His altered state of consciousness has helped us implant powerful suggestions through induced hypnagogia. He's experienced all your missions on record and shares all your knowledge and experience. To make him believe that he's the one true big boss. No one around him will doubt that he's the big boss they know. So, is he the real big boss or a stand-in? What does that mean to him? Nothing. The human brain is capable of many illusions. Of pain, of the future. What happens from here depends on his skill. You can vouch for that. He was always the best man we had. But... 
Nine years ago in that helicopter, he threw himself between you and the blast. In that moment, the man you knew died. He died protecting you. And now by becoming you, he protects you again. This is just a detour in his journey to hell. And don't forget, it's what he wanted. He's in his dog days now. Hmm. It's not just him. We'll be putting the people in this hospital in the line of fire. They'll be your shield and necessary diversion to buy us some time. And you? I'll be right by his side. Can you keep it up? It's a hell of a lie. It won't be a lie. I won't know his secret either. <laughs> I'll believe that he's the real big boss. I'll have no conscious knowledge of you. Where's the lie in that? Self-hypnosis. It's nothing new in my line of work. Manipulating memories. The past. But that's not all. When the time is right, I need to remember that you're the real boss. In a world, it's double think. In this year, two plus two equals five. And I want you to do the same. Right. His bodyguard. Correct. It won't be long before this hospital comes under attack. We'll wake him up right away, but he won't be back to full health in time. You'll need to take him through his final paces. Yeah. I want to see his face again. All right, John. I've never forgotten you in these nine years, but I have to forget you now. Adam, I'm counting on you. What's up? About the 1972 project. Les Enfants Terribles. <laughs> you never did like the French. <laughs> all that Catherine the Great aristocratic pompousness gets to me, that's all. Palace talk. They can keep it. Les Enfants Terribles. You terrible children. That madness Zero started. Or the start of his madness. You found out something new? The plan itself was abandoned in 76. ATGC dismantled the project, and their account with DARPA was closed. So I was worried about what happened to you. Your sons. They're no sons of mine. And they're sure as hell not me. Just a bunch of cells grown in a lab? What they are is much sicker than that. Well, Zero doesn't think so. Eva doesn't either. To them, those boys are your clones. They're you, down to the last hair. And? The first boys were raised free-range, like we thought. Both of them. David has never left the States, but the other, Eli, has disappeared. Might as well call it abandoned. They're through with him. Where is he? He was in England, Zero's home ground. Apparently, he traveled to Africa after that, but that's where he escaped from Zero's care. Just like that? Why? Who knows? Maybe he found out about his birth. If he's alive, he'd be 11 or 12 by now. Old enough to think and act for himself. So he might still be alive? On his own? There? I wouldn't bet on it. John, if he is alive, what's the plan? I have nothing to say to him. Treat him like a human being, just another person. Boss, this war business you and Miller started. Since the industry spread out to the PFs, it may have a favorable influence on Cypher. To a ruler, an everlasting enemy is convenient. By directing the public's animosity outside his borders, he can unify their frame of mind. Guns for hire continue the war. Then enrich the economy with their spoils. War as a business will become a permanent tool for manipulating the public mind. A new business model. You might even call it a war economy. Before long, Cypher, or rather the Patriots, will be drawn to this. Probably only a few decades before it takes hold. It's not far off at all. Still no leads on Zero. We don't even know whether he's still alive. But the protocol he put in motion's making steady progress. Every day, SIGINS web covers a little bit more of the globe. Total information control. Big Brother Zero. And it'll happen before anyone even realizes. I don't like it. You're the big brother of the battlefield. You've earned a firm grip on the world's military power. But soon, Zero will have nations in his. He'll erase the Cold War. All war from people's minds. And with it, the world's borders. Zero's will, his influence, will be unleashed with nothing to stem the tide. When that happens, opposition will no longer match the lines on the map. And boss, 
with no borders left, what difference can we make? War will have lost any true meaning to the world. Just one more gear keeping the wheels of economy turning. Another product bearing down the capitalist conveyor belt. The future your friend Miller wanted, that's all there is in store. Perhaps it's already too late. But human will should only be handed down and nurtured by human hands. It can't be entrusted to the system. Especially not that soulless phantom that Zero's left in his wake. No matter what happens, we'll have to fight someday to reclaim our truth. Until next time, Big Boss. Someone has successfully struck at Zero. Since Zero's using a private network, we get information, but we have no way to trace his location. That means the details are still fuzzy at this point, but apparently some new bioweapon was used. As soon as he noticed the dip in his vital signs, he had his stomach pumped and even underwent blood dialysis. But he didn't fully recover. Ironically, if Zero kept more company, he'd have been safe. Since the incident, his speech and actions have been getting more unhinged by the day. He's probably been rushed to another safe house for intensive care. But the location is a complete mystery. That's the way he operates. He went to incredible lengths to make sure his great escape went unnoticed. So far, I know at least Langley and the Pentagon were involved. He had a blackout triggered in New York to disrupt the transportation and information grids, and at least two submarines were sighted off the coast. The personnel involved were working off a cover story. Naturally, the White House was fed the same thing. The project is buried under a pile of dummy ops and backup plans stretching across multiple organizations. It's safe to say not one of the people involved knew what they were moving or to where. All top secret. No trail, no leads. He's living up to his name as usual. Only this time, even I can't find him. Now, the only record of his location lies within the cipher AI that was at the heart of the escape plan. And that's closed off, with its data sealed away in a secret location. Skullface was able to put together this assassination attempt, but even he can't possibly know where Zero is now. I'll keep searching, but when you're up against he who controls information, it's gonna be a long battle. Boss, it was Anderson after all. That's right, the man who went by Sigan during Operation Snake Eater. Following Zero's disappearance, he's taken over command of Cypher. Well, to be precise, the AI he oversees has. The idea to have an AI act for Zero came about in 74, when the data from the mammal pod penetrated NORAD. Clearly, an AI couldn't be allowed to make its own decisions. So they would take away its ability to act, and instead, create a specialized system in which the AI, bound by specific rules, filters the massive amounts of data it collects before passing it on to people, subtly guiding their decision-making. A system of the people, by the people, for the people. So they began researching how to do it. DARPA apparently brought Strangelove on board to head it up, but she was forced out after a certain incident. The direction of the project and any trace of her existence was scrubbed after her departure. Before Zero lost consciousness as his condition worsened, he left instructions for Anderson. Through a cutout, of course. Some Zero went out of his you. way to hide your location in order to keep you safe. This meant sacrificing his own protection. It was the only way to ensure you could stand alone as your own man. And here I am. The only link between you and the world that's passing you by. I'm your last connection now. This was Zero's last request, his will. Once you're awake, we need to discuss the best way to ensure your safety. Oh, and they've got a name for Anderson's AI project. It's called The Patriots. It's all about ensuring that the concepts driving society appears the same in the mind of each person in that society, about maintaining the identity of the individual and yet having that individual willingly make up part of the whole. I guess it's fitting to call that patriotism. Creating a united world. Zero's will is already fading into a shadow of what it once was. Systems, guidelines, rules, laws. When you take a mentality 
and fix it in a solid shape. Put it out there in the hands of people. It can only begin to decay. No mentality can last forever. When the body dies, the will dies with it. Not there, here. Huh? Thank you for coming. Please. You're... Hmm. Is it that odd? I suppose the cuffs have gotten a bit loose. Although, truth be told, I have been spending more time in pajamas as of late. No. Nothing. The tie, perhaps. Not the most fashionable oh, pattern, I admit. No, it is very nice. How sweet. Will you take a little brandy? Uh, You're hardly under age, after all. No, thank you. Hmm. Please, sit. <laughs> hmm. Pacifica Ocean. What? Ah, yes. You've already begun. Hmm. Uh. Not bad. A schoolgirl through and through. Even he won't suspect otherwise. Here you are. Thank you. <sighs> I heard you were sick? Poppycock. I just like to take a little time off work. You? You must feel that way sometimes. Well... <laughs> anyway, I could hardly greet my first guest from that damned bed. I, uh, missed my chance to catch you snoring. <laughs> now I'm twice as glad I got ready in time. Drink, before it gets cold. English breakfast tea. All I have, I'm afraid. There were eight candidates before you, meaning you will be the ninth Paz Ortega Andrade. What happened to the others? They're in the next room. They've been taking it easy these past few months. They... Do you see any windows here? No. I've gotten used to it, this life. I am who I am, after all. And I've had my fill of cursing this bloody dungeon. Excuse me. But I can't help sometimes. Wishing I could see the stars. What should I do? Well, you... You could go outside. Go up to the roof. Wait for the clouds to pass. You would have a view of Manhattan. And a pretty one, too. But once the wind blows... And the clouds pass. You can look up and see a sky full of stars. Even here. You've had a hard time getting to where you are. Ye yes. Sewer rats lead better lives. I know. Extreme training. Starvation. Days spent without sleep. Abandoned, hurt, and all but killed in every way imaginable. Some of your compatriots died. Others betrayed you, left you for dead. And you did the same to them. 
But through it all, you survived. And you alone made it here. Just look at you. I can see everything you've been through. Yes. Consider this mission a reward for the mountain you've climbed. Thank you. Yes, well, you know what's next. Yes. And you are prepared? Yes. I believe you. That ever so slight tan. Not the type you'd get on the west coast. If I didn't know better, I'd say you really did grow up around the equator. But it runs deeper than that. One look at you, and I see a wide-eyed student yearning for peace. Born and raised in Central America. I can see it all. How much preparation have you done? A little. You'll be perfect for this, to strike back at Snake. I'll share everything I know about him. <gasps> but you mustn't forget who you're dealing with. If he were to get the better of you, well, I deeply regret having put you in that position. But beyond that, I'm putting my life in your hands. You can trust me, Cypher. Hmm. None of my friends call me that. Tea's gone cold. Shall I make some more? I know we are the only ones here. Hmm? There is no one in the other room. And how do you know that? You said I was your first guest. Oh, I haven't had this much fun in quite a while. All right, then. Cypher's been in hiding ever since his grand experiment. No one's seen him in years. All we hear are orders delivered by proxy. Except you. You met with him, face to face, in order to contact Big Boss. Tell me where he is. Where is Cypher? Where is Zero? I've never known choice. Where I was born, the language I speak, I've never had the freedom to choose for myself. But you, right now, are free. Do as you will. This will save Big Boss. It may. Will you really kill Zero for me? Not for you. All right. Zero is Hell's Kitchen, 10th Avenue. He is undergoing treatment there. Hmm. Not exactly Hyde Park. His medical needs keep him from moving around. That is why he summoned me there. The other residents are of varying race and ages, but in reality, all 40 units are Cypher personnel. It took him 10 years to replace the original occupants. He has got places like this all over the world. No better place to hide a needle than a stack of needles. Hmm. Zero is on the top floor. A room with no windows and no doors. Even the elevator does not reach it. Officially, the floor does not exist. The only access is by a secret staircase one floor down. Room 702. <laughs> Shades of World War II. Nobody realizes the entire building is a setup. People go in and out all day. But 
They're all cipher. The building blends right in with the rest of the city. They disseminate rumors that a gang operates out of the building. That keeps most outsiders away. And most of them are there as security in case of an emergency. But even they don't know what they're really protecting. Food traffic, goods coming in and out, phone lines, water and sewage. It is all monitored remotely by satellite and cameras inside and out. Should he need it, there is a sealed off water conduit that can be used to escape to the Hudson River and from there to the sea. Caution. But from the outside, it is just another building. A perfect disguise. So the Major believes zero suspicion equals total security. Very bold. It's just the kind of ruse I'd expect from him. So long as no one's suspicions are aroused, you could hide there forever. On the other hand, if someone figures it out, there are dozens of ways in. And he's so paranoid about information slipping out, no one involved has the full picture. That ignorance is a weakness, the downfall of a need-to-know system. The pitfalls are clear. Circumventing them will be simplicity itself. You hate him, don't you? Hate? He never left me to die. I owe him my life. I'm bound to repay the favor. Any way I can. But that's not what you really want to know. What you want to know is, do I hate Big Boss? <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate the man. I do deserve a little more of his gratitude. But he probably has no idea who I am. So you see, I have no reason to hate him at all. I mean to have my revenge against Zero. It's not petty hatred or resentment. Nothing so personal. Even the hottest lava eventually cools, becoming a mountain. And that mountain becomes the land. Scalding steam comes back down as rain, forming rivers, draining into the sea. It's then that nature's order sets in. Now I'm merely a part of that cycle. Just like Zero. And you. And Big Boss. Don't do it! That lava, that vengeance, is already set as stone. Too late to change things now. Don't kill him! The choice is not mine to make. Proceed. Please. Shh. Give her the shot already. Hold her still. It's me, Ocelot. It's been quite a while. Yeah, I'll see. Took a lot longer for you to surface than I expected, Major. I wasn't planning on coming back at all, but I had no choice. Well, after the Caribbean, 
My hunch was proven right. You wouldn't believe who was behind it. Oh, I have an idea. How did you respond? Immediate disinformation campaign. Most bought into the story, but not everyone. It was quite an incident, after all. I couldn't cover everything. But I did hide the fact that Snake survived. And that should buy us some time. Where is he? En route to an old foxhole of mine. A base in the British sovereign area of Cyprus. The military hospital at Dekelia? Ava's leading the operation. Ava? Following your orders? Funny, isn't it? That we should all reunite like this. This is an emergency. Otherwise, I sure as hell would... Yes, yes, I don't expect you to bury the hatchet between us. Something simply won't ever happen. Even I can appreciate that. <sighs> you too can only bear to speak with me from time to time. That's fine. But I don't want Snake to die. Surely we can come together on that. There are so few men I can turn to. And you're number one, Ocelot. Keep him hidden. Keep him safe. But I'll stay where I am and leave the rest to you. That's how he'd want it to. Isn't it better for you to be there to supervise? Where I am, where he goes, it makes no difference. All that matters is getting him the very best treatment and security. The latter being where you come in. Will he wake up? And if so, when? I have absolutely no idea. But as long as his heart is beating, he will keep fighting. So please, watch over him. This location, it's safe. No one will find him. And if they try, I will deal with them. The information must be suppressed. Uh, which is what you do best. Guess you're still at the top of your game, huh? Anything but. I'm sick, Ocelot. Donald's taken over a great deal. He'll be handling this situation from here on as well. Though I wish it weren't so. This will probably be the last time you and I speak. So... You won't say no, will you? I have no choice. Thank you. you save your thanks. <laughs> One more thing. A proposition. Yes. I've prepared a ruse of sorts. One I imagine you'll quite like. What is it? You could say, I've made another snake. Major. I'm not talking about the children. A mental copy. His phantom, if you like. I don't understand. You will when you get to Cyprus. I've set the ball in motion, but the rest is in your hands. You're good at this kind of thing. The best. I need you on this. If it's in his best interests. I assure you, it is. <laughs> Look after Snake. He's the toughest son of a bitch I've ever known. Yes, it's me. You weren't in hospital long. I had trouble finding you. Where is he? Safe. But in the same state as when you last saw him. We've had our misunderstandings, you and I. But as you've made clear, our relationship is strictly business. Therefore, I will limit this conversation to the business at hand. Please understand that I don't dislike you. Not inherently. Where is Snake? Now, now. Settle down, or I'll have to hang up. <sighs> and then you never hear from me again. Do you understand? <sighs> First, about your boss. I had him moved once he was stabilized. I'm sure it came as quite a shock to you when you woke up. You'll have to forgive me. I told them to stop putting me under. Surely you understand. Specialized medical treatment in places like that can be positively nightmarish. We couldn't have left him there forever. And to be honest, I was entirely comfortable leaving matters in your hands. Don't take it the wrong way. Anyone looking for him would be looking for you. He needed to be as far from you as possible. 
In fact, I'm still not sharing his location. Even now. Problems could arise. So, instead, I'm giving you a point of contact. An introduction to a network of messengers who will lead you to a man. A friend to your boss. I'm sure he's mentioned him before. He knows Snake's location. More than any man alive, I trust him with this sort of thing. Keeping secrets, or men in the dark. He's known Snake quite a while. Ten years longer than you. <sighs> Kazuhira, I don't care if you don't trust me. But I require your absolute trust in him on this. Snake will be brought back into this world, however long it takes. Understood? The only reason we're having this conversation is because you still have a role to play. Which brings me to the next issue. What happens after he regains consciousness? When Snake wakes up, and he will, he'll need your help again. So when he does, I promise you'll be the first to know. The code phrase will be, V has come to. I'll then mobilize all the necessary parties. Think of it as an overture to a prologue. Until then, do what you like. Just be ready when the time comes. But you don't need me to tell you that, do you? I know it's been hard on you, too. But I can't imagine you're willing to just walk away. What are you talking about? Hmm? If what you're saying is true, then this is like wrapping a rope around your own neck and throwing it over a branch. What's your play in all this? This? This is for Snake. So that he survives after he wakes up. Nothing more. After that, I don't care what you do. Then tell me something. Go on. I only joined you after I found out what you were after. To make the world one, you need Snake for that. And he's already done a hell of a lot for you. He has. So on some level at least, I think you're being straight with me. Hmm. Then why'd you do that to him? I get what you were trying with Pass. You wanted to get Snake any way you could. But after that, what you did, how could you do that to him? After that wasn't me. You may not believe this, but I never intended for any of this to happen. My organization has many arms. It's just going to take a little longer before we're all on the same page. I admit, I may have been lax in my supervision, but something like that will not happen again. Whatever. One day, I'll know the truth. Just as soon as the boss wakes up, and then we're coming after you. This ends with you begging us to put you out of your misery. Is that so? Fantasy can make for a powerful ally. But remember this reality, Kazuhira Miller. Big Boss will wake up. And when he does, be there for him. Major. I wondered whether you'd really call. Exer, I presume this was your doing. Do you like my gift? I've been searching a long time for this. It is what you were looking for, yes. The winged dagger of a comrade lost to the sands of Egypt. He served under the boss back in Rayforce. I delivered this pin to her after his death. We were both so very young. From that moment on, she never let it leave her side. She was still carrying it in Selinoyarsk. How about the back? Hmm. Ah. Something wrong, Major? Nothing, just pricked my finger. The back? The scar is there, just as I remember it. And this white stitching on the back. From the white berets the SAS wore in the early days. Ah. Major? 30th of December, 1941. It's the inscription I made the day he died. Of course. 
His body was never recovered. This pin badge is the closest thing he has to a gravestone. When I gave it to her, she just kept on running her finger over the inscription. Never again, she uttered, as if reprimanding herself for his death. She pressed hard, embedding the inscription itself into her finger. You see, it's why this spot on the back looks shinier than the rest. He was our brother in arms. So... Yes, it's real. Thank you. There's no doubt about it. Good. Now I have no regrets. What do I owe you? Nothing. Just want to talk for a moment. Very well, then. It's about our man, Major. He's been making some moves. Miller? Yes, I know. Rhodesia, is it? Yes, and up to his old tricks again. No matter. He'll stumble soon enough. Under my jurisdiction now. And that's what you want to talk about? Not exactly. You see, my being here has made me realize I can still be of use to you. How so? This country is rich with biological resources. Bacteria, nematodes, viruses. I'm sure we can find something here to bring that plan back into action. Forget it. The Cleanser Project was just another one of my predecessor's daydreams. And the vocal cord parasites? Were an excellent test case for reverse evolution. Nothing more. What matters now is the genetics technology behind that work. With genetics, the clumsiness in targeting an entire race isn't an issue. We can target specific individuals. No need to breed multiple generations of parasite just to get results. But I... Don't be quaint, Exo. Once the Cold War is over, our enemies won't be so clearly defined. Using humans alone won't be enough. An electronic network will span the globe, and our enemies will blend right into it. You may be right, but will people really settle for an enemy they can't see? Men want to feel righteous, need to see the evil in the enemy they fear. Without it, they'll turn their aggressions inward. Find an enemy inside. You know this is true. I see what you're saying. Just as those robbed of their parasites develop allergies and autoimmune diseases, a man robbed of his enemy develops self-destructive tendencies. And I know all the symptoms. Ethnic conflict, religious strife, terrorism. And with asymmetrical conflict, deterrence is a joke. That's why we must depend on information control. People need an appropriate context for their lives. A context that's stimulating without being destructive. That balance is the basis of equilibrium. You mean to say people will blindly accept your context without developing any allergies? If we're to unite the world, literacy must be suppressed. To suppress the information immune system, to borrow your metaphor. Immunity to information. But to ensure there's no allergic reaction while the immune system fights off parasites and pathogens. It's done, Exo. This world will become one. I have found the way. The world that the boss envisioned will finally become a reality. Race, tribal affiliations, national borders, even our faces will be irrelevant. The nature of communication itself will change, and it will make mankind whole again. Some things can't be undone. My face was taken from me. There's no taking that back. A face means nothing when one's soul is able to communicate directly with another. I have no intention of hiding behind your technological veil, Major. I wear my broken visage, this skull in the open so that I may never forget what I've lost. You. What are you? The chain of retaliation is what will truly bind this world together as one. Ah. Major. You son of a... The pin. You... Yes, the pin. It's too late. They can't extract it. You 
C major. Some things can't be undone. How did you find me? The girl. You made her talk. I'm sorry I couldn't visit or thank you in person, but it has been lovely chatting. And now that I know you're no longer interested in the garden, it's time for you to step aside. You're a busy man, lots to do. So I've left you a little time. Go to hell! How dare you? You planned this all along. Had your own agenda. All these years. Yeah. Now you see, the world can never truly become one. But the boss... I've been... You've been wrong. You're no different. Just like him. None of you understand the world she saw. I would say the same to you, Major. Uh. You steal it all away. Everything. The boss said the same thing. Only, I understood what she meant. Major, I'll handle the rest. Oh, and one more thing. That pin badge, it was a fake. I held on to the real one. I'll take good care of it. And continue the boss's work. Jack. Go. I almost thought you wouldn't come. Well, you're supposed to visit hospital before you die. But how did you get here? My friends at the SAS know how to keep a secret. The trip to the airport was a little dramatic, but the rest was easy. Still, I've had smoother rides. Oh, look. Scorted myself with my tea. <laughs> I won't be staying long. I understand. Which one is he? On the right. And the left? We did just as you instructed. Oh, all right. Has Let's either of them woken? Neither of them, no. Not once? Not in two years. Their weekly EEG show stable activity levels. There's been practically no change. Jack? Jack? It's me. You look fit to run a country mile. Every four hours, we move all of their muscles, subject them to load. Clouds They're stable, but eventually... Yes, of course. We've done everything we can to ensure they're ready to move, should they wake up. Still, it's been a pretty long time. Hmm. How 
How long will they be here? Indefinitely. It's too dangerous to move them. And so far, no one knows they're here. I see. I am most grateful to you. And I need you to keep it up. We'll do everything we can. Can you give us a moment? Of course. Jack, can you hear me? Nice place, isn't it? I went to a lot of trouble bringing you here. Here, where no one will find you. Still, the ocelot's on guard duty, just in case. Maybe knowing that will help you sleep better. I had no intention of coming, but... This could be my last chance. If you'd just come to see me first. Do you remember the last time I visited you in hospital? Our first mission together. After the boss threw you in that river. Broke your arm. Ah, the good old days. I never told you this, but I had another team at my disposal back then, with a very special man leading it. Maybe he didn't like the arrangement. In any case, this man, he uh, seems to have done something to me. Which is why I'm quite sick myself. Caution. Rain Up here. Approaching. There's nothing they can do. I always was the forgetful type, as you know. I'm all right for now, but they say it's a one-way street. If you don't wake up soon, I won't remember you when you do. I don't mind about myself, but what he did to you. I can never forgive. I've sent him to Africa, and I doubt he's coming back. Jack, once your little holiday here is over, well, who knows when that will be? But anyway, I probably won't be around. I'll be somewhere even you can't find me. A tombstone chiseled into the code of a machine. That is all I leave to mark my existence. Wake up soon, old friend. Time is running short.